Okay, uh, good evening and welcome. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, once again, good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, virtual meeting of the Boston School Committee. I uh, hope everyone is um, staying cool uh, in this hot summer. And um, we thank uh, everyone who has uh, taken the time to join us tonight. We have a, a very packed agenda, a number of speakers tonight, and um, a number of uh, critical updates that we want to provide to the public on uh, the work that we've been doing over the summer uh, to get ready for the fall. Um, so first of all, since this is a virtual meeting, I'll remind everyone that uh, we'll begin by taking attendance. So Ms. Sullivan, we please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Present. Mr. O'Neill? Present. Dr. Rivera? Present. Ms. Robinson? Present. Mr. Tran? A mute. Present. There we go. Thank you. Ms. Oliver Davila? Present. Mr. Lacanto? Here. All members are present. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, tonight's being, meeting is being broadcast live on Zoom and will be rebroadcast on a later date on Boston City TV as well as on our YouTube channel. And it will be re, uh, posted to our uh, school committee webpage uh, as soon as a recording is ready. For those of you that are joining us on Zoom this evening, or for those of you that might join us labor, later, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, tonight's meeting documents are being posted uh, as we speak and have been posted on the uh, bostonpublicschools.org slash school committee webpage. Uh, you can look under the uh, meeting tab for July 22nd. We have interpretation services this, uh, this evening. Mr. Bernal, good evening. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Lacanta. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish interpreter. I will provide live interpretation during the public comment portion of this meeting for those in need of interpretation. I will now proceed to make the same announcement in Spanish. Muy buenas tardes para todos. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy el intérprete para español. Voy a proveer el servicio de interpretación en vivo durante la porción de comentarios públicos de esta reunión para aquellas personas que necesiten de un intérprete. Gracias. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Mr. Lacanto. Thank you. Gracias, and thank you once again, Mr. Bernal. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to everyone as well who signed up for public comment tonight. Uh, we do have 31 speakers tonight. So uh, according to school committee rules, uh, the time uh, per speaker will be uh, reduced to two minutes uh, per speaker. Um, as a reminder, the sign up for both of our public comment periods closes at 4.30 prior to our school committee meetings. If uh, you wanna sign up for a future meeting, you can uh, find a link on our website. Um, on the, uh, during the week of any meeting that might occur in the future. And um, just as a reminder for those who have signed up for uh, public comment tonight, if you could please make sure that you are signed into Zoom under the same name that you use to sign up for public comment, that will help uh, those that are administering the meeting tonight to recognize you and to promote you to, uh, to um, provide your comment uh, when uh, it comes your turn on our list. Uh, so thank you for uh, your cooperation in that regard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, one additional programming note before we uh, get into the, uh, the normal business of the meeting. I wanna let folks know that the committee has added two additional meetings this summer in order to address uh, the number of timely issues that we have on our agenda uh, prior to the start of the new school year. So for those of you that want to mark it down in your calendar, our next remote meetings will take place on Wednesday, August 5th and Wednesday, August 19th. Uh, these will, uh, consistent with our, our recent uh, programming, be a, uh, a, a virtual meeting. It will be uh, broadcast right here on Zoom and we'll start at 5 p.m. So with that, uh, we'll begin with the approval of minutes uh, for the, from the June 24th, 2020 school committee meeting. At this time, I'd like to ask members to unmute their microphones and I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the January, excuse me, June 24th meeting as presented. So moved. 
So well, thank you, Rob. Ms. Robinson, sounded like a second from Vice Chair Oliver Davila. Um, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously. Well, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We'll move on now to the superintendent's report. And I want to remind people that are uh, watching this evening, um, this is a regular feature of our um, meetings, but um, we have asked the superintendent to add into this report um, a special update on our reopening and our plans for the fall. Uh, so this will take a little bit longer than usual. Uh, we might have some special guests and uh, we will uh, certainly be looking to um, answer any questions that the, uh, the committee has and keep the public informed to the extent possible. Uh, Dr. Caselius, uh, please uh, take it away. Make sure I'm on, make sure I'm uh, off of mute. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for our first school committee meeting of the summer um, and welcome. I hope everyone's had some time to rest, relax, and reflect on this truly challenging last few months that we've had. Um, over the weekend, we learned of the passing of civil rights pioneer John Lewis, and I just want to take a moment to uh, recognize his incredible life. Um, I noted in my check-in to staff this week that Congressman Lewis stood up for justice, equity, and dignity, and he believed in all of our shared humanity. Uh, while the current racial justice movement was born out of unspeakable tragedy, Mr. Lewis was able to see the reckoning begin. I'm heartened by the renewed focus we have taken this year to root out injustice and inequity in our own work as we examine our policies and practices and take action to increase opportunity and access to our most underserved students and their families. It's, it's difficult to lose such a strong leader when we are desperately seeking such incredible leadership at this moment in time. He often said, go ahead and make some good trouble and um, he believed in building a beloved community. And so uh, with that, I wanted to just take a moment to recognize his incredible life, all that he gave to us um, and honor his legacy. I'm gonna move to fall reopening. Uh, I know that everyone's been asking about the district's plans for the fall. Everyone is anxious. I know families are very anxious. They've been filling out our surveys and we can't thank them enough. <clears throat> for everything that they've been doing and the team has been working hard. Um, and I am very proud of the team that has been uh, putting together, uh, walking our buildings and our facilities, our HVAC systems, looking at our windows, um, checking our bathrooms, cleanliness, ordering supplies, all of these uh, different scenarios, uh, participating in DESE meetings, getting their information and guidance, and just preparing uh, for the different um, opportunities to have children come back to school because we all know that that's the best place for children and everybody's very anxious for them to come back but we certainly don't want to do that unless we know we can open our doors safely. Um, we've also been receiving feedback from various stakeholders including our students, staff, and families. We've conducted remote learning surveys in the spring and on June 29th we launched our most recent um, learning survey uh, for families with specific questions about reopening in the fall. To date, we've received about 15,151 re, uh, responses from families, approximately 30%. Um, so we'd really, really like for families to um, let us know how they're feeling about reopening. We also received about 5,228 responses from our staff. That's about 55% of our staff. So I strongly encourage you to please visit the survey at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash survey and just take a few minutes to share your thoughts. It's available in 10 different languages. In addition to our survey, we have convened dozens of meetings and stakeholder groups around the larger community. Our first meeting open to the general public is this Saturday, July 25th at 10 a.m. Please sign up to attend at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash reopening. Like other school districts across Massachusetts, Boston has until July 31st to submit our preliminary reopening plans for three models of instruction, entirely in person, uh, entirely remote, and kind of a hybrid of the two. We've looked into the survey data we've received and uh, many parents want their children back in school. 
um, in some type of capacity. But of course, we are going to continue to watch uh, the virus and how the spread is happening around uh, our Boston community here. Um, and that will then continue to inform uh, what our decisions are as we move forward. But I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues who have been breathing COVID since the day we uh, heard the words COVID-19. Uh, Chief Martinez, who is uh, wondering, uh, uh, leading up the city's response, uh, health response for us uh, at under Mayor Walsh, and uh, Tammy Poost, who is senior advisor uh, to me. And they are both going to be speaking uh, today on um, fall reopening work. And Chief Martinez will be specifically speaking on where we're at with the virus and what to expect um, in terms of our decision making. So from there, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over for a short presentation from Chief Martinez and Ms. Tammy Poost. Chief Martinez, you wanna go first? Oh no, we can't hear you, Marty. Sure, <laughs> I can go first, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great, great. Um, so am I able to share my screen through this process? I think I so. Uh, Mark or Steve, can you help us with that? There's so a I can, um, Bola? Looks yep. good. Okay, how do I get this out of here? All right. Um, Okay. Sorry about that. Right. There you go. Okay. There you go. So um, uh, thanks, uh, Superintendent. And um, what I wanted to be able to just do was just share a little bit of information about how we're prioritizing public health um, as, you know, everyone is dealing with COVID and um, the weather may have gotten nice, but COVID didn't go anywhere um, and it's still here today. So I just want to give you a little bit of information um, about the, uh, what we're monitoring and how we're doing it in partnership with BPS as we think about reopening. So again, we are monitoring key data metrics for any increased COVID activity. Um, and uh, continue to be able to respond to issues that might arise. As is the case across the country, um, and as has always been the case, um, it is expected that when you reopen anything, whether it's um, you know, businesses, whether we're reopening uh, schools, any in, uh, area, we have to watch and monitor for COVID cases. Um, and the goal is to make sure that public health has the ability to test, trace, and isolate those infected and to ensure that those who need care can get it. Um, BPS and BPHB, the Boston Public Health Commission, in partnership with Health and Human Services, we've been working closely on best practices for prevention and containment of COVID since the beginning and continue to work closely on reopening efforts. Um, BPA, uh, BPHB has been working on COVID uh, since probably most people even knew there was COVID. Uh, we started this in late December when we started hearing what was coming. When I've, uh, continue to work on it ever since then um, to be prepared. Currently, uh, Boston has one of the lowest positive test rates of any major city across the country, um, a very low hospitalization rate, and the capacity to respond to all COVID activity as it currently occurs. The decrease and flattening rate of activity has been consistent for basically the last two months. Um, and that's been uh, a good sign um, and it's been important to be able to monitor that, especially as we've seen what's been happening in other parts of the country. What I want to be able to do, do is just give uh, both the committee members and, and the public maybe viewing this, um, what are we monitoring and what are we watching? So we're basically monitoring uh, for any metrics that are showing increased COVID activity. And we're monitoring three specific areas. We're monitoring our daily number of tests, the daily percent of tests that are positive, and then the daily new COVID hospital admissions. Um, and all three of those, as I said, are trending in, in the right way and are stable on where we're at. Um, we've, over the last um, seven weeks, we've only had three days where we've had over 35 cases in a single day. 
than our average over those eight weeks. I've really, um, our average over the uh, eight weeks has really only been uh, 21 cases a day. And so again, each day we're monitoring those cases to make sure we can manage them um, and to be able to monitor them. So these case numbers are very low uh, per day compared to uh, where they have been in our peak or where they, other cities are, are facing. So we're monitoring that on a daily basis. In addition to the daily number of positive tests, which are important, we also want to monitor our positive test rate. Some have said um, that uh, your increased testing, your increased number of cases has to do with testing more people. Um, and so what you also have to monitor is making sure that you're monitoring your positive test rate so that you can understand what you're seeing. Um, over the last seven weeks, we have been under 3% of all the positive tests across the city of Austin. And our average over the last eight weeks has been about 2.1%. Um, and that continues to be our current average. We'll get a, a, an update tomorrow. Um, but we're at 2.1% in terms of positive tests. To give you a sense, we're testing about a thousand of people a day in the city of Austin, and it means uh, uh, just about two percent of those are coming back positive um, across our seven-day average. That's a really that's a really low number and really healthy to make sure we maintain that in that area. Our goal is to stay under a threshold so that we can make sure we're testing enough people, tracing and containing folks, uh, isolating them who may test positive uh, for COVID. So that's a really important number to keep in mind. That 2.1% is just slightly higher than the state percentage, which is about 1.8, 1.7% of positive test results currently. So we are in a good position uh, to understand where we are um, kind of in, the, in this place right now. And then last but not least is daily new COVID-19 hospital admissions. It's very important that our hospitals have the capacity to keep those folks who get sick and have a severe impact of COVID to keep them well and to take care of them. Um, our average over the last basically six weeks has been about 105 patients in the hospital across the entire city related to COVID. Our average currently right now is 108 patients. Um, and we've been very low in that number for quite some time. Um, and so our hospital capacity has been something that we've monitored along the way to make sure we're not experiencing some of the challenge we did in our peak uh, in April. Um, when we saw very high numbers in the hospital and through the ICU. It's also important to note that, and you'll see at the bottom there, we're also monitoring ICU hospital data. We're, um, we're also monitoring um, that data to understand what we've seen and where we're, at, where we're at. Um, at our peak, we had over 550 patients in the ICU across the city of Austin. Today, we have less than 30. Um, so again, the COVID activity, not as severe today, uh, and why we continue to monitor the hospitalizations. And it's always important that we look at the equitable impact because we know COVID has had an inequitable impact in the community. So we're also monitoring all data in terms of racial, ethnic, and neighborhood level disparities to determine areas of concern and where greater focus is needed. And it's why we continue to pop up testing sites. It's why we continue to focus on our diverse communities to ensure that communities have the resources that they need in terms of access to testing and access to care. So these are the um, information and the data that we are looking at. Um, and I wanted to share that information uh, with uh, committee members and with the public, because it's very important that BPS and BPHC and the uh, Health and Human Services work together to monitor the data so we can ensure that we are managing and taking care of all the COVID-related issues uh, while we work together to look at reopening um, our schools. So I'll stop there um, and I could take questions or pass it back to you, Sammy, whatever makes the most sense. Sarah, what would you prefer? I think it might be good if we can get the full picture of what you're planning with um, reopening and then we can pause and take questions from the members. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Um, Dana, could you throw up my deck then? Um, Okay, thank you. Now, first of all, hello, my name is Tammy Poost and we haven't all of us met. Um, I've had the honor of meeting some of you. I wanna thank you for your service on the school committee and for all the work that you do for all the kids that we serve. Um, I'm here to explain to you um, what's in front of you. And here it is, it is a working draft. This is the, if you remember nothing else about this plan, 
I hope that you remember this. It nowhere on here says final plan. Nowhere on here does it say published and copyrighted. This is a working draft that we're sharing first with you um, so that we can get your input. And then through you, we're sharing it with the community. And then I'll tell you more about our sharing plans as we go forward. Thanks so much. Dana, next slide. So as Chief Martinez just told you, everything that we're doing at the Boston Public Schools that relates to reopening is guided by the public health requirements. And so let me really ground that statement for you directly. The superintendent is making every decision that she makes with regard to reopening guided by the public health um, requirements as communicated to her daily, re really through Chief Martinez and the rest of our partners at the city. Right now, this is what the public health guidance is. Every one of us should be maintaining six feet of distance between each other. That's how we can keep each other safe. All of us should be wearing masks whether we're students, adults, or whoever we are, we should all be wearing masks because that's how we keep our community safe. Keep ourselves safe a little bit, but mostly we keep our community safe that way. The CDC guidance, guidance right now is with regard to school buses is one student per row per bus. I need you to think about that for a minute. The average historically for BPS buses has been at least two students per row, which means two students sitting next to each other on a bus. The guidance right now is one student per row per bus. Therefore, we cannot put as many students on our buses as we have in the past. The guidance from the CDC is also no food service in school cafeterias. Instead, food will need to be served in the classrooms or in other ways. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. The other guidance is we need to have strict protocols and we need to follow those protocols for both cleaning and sanitizing, which are different levels of cleaning, our buses, our buildings, and we also need to have real solid protocols with regard to how do we respond when a student or a staff member is in our school buildings and has some sort of illness that needs to um, be evaluated for whether or not that is or isn't COVID. Um, and we're working with the Public Health Commission. Again, we're doing those protocols and getting them to review them and bless them for us so that we make sure that we're on track with that. And then there's the bottom line right there. No group gatherings should be happening in the community if our infection rates are outside of the acceptable thresholds that Chief Martinez talked about. Mm -hmm. And so all of the decisions that I'm going to lay out for you or the recommendations that we have a, for a plan for you are all grounded in these public health requirements. If we can't meet these things, we will not be putting any students in our school buildings. Next slide, please. All of you know that DESE has required the Boston Public Schools and every other public school district in the Commonwealth to file three different plans for reopening school in the fall. One is a plan that is fully remote learning. All students stay online. We will have that plan. We are writing that plan now. And that is not a throwaway plan. Why is that? Because even if we start with some students in buildings, and I'll get to that, we don't know what this virus is gonna do. And we need to be able to pivot on a dime. And so if Chief Martinez tells us on September 9th that the thresholds in the community have exceeded the metrics that are safe, well then we'll be pivoting and we'll be doing remote learning. And that's true on October 10th or December 10th or March 10th as well. So that fully remote learning plan has to be robust and usable throughout the community um, on a day's notice, and it will be. The other plan that we have to have as required by um, DESE is a plan to have all students in the school building on day one of the school year, which for us is September 10th. We will have that plan. I can tell you, and I mean this with all due respect to our regulatory agency, it'll be a short plan. Because it's not really possible for us at the Boston Public Schools to have school reopen with all of our students in our school buildings on day one. Why? Because we can only put 50% of the number of students on our buses that we did in the past, which means we can't get our students to the school building in time to start on day one. If we can only get one kid per bus, which means 50% of the students in total 
on the buses. Now the other option would have been, wouldn't it have been nice if we could have bought another 741 buses, but we couldn't, not possible. And therefore this all in person learning plan, we'll have it, it'll be very short. It'll basically say it's not possible for us given the numbers of our kids who ride the bus. And so besides the fully remote, besides the all in person, we need to have a hybrid plan. A hybrid plan means a plan that is based on both some kids in person and some kids learning remotely. And that's what we'll talk to you more about. That's a required plan. And so we've been spending a ton of time trying to figure out what's the best way to do that here in the city of Boston. The dates that you see on the slide tell you when it is we need to have these plans finalized. On July 31st, we have to file kind of a flagging document with DESE, which it's, it's a, a pretty high level um, identification of our planning documents. Um, so we'll do that by July 31st, which is only less than 10 days from now. And on August 10th, we need to file our complete and full plans for all three of those. And so we'll be ready to do that as well. Next slide, please. Now, as the superintendent said, we didn't just sort of sit in our cubicles and try to figure out what do I think is the best thing to do or what do you think is the best thing to do? We went out and asked our community because we try to live the values of equity and we can't simply dishonor people by not asking uh, for their own opinions. So what we did is first, you'll see on the slide on the, I think it's on your left, it says BPS family reopening survey results. We asked our families a lot of things, but here's one of the things we asked them. We told them, okay, we need to have these three plans. And at a very high level, one is all in person, one is all online, and the other is something in the middle. We don't know the details yet. What do you think about those if we can tell you that we will meet the public health guidelines? We will have everybody six feet apart. We will have everybody masked. We will have hand sanitation available and required for everyone, and we'll meet the rest of those guidelines. In that context, families, how do you feel about what do you think is the right thing to do right now? Now, these results are about 10 days old. What you can see on the slide is in the, on the orange, 9% said, boy, don't know. Just not even gonna weigh in, I don't know. 28% in the pink, I know it's hard to read, so I'll read these out, lo out loud to you. The, the, the fuchsia or the pink, 28% said, I think the best thing to do is be back in person. That means almost 30% of our population said, I wanna get my kids back in school. On the far other side, the dark blue, 23% said, I really think they should stay all online. And 40%, that sort of lighter blue, said, I think something in between is the right way to go. Now this isn't scientific, I certainly agree. But what it does tell us is that if you add the two um, blues together, the some sort, some people in person and the everybody, uh, um, I'm sorry, the pink and the blue, the 28 and the 40, you get 68%. That's two thirds of our people think that, that we need to get kids back into school buildings in some way. Again, my disclaimer, it's not scientific, can't take it to the bank, but it is an indication from our, pub, our public on what they, what they think. On the other side of the screen, you see another survey. We asked our staff, what do you think? Because we too have been hearing um, just generally out in the um, community that, oh, nobody's ever going to come back and teach in a school building. They're all too afraid and they're not going to do it. And we want to honor what our staff um, believes as well. And so we asked them, what do you think? And so you can see the actual question. If we reopen in the fall and if students are expected to come back, but we can keep them six feet apart and we can do masks and we can do all the rest of the social, um, the public health guidance, how likely are you to return to your position in the Boston Public Schools? 10%, the pink said, I'm not likely to come back. There's kind of nothing you can do to make me feel good enough. I'm not coming back. But the two chunks of blue, which add up to 90%, says 90% of our staff are somewhat or highly likely to come back. 45% and about 45%, they're pretty equally split. That's a good data point for us because it says to us, yep, our educators, our teachers, our custodians, our lunch monitors, they're in this with us. They're our partners and they're going to help us figure out how to do this because we all understand how important it is to get kids back into a structured environment of learning. Next slide, please. So 
with those inputs from the community and with the amount of work that's been done at the district, and I can't quantify for you what that is, but I can tell you there are 15 different lanes of expertise that have been working on running down the logistics on lots of different options for a blended model for the last two months. Um, and I can share all that information at some point in time when, when we have more time. But here's what we're recommending right now. First of all, to honor parent choice. Only parents know what's the best thing for their kid and for their household. And so no matter what the blended model we recommend to you, we also recommend that parents always be able to opt out. They can opt into staying fully remote if that's what they wanna do throughout the fall. We also know, and the district has always honored, parents' choices about whether or not they're gonna use yellow bus transportation. We need to know that, and we're ready to now start going out and asking that, and why is that? Why is that important? It's important because if 15% or 5% or 25% of our parents say, I'd like to come back, but I'm not putting my kid on a bus, that tells us how we can route our buses and how we can get our kids to school faster and more efficiently using the buses that we have. So we need to know that. And then, no matter who opts into remote learning and no matter who opts out of transportation, bottom line is on September 10th, which is the start of the calendar, the, the calendared start of the school year, we will start remote for all if we do not have, if we have not met the public health metrics that Chief Martinez just told you about. So if those numbers have spiked on September 9th or September 2nd, we will be back to you to say our recommendation is it's going to all be remote because we are not going to bring people back to school, any students back to school until those metrics can be met. But if they can be met, September 10th comes along and we are within those metrics and public health guidance says you are safe to bring people back to school. Then we have a blended model that we'd like to lay out for you that we are recommending that you consider. Um, and we will give you more information as we iterate with that, with our unions, with our communities in more detail, but we want to dispel it out for you. And again, notice my orange. There's no final decision yet. This is a draft, but of all the options that we have vetted with regard to different hybrid options, we've had to remove some of them because they're not doable because of logistics. We've had to remove some of them from the list because they're not equitable and we're not going to support a plan that doesn't provide equity in our community. And so we're left with this next plan and we'd like to talk to you about it. Next slide, please. We call this the hopscotch model. Again, it's a draft. It is not final. Here's how it would work. After families have either opted out and said, don't count me because I'll be all remote. And so I'm left with, okay, who do, I, who do I have that might still be willing to come? We divide those students into two groups, student group A and student group B in every school that we have. And student group A comes to school in the building and learns in person on Monday, Tuesday, and then they learn at home or in some other safe place. We can talk to you about that later. Um, remotely on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. At the same time, group B stays home or at some community partner's safe supervised place and, re and learns remotely on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then group B is in the building and learns in person from their teacher on Thursday and Friday. You'll see in that model, no students are in the building on Wednesday. That's important to the model because we need to have our custodians deep clean the building so that any germs group A brought in are gone before group B comes in on Thursday. They will also need to deep clean on Friday evenings and or the weekend to make sure the buildings are ready for group A again. And this is another important piece of this that's not intuitive from the description, so I make sure that I say it on the slide. In this model, the expectation would be that a teacher teaches their entire class they teach the class, the members of their class that are sitting in front of them, those eight or 10, and they teach the eight or 10 that are also remote, and they teach them at the same time. They teach them the same curriculum, the same lesson at the same time. So the kids at home are not getting no curriculum or getting a canned version of the curriculum or getting a printed packet. 
They're getting the same learning from their teacher that the kids in the classroom are. They're just not there so that they can help keep each other safe by staying apart and keeping six uh, feet apart. I wanna direct your attention to the illustration over to the left side of your screen. This helps you visualize, I think, how it is we could main, maintain six feet of distance and make this hopscotch version work. If you look at the teacher at the, at the front of the class and you assume the teacher is six feet apart, frankly, we have walked our school buildings. We've done an analysis based on all of our blueprints, but we've also walked our school buildings to make sure these are doable. So this, the teacher's space is, is distant six feet from the first row of students. And then the student desks, imagine each colored square is a desk. And those desks might be less than six feet apart. They might be three feet apart or four feet apart, but only group A, so only the blue kids are there. And so the students are six feet apart. There'll be an empty desk in between them, but the students will be six feet apart. And that's how we will have met the six feet social distancing that's required by the uh, public health guidelines. And of course, everyone will also be masked. And of course, everyone will also have all the hand sanitizing equipment in the classrooms and, and at every entryway and on every bus. That is how, you, how we can meet the six feet of distance. And that's why you need to alternate between a group A and a group B, not only because you can't get them there on the bus, although that's huge, but also because you need to keep them six feet apart in the room. The only other way to have done this would be to move out desks. There's no reason to move out desks if the kids are not gonna be there to sit in the desks. And if you do move out desks, you gotta pay for movage and storage, and then you gotta bring them back when the virus goes away. And then you gotta take them out when it brings back. So really, um, in our fiscal and logistical planning, we have um, landed on this as being a more workable model. Now. There will always be exceptions because this model needs to be vetted on a school by school basis and I'll get to how that's going to happen. And in doing that, we will find some exceptions that can be treated differently. For example, at our Carter school that only has 25 kids, those kids are our most medically fragile kids, but they're also only 25 of them in space that would allow them if they all wanted to be back. And again, those families too get to choose. But if they did want to all be back, we can accommodate them. And so they might, it might not have to be an A and a B for them. That would be a special um, situation. And also, we're going to work with our school leaders as we continue down the road here and with our union partners to figure out which of this works better for high schools. Maybe instead of two days in, in person and three days remote, maybe it works better in a high school to be a whole week in person and a whole week remote. We don't know. We do know that the scheduling for high school students is much more complex. And so we're gonna rely on our school leaders to help us learn more about that. I'm sure all of you are thinking, and you've already heard from lots of members of the community about this option. And so you have questions already, like how is this doable? I can tell you that our partners in the city of Boston, both our private schools and parochial schools are using this um, I, they're not calling it hopscotch, but they are using models that require teachers to teach both online and in person at the same time. And the way they've done that is they've trained their teachers um, in order to use both the existing technology that we have and including more technology. And you can see on the screen some of the things that we are already looking to be able to provide to make this easier to do. Also, we would definitely need to make sure that we have sufficient numbers of substitute teachers so that we're providing respite and and um, change for teachers who decide that this isn't what they want to um, continue to do. We will need to work with our paraprofessionals so that they can help assist our teachers with this heavy lift in the classroom. And, and that's one great thing about all of the different assets that we have in this district. We have a lot of adults that work in our schools, all of whom are dedicated to making sure that we keep kids safe and we allow them to learn and move forward to become the people they were meant to be. And so again, we're meeting with our unions now to figure out how we can do this in a way that we all work together towards that common goal. Also, it might not have been intuitive, but since there's no kids in the building on Wednesdays, that time, while teachers are all still teaching remotely, it might also be 
uh, um, available time to do more collaborative planning, which makes for better teaching, to schedule all those school specific administrative tasks that need to happen as well, instead of sprinkling them throughout every day, maybe those can be centered on a Wednesday so that the learning schedules can actually uh, be more cohesive. Again, we'll need to work with our school leaders and our teachers and all the other staff to figure out what works best in their community. Next slide, please. And that's where we are right now. We have discussion schedules with, scheduled right now with all of our different union partners. We've already had very high level conversations with the presidents of all of our unions about this option. We, are, we have been talking about this option and other options with our BPS community through various equitable roundtables and our community engagement sessions. And I think we're up to about 25 of those that the superintendent has already completed. We have an ongoing use of our racial equity planning tool throughout this work. And we have another big meeting on that on Friday to again, constantly focus on, is there anything about this that we can improve to make sure that the equities in it are well grounded in the way we wanna make sure our community is respected and treated. Where we are right now as a district is with this um, additional input that we're gathering, we are working on finalizing a guardrail document, which will basically say things like, school leaders, we're gonna need you to think about now, how do you want the lanes of traffic in your hallways marked so we can keep kids on this side or on that side and they won't scrum up in the middle and therefore um, expose each other? How do we do that? How do we, arrange to have those meals in the cafeteria brought up to your classrooms and where do you want the food waste receptacles so that our custodians can pick those up without interfering in your English classes. That level of operational, here's the guardrails, now how are you going to make that operational in your school? We're ready to turn to our school leaders with some high level um, identification of issues and assets that we have to bring to them and then ask them to work out the choices and the flexibilities with their, within their own schools that relate to marking of, um, of, of traffic lanes, uh, use of cafeterias, common space, can we mark your outdoor spaces so that they'll be more usable for you, um, where are your buses going to go, if we have more parents driving, where would the parent drop-offs drop be, do we have everything well painted and well marked, where is the signage in all the buildings, all of that we're working on and giving to our school leaders to then make uniquely um, usable in their own school environment. School leaders are they're gonna work with their own families, their own staff, their own community to figure out what works for them within those guardrails and build those models that will then come back to the district so that we can offer them the resources they need to help. At a very high level, that is the result of our planning to date. And I'm gonna end where I started. This is a draft plan we're interested in getting both your insights and the insights of everybody else in the community who looks to you for leadership. And so thank you for allowing us this opportunity to bring this information forward. Well, Jamie, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate that uh, comprehensive view. Um, we, uh, we know it's very hard to boil down the work that uh, you and your colleagues uh, all across the district and across the city have been doing um, over a number of months now to get us prepared for the fall. Um, but we appreciate you giving us this update. Um, for members of the public, you know, we've been talking for a number of uh, meetings now about uh, driving towards a point where we can give some definition to what the fall will look like. And uh, as you can see, it's a very, um, that's a very complex um, problem to solve. And uh, we're uh, certainly working toward that. And we are uh, certainly making strides every day and trying to focus ourselves and get our schools open on September 10th to welcome back our 55,000 students. Um, but uh, as you can also hear, there are a lot of questions uh, that still need to be answered um, despite all the work that's been done. And so this district is gonna continue to uh, be working toward uh, that plan. Uh, we are focusing on trying to get kids back in person. Uh, and that's why we are focusing on this hybrid model uh, and um, we will continue as uh, we started with uh, Chief Martinez in his presentation earlier to be mindful of what the public health uh, environment looks like and what the best practices look like uh, in um, 
public health uh, containment practices around the virus. So um, I thank you, Tammy, uh, for that presentation, Brenda um, and uh, Chief Martinez. I wanna make sure that we pause now before we resume the superintendent's report so that we can take questions from uh, the committee and give further um, context for uh, the viewing public. I should uh, note as well, by the way, uh, we're up over 600 uh, participants uh, this evening um, on Zoom. And I wanna thank our IT uh, department for some quick response here. We actually uh, hit our limit for the first time uh, this evening on our Zoom license at 500. So I apologize for any of you that weren't able to uh, enter the meeting until just a few minutes ago, um, but we're glad you joined us and um, we're happy that you are here to uh, hear about these these plans as we continue to refine our plans for a reopening. Uh, let's start with Dr. Rivera. Looks like you have your feet up. Members, if uh, any of you have uh, questions and comments as well, please uh, make yourself known. We'll go to you next, uh, Ms. Robinson. Um, yeah, so I I was just one, I had two questions. I actually have a lot of questions, but I'll stick it to two right now. Um, um, my first question is, are we also coordinating, um, talking with other local school districts? Like, what is Brookline going to do? You know, uh, you know, our neighboring school districts, like, how are we also, um, are we coordinating with, with those schools? And I was also wondering about, like, recess and, um, you know, physical activity with the school and how that, you know, and, and the sports, like how some of that will also be uh, impacted by this. And lots more questions, but I'll stick with those two for now. Sure, would you like me to answer as we go? Or I'm not sure how you, yep, yeah. okay. Yes, please, thank you. Yes. Um, so committee member Rivera, um, great questions. We have been reaching out to all of the other school partners. We are on lots of different calls through lots of different associations and forums, not just the ones run by DESE, but also the Massachusetts Superintendents Association. I know that our superintendent um, is a huge contributor of ideas there and we get ideas as well. Um, and we also have um, met on a weekly basis with all the schools in the Boston Compact who are um, integrally linked to us in terms of transportation and other services. And so certainly are waiting to see what it is um, we all decide is the best thing for Boston um, students. And so here's what we're learning from other districts. Everybody's grappling with the same problem. Some of them have more resources of one type or another. Um, not all of them have as many challenges as we do because we have 55,000 amazing students, but it's a lot of students. And you know, if you're a much smaller school district, you, your lift, at least from my perspective, is smaller. I, I know they're struggling as well, but we're all struggling with the same issues. How, how do we keep our students safe? And how do we make sure that we actually can get them back into structured learning environments? Because we hear too much from families about, don't make me choose from by, between my job and my kid, that's not fair, I need to do both. And don't make my kid wait. Kids have been out of school buildings for six months and we need to get back to learning because we can see, and all of our teachers will say that they are so much more effective with building the relationships that students need if they actually can be in the space with them. With regard to recess, I actually have a much longer presentation but Chair Lacanto would not let me do it. <laughs> we'll do that some other time. Um, but yes, recess will need to be, first of all, we need to continue to allow students to get outside and do all of that work. And actually from a pu public health perspective, that's the place we'd love students to be. Now, unfortunately, Massachusetts, apparently, I haven't lived here long, but I do know that you have winter. So we can't really plan on just doing all of our classes outside, but in the fall, we are encouraging teachers and buildings to figure out how to use outdoor spaces. DESE right now is recommending that there be mask breaks during recess, we are recommending only if you can keep your kids six feet apart. Does that make sense? Because again, social distancing requirements are to make sure everybody is either masked and or six feet apart. And if you've got kids playing tag, that's a little tough. And so it'll probably be more organized games that we can in fact keep kids apart. And we have protocols in place 
to wipe down and sanitize anything between group pods of kids. So if they're playing basketball, now before the next group comes out, those basketballs got to be wiped down. So none of it is easy, but it's important. So we're continuing to do that. With regard to athletics, we're working with the different athletic associations to get guidance from them. They have just come out with some guidance that is more specific in the last three or four days. So we're still working that through. But again, they too deal with our same kids and it's hard for them to figure out how to do athletics and keep people separated. And so, um, but we are working with them. We're not making that up. We know that they are huge partners with us and they are a reason that we keep kids engaged. So thank you for the questions. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. We'll go now to uh, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your um, report. Um, this is incredible work, and I know you all are just at the beginning. So I'm going to stick to just two questions, although I have many more. One um, is about public transportation, particularly for our middle and high school kids. Um, how, if we are trying to do one kid per seat, for our younger children, um, we have no control over the T. How are we going to make sure our students and therefore teachers are safe with our high school kids taking public transportation? Did you want to give me both questions or do you want me to jump? Um, no, the other one is completely different. So okay. just do that and then I'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> the city of Boston or the Boston Public Schools has used the T for our um, seventh graders and above for I don't know how many years, but a long time. I, uh, we have been meeting with the MBTA about the sanitation and the guidelines for the T. They um, report to a different higher power than we do with regard to the, the CDC guidelines about one kid per row per bus is specific to yellow school buses. There's different public health guidance for transit systems, and I know that they are following it. We are working with them to the extent that we can to make sure that Nobody's going to be allowed on the T that is not wearing a mask. Uh, none of our students are going to be because we're providing the mask, so they ought to be wearing them when they're on the T. Now, we don't regulate that. We're not on the T, so I can't, you know, we're, but we do know of the issue. And the fact is, just like the adults that take the T every day to school, to work, as long as we are staying six feet apart from our neighbors and we are wearing a mask and we have hand sanitized both before we get on and when we get off, public health says we're, we're safe and healthy. And so I can't go any deeper than that other than I know that the MBTA is also working with the Boston Public Health Commission about what can they do to ensure that not just our kids, but the public in general is, is healthy and still uses public transit. Okay. So my next question is a pretty broad one because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to understand what does classroom life look like? And so I'm trying to understand um, if there's going to be group A is going to be physically in the class and group B is at home. And is the teacher simultaneously working with group A and group B? They are. And it is fascinating to watch that <laughs> happen. And I have been in, in, uh, schools here in the city of Boston watching that happen and I, I commend all of you. In fact, I'll share with the chair some um, links where you can also watch that happen because really our teachers are great at connecting with students and, and providing the instructional input that they need. What they need is some support and some tools that they don't yet have to, to make sure that they have the ability to see those kids that are at home, not by carrying their own laptop around, right? Then, because you got to walk to the whiteboard or you've got to, you know, walk around the room. And so our, our technology plan, it um, relies on getting cameras that can then project and also have speakers in the room in the same way that when you go to a conference at a hotel, if I call in from the, you know, hinterlands, you can hear my question. Well, I need, um, Jaden on the Zoom call to be able to be heard in the room as well. Otherwise, he's not having the same experience as the kids in the room. So yeah, it's a hard lift. It is not an impossible lift because other teachers are doing it and ours are better than that, so they can do it. Okay, part of the same question. Um, we know all of our families are not gonna be at home when their children are remote learning. Um, what plans do we have with city or with partners to make sure those children who cannot be in the classroom are in safe other locations and able to call in, check, you know, all of the above, 
that's going to allow them for this hybrid model to be successful no matter where you are when you are remote. That is one of the things that I think we learned from the spring and even a little bit the summer here, right? It is, it is, um, it is not true that every family has the ability to um, stay home and supervise their fourth grader getting online. That's simply not been the case and it's not gonna be the case. And so really working with uh, Vice Chair Oliver Davila, we have been talking about how do we better reach to not only the traditional partners that we've used for both before and after school care. One, we wanna use them because they have adults that already know our kids and know the work. But two, we have a little problem with that in that they use our space. We need people out of our space so we can deep clean our space on a more regular basis. So we're trying to figure out, well, how do we on a neighborhood basis figure out other spaces that those partners can then occupy. Um, and then we can have our kids there as an option for parents to choose. Because if a parent says, I want my kid all remote, but that parent can't ever be there, maybe that's the best thing for that kid, maybe it's not. Maybe it's better to be at a different location with adult supervision. Now, I did just have a meeting with uh, people representing both before and after care in the child care industry. And they're real interested in working with us to figure out how to make that work. Obviously, those of you who know, the childcare industry has its own struggles through this whole COVID process because of how childcare is paid for. So we're at the table with them trying to figure out, since we're the biggest market of kids, how can we help you also stand yourselves back up so that you're there for our kids? We don't have those answers yet, but we know it's a question and we're at least at the tables working on it. Yeah, I mean, in sort of tandem to that, Will that then require yet another busing or transportation set of issues if we're also now also trying to get Group B to their off-site location? Would, would the district be responsible for getting those children to their off-site transportation as well as the ones that are coming to school? Or would that fall to parents to have to get their kids to that alternative um, child care program? That's why we're trying to look in a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, what's the closest thing to the school? Because again, we do have only so many buses that we can use unless the um, CDC guidelines change. So I can't answer that yeah. yet, although I know it's a problem. Yeah, would it be the closest thing to the school or because our children are coming from all over the place to a school, would you be looking for things closer to the student's home? Might if, depend. If I live in Dorchester but go to school in East Boston, I'm not gonna go to an East Boston after school program, probably, I would, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's we would the bigger need, question. We yeah. need to check with our parents about, yeah. you know, what do they normally do, right? Right, all right. Thank you, I have more questions, but I know my colleagues have many as well, so I'll defer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Uh, Vice Chair, did you wanna follow on uh, with some of your participation here um, around the, uh, the question on uh, out of school time uh, that uh, Ms. Robinson uh, has raised. Um, sure. Um, thank you um, so much, Tammy, and all the team at BPS, uh, Dr. Caselius, and all of the city. Because I know, um, I know you keep saying it's early, but I know you've been planning this and working on this. So I just want to um, thank you for all your work. I know it's not easy, and I I really appreciate that we have um, gotten feedback from families and we've gotten feedback from our teachers. I think that's really really important. Um, also, um, the fact that we have choice um, because some families obviously need to have their children back in school. Other families have other, you know, issues, whether it's health or just fear given um, uh, who has been hit hardest from COVID. So I really appreciate that. Um, we've had several conversations around the out of school time. So thank you so much, um, uh, Jerry, for bringing um, all those, uh, all your questions up. I think we're looking at the neighborhood, what's around there, both for partners that are work in the school, but then partners who actually have uh, their own spaces, um, like the West End House, which is in Brighton and has a lot of space. How do we work with them? Or the High School Task Force that has a building or looking at uh, talking to like the Y or the Boys and Girls Club. So I think we really have to just, um, simultaneously be having these conversations with partners across the city. So I would just, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll just put it out there. If, you, if you're if you interested in that work, please contact uh, myself or yes. Tammy or Dr. Pacellius, you know, uh, our, our emails are on. 
online, you can find us, um, but we are looking for those partnerships. We can't do this alone. Partners are a big part of uh, everything and, and part of this uh, equation as well. My, my only uh, comment question, um, I know it's way far off, um, so it might sound silly at this point, but I'm, I'm wondering about the food piece, if we'll be able with this hopscotch to be able to go back to having like um, made meals like we were having before versus like the package. Yep, I can certainly answer that. If, if, um, so here's our plan right now. We basically, if we walked all the cafeterias in all 125 buildings to figure out how do we prep food um, and how do we get it to classrooms? Because we also, we can't have our staff crammed into little kitchen spaces either. They also need to get six feet apart. And so we'll need to use our cafeteria spaces differently for prep. For breakfasts, we are leaning towards a grab and go kind of breakfast so that a kid gets into their school building, washes their hand, gets their breakfast, goes to their classroom. For lunches, we're intending to still prepare our lunch food the same way we always had. And then they'll be delivered one of two ways. Either adults will bring it to the classroom, that'll depend on the size of the school and the number of adults are available, and or per class, we'll have to have kids come down in a socially distanced line, get their food and go back up to the classroom and eat their food. We understand though that, you know, while we are proud of the work that we did this summer in terms of uh, providing remote meals, it, you know, everybody likes uh, fresher food and um, prepared food, and we're gonna continue to do that at the very highest quality. There's another piece there that you didn't ask about, but I'm gonna throw it out just so that somebody will think about it. Even for kids who are learning at home, they are our kids. They're our kids those days too, and they deserve student meals those days. And so we also have a plan to continue to provide student meals on the hopscotch model, it could be that on the last day that you're there, you take home the next three days of meals because you're not coming back until the next week. If you are all remote, then we're going to continue to have meals available at the sites that we've had throughout the um, closure period, all of which are at schools, and or expand those if we need to as we look at the neighborhood breach. But we are looking at that lens as well to make sure that um, no matter what um, model we choose here, we're not adding to the food insecurity of any of our families. Thank you. That was going to be uh, my next um, question because I think, thank you for answering that. It's really important for families to know that um, there, that, that will be um, available. And I already got some texts from some partners, so that's good. Good. <laughs> Saying they can. Um, and I, I totally apologize because I've heard this presentation a couple of times. So I might have zoned out. Um, did you talk about the ventilation and the windows? Because I think that might be concerning people. And so we should just let them know we're looking at that as well. Um, I didn't, uh, trying to stay in my five slides, but I, here's my answer to that. Um, we are doing an audit of every one of our classrooms to ensure that we have airflow that meets the CDC guidelines. Now, I need everyone needs to know the facts here, so we're not making them up. The CDC does not require that buildings put in forced air filtration systems if they don't have them. Most public schools in the nation do not have them. In Massachusetts, 30 some of our schools do, 90 some of our schools do not. The CDC guidelines is even when you don't have that, first of all, if you do have that, make sure you're changing the filters and you're doing that at the highest quality. We've done that, we have that plan. But if you don't have those systems, then there are guidelines for making sure that the outdoor air can come in, which is as simple as making sure that your windows open, which is why we are auditing every classroom right now to assure that the windows will open. And that work will be done by September 10th. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Sam Acevedo there for texting me. He, I put him on the spot right now. He's volunteering space. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And uh, thank you, Tammy, specifically for uh, giving us some uh, quick feedback on the uh, facilities. And I understand in conversations with Desi that we'll uh, be receiving additional guidance um, very shortly on uh, facilities uh, as well, particularly around this issue of ventilation. Uh, let's go next to Dr. Coleman. Great, thank you. So thank you, and 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 I, I appreciate the whole conversation and 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 emphasizing that this is a great a great draft. 
and that you're looking for the feedback. And so I think that's a great way to approach it. And I hope that, and like Sam and other people like Sam, other people can reach out and, and point to specific things that they want either want to know more about or have ideas how they can assist you and that this yep. is an iterative process and that this is such a dynamic and moving moving target that we have to be ready to change and make and do uh, do some things rapidly and then take the data and change uh, uh, from that. So I appreciate the uh, focus on, on public health as, as central and our ability to say this moment we're gonna have to shut down if, if, if the numbers change. So it's a scary time for us all, but the fact that uh, people are being open and honest and upfront with all these challenges is really quite remarkable and exciting to be part of such a uh, thoughtful uh, public, uh, uh, civically oriented group. Um, the question I have, and I don't know, and then superintendent may tell me that uh, this is gonna come later, is, and this is maybe more directed towards the chief academic officer, you know, we've had conversations about competency-based learning. And so uh, I don't know who, and who participated in the Rennie uh, conversation about opening of schools today, but certainly about all the, the social emotional services that children need, which you didn't talk about. And I know that you, you, you got, we're not blaming you because we know you got, you got cut and, and, and you, you, I'm sure that there are other presentations we could have, but in particularly this, this question about if we're gonna have an online movement or this hybrid movement, you know, how, how are we moving forward in the conversation that uh, even before COVID we were discussing about moving to a, more, a mastery model that will allow us to use this more fluid educational status in a way that's really focused on individual child learning. And I don't know whether that's in this presentation as part of our reaction and, or an opportunity that COVID brings, uh, particularly with the increase of virtual learning, digital, digitally mediated learning, or whether that's for something later. So I, I can wait if that's already on the agenda, it's gonna come up again. I can briefly just speak to that, uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, our academic team right now is meeting and we, they're going to be convening task forces with teachers around the academics to begin to look at it. We first built somewhat of an architecture, built off our remote learning plan. Um, and we are working with um, all of our stakeholders around the academic plan in, the, in kind of these creative ideas. I know that Ayala Shakir also had ideas around her plans with Schools Without Walls. And so she's been presenting to our equity roundtables as well as the OAG task force. And so those kinds of really innovative ideas and taking the moment to be more innovative is an evolving practice where we are learning from teachers. I had focus groups in May and June to speak to our teachers about what worked well in remote learning and what didn't work well. And we've learned from that. We were able to gather a lot of notes and that will go to our telescope network of teacher leaders who will help design and share best practices across schools. We have the uh, administrator leadership uh, institute coming up as well as our teacher leadership institute. And then we'll have some professional development days. Um, those are still yet to be worked out with our teacher union on the number of those days, but there will be additional professional development days as we think about uh, preparing for the an upcoming school year. And I just wanted to uh, shout out to uh, Ms. Oliver Davila and the partners that we had, we are learning so much this summer and I look forward to the evaluations that they'll be doing, uh, the deep evaluations that Boston After School and Beyond does every single year about uh, their remote learning experience this year and what can we learn from that so that we can better engage students because I hear that some of the uh, learning that's happening within our partnerships is very engaging and students have said that they very much have enjoyed uh, the, the school that they have this summer. And then um, just looking at the competency-based measures in terms of grading, uh, we will be undertaking grading and looking at our remote learning plan 2.0 and what does that look like? Because it does look very different in remote than it does in person. And um, so those are some of the things that our team is working on. Great, thank, thank you very much. And just the other, and I don't, I, this is more of a comment uh, than, than a question, but I, and, and I understand that you're working with our, 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 our our partners in the professional unions around the care, and I and I and I do want to make sure that I'm confident that we will uh, address the same care for the professionals, the essential professionals of our world, as we have for our children. And that's a very complicated thing to do. I, I think it's impressive the percentage of our staff who want to be and engage and and put themselves literally at risk. Um, 
to take care of our children and we want to be able to care for that. I know you are, I just want to raise that up. I'm impressed by their involvement and I'm looking forward to seeing how we can care for their well-being as well as our children. Uh, there's a lot of research that points out that if the adults are healthy, then we're producing healthy kids. And so we want yeah, to- I appreciate, care for I appreciate that Dr. Coleman and lifting that up. I should have also mentioned all of the cell well work that we're doing for social emotional learning, the trauma informed work that we are um, being mindful of uh, in terms of our practice uh, and the adults as well. And um, looking at that and how do we re-enter? How do we reconnect with our students and how do we provide those services? As you know, over the re remote learning period, we were able to do 14,000 uh, telehealth sessions, and that was um, really well received by our students uh, for their mental health services. So we'll continue to learn and continue to grow and get better. Thanks very much, Dr. Coleman. We'll go now to Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chia. <clears throat> and thank you for the uh, presentations to date. This is the first time I have seen it, so I was looking forward to um, hearing the work. Uh, obviously, the superintendent I've spoken with her a number of times. I know how hard the team has been working on this. I want to start off by saying, first of all, I'm glad everyone on the call, not only the school committee members and the staff that are on, but the hundreds of parents and teachers and community members that are listening as well. I think we all have the exact same goal, which is to get our students back in class as soon as possible. I, there's no doubt about that. Um, but we are in the middle of a public health academic, a, a, epidemic. And so um, thank you, uh, Chief Martinez, for joining us today. I'm glad our approach is grounded in science, and uh, that is critical to hear and to see the, the visual aspect of how closely we are working with Chief Martinez and his team and the public health professionals. We're a city uh, that has an overabundance of public health, public health experts, and uh, we're lucky in that regard, and I'm glad they're helping us uh, have an approach that is grounded in science. Um, and in the CDC guidance. Um, I do note, Superintendent, and, and we can get to this, that the state initially talked about three feet difference versus six feet difference. And so uh, in a minute, we can talk about, you know, how you had thought about that as well. But the CDC guidance says, Chief Martinez and, and Ms. Pust had said is uh, the six feet. So um, this is a balancing act. This is very, very challenging, right? We have um, parental uh, concerns and, and um, parents trying to make the best choice for their students and also what works for their family. And then we have our teachers and the rest of our, our staff as well with um, an unbiting desire to get back in the classroom and teach their students, but also real concerns over the nuts and bolts of this. And I do know um, Dr. Rivera, you had asked, were we consulting with other districts right around us? And Ms. Pooh said yes, and also said, but we have unique issues as a large urban district that maybe some other neighboring districts don't have. And I do know that the Council of Great City Schools has been facilitating on a national level conversation. Superintendent, I believe you're on a call almost every single week with your peers on large urban districts around the country. Many of your team are with their peers as well. The chair and I are on a call with school board members. Um, every single week, every single Friday afternoon. So the issues you are facing and what you are thinking about are the exact same that all of our large urban districts are facing across the country. Because we're thinking even more about the equity issues for our students because there are such um, inequities that uh, this pandemic has exposed. And so um, I do want to ask, as I think about some of these balancing issues, Ms. Poost, I, I know immediately parents are gonna go to if this is the model we end up implementing, and I know there's a huge asterisk on that, as Chief Martinez has made very clear to us, it depends upon what the data is saying come September and come October and come November. And we all have to get into a mindset that may be rapid, rapid shifts that are necessary. Right. Um, but that's what we have to do for our city to continue um, to, to get through this pandemic. But I know parents are gonna ask, so when you talk about group A and group B, Help me out with how those groups will be decided. Do parents get to try to say what their preference is? Are we focusing first on um, our most vulnerable students who may want to be back in a classroom? You know, as I said, um, this, is, uh, this has exposed a lot of inequities for our students in their learning ability. And we're all deeply concerned about the, the COVID learning loss. 
So how do we, how do we decide what students are in the classroom when? So group A and group B, if we do that model, everybody is in the classroom two days a week. Some are this two days, some are this two days, but there's nobody that's not in the classroom. So the real choice is, do you care between Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday, if we do that model? We are looking at, um, with regard to transportation specifically, wouldn't parents prefer to have all kids in the household in the same group so that if they have to arrange for childcare, they can not do it every day of the week, but do it those three days that they have kids at home. So that's one issue. We're also meeting with our academics and our school leader teams about, well, what is it from, a, from an educator's perspective about who should be instructed together and who shouldn't? For example, you know, maybe if you just take, if you think about your own, if you had a class of 20 kids, I could ask a teacher and say, which of those 10 kids learn better together? Do you want those in a group versus a not? If you take away that they're in the same household or not, and you, you could, that's a value you could put on the table and, and knock through. And so we will, we'll talk about that issue. But then there are special students as well. Like what about special needs students? Now they, they too are gonna to be in the building two days a week, either Monday, Tuesday or Thursday, Friday. So they will be there. Now for them, maybe they're gonna be there all five days. Maybe they're at least gonna be there four of the five days because we can fit them in the classrooms. Some of them we can. Some disability strands, we can't. It really depends on what the size of the classroom is and the required number of kids that can be in a classroom. So even if you cut it in half, can you keep them six feet apart? So a lot of that is kind of minutia where you have to do it on a one by one basis, which is why we're at the point where we're turning to school leaders now to say, within these guardrails, what works best in your community, knowing your kids, knowing the different grade levels you have and the classes within those grade levels, what do you think we should consider? We aren't as a district simply saying, you're gonna be A and you're gonna be B. We are trying to get those, the input as broadly as possible. But the one thing that we know so far is we're gonna try and honor, if you come from the same household, you should be in the same cohort. So parents would know what days they have kids at home and what days they don't. Not that I have, my second grader home on Monday and Tuesday, and I have my fourth grader here home on Thursday and Friday, which effectively means I can't work. Right. Um, it's still going to be extremely challenging. So yeah. thank, thank you for that. And um, I do want to talk for a minute as well about uh, our teachers and their concerns. I agree with you that you know we absolutely have some of the best in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question about that. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic as you are about the ease in trying to teach a classroom of students in front of you who are, um, let's face it, struggling to wear masks, as we all are, we all can't wait to take them off, um, and trying to do remote at the exact same time. I think that is going to be extraordinarily challenging. So I'm wondering if we're also thinking of some alternative methods, for example, we have a lot of college students in the Boston area, even though many have been sent home, but are we thinking about partnering and trying to arrange more tutoring for our students as an example or alternative means of support? It may be a little bit of what uh, Vice Chair Oliver Davila was getting to with working with um, partners, but you know, are we thinking of alternative ways to supplement the education for our students as well? Well, first, I want to be really clear. If I said I thought it was easy, I misspoke because I don't. Oh, you, you yeah. didn't say that. I just wanted okay. to really yeah. call out the fact yeah. that no, it's it's a challenge. I do think it's a challenge. I do believe that it's a challenge that can be met because others are meeting it and ours are better, smarter, faster, more efficient. That doesn't diminish how difficult it will be. With regard to whether we're gonna use college students as tutors and all that, I do think that walks right into the before and after school supports. What we need to really focus on though, separate from that, because that's hugely important. It's not, a, it's not an add-on, it is a, without those supports, our kids wouldn't do well in the classroom. But the rules are, Every kid gets 180 days of schooling. Now, maybe that's going to change to 165. Doesn't matter to me. Whatever that number is, I'm entitled to that, that education, whether I'm in front of you or if I'm at home. And so we as a district need to figure out how to provide access to the curriculum, the same curriculum, to our students, all of our students. 
And one option would be, well, we'll just teach the two days that they're here, we'll teach these people, and the two days that they're here, we'll teach those people, and the other three days you're not in school. Well, if that's true, that doesn't meet the DESE requirements of X number of days that everyone has to have of school, and it also cuts the curriculum in half in terms of what a grade level progression would be. So there isn't any way for a teacher to get students to learn the whole grade's worth of content and growth in half the days. We know that because that's kind of what we had to do during the spring, right? We only had so many hours that we could do with our kids and it was a crisis and nobody was prepared and we couldn't give them the training or the tools. We're going to be better prepared now to do better on this, but we also have a better lens on what is, what are the equities that each one of those kids is due and how do we provide it? And I don't say this flippantly at all. I really don't. So please don't anybody on the 680 people listening mis misquote me on this. It is a huge lift, but it is a huge lift for these kids to not have education to. And when it comes to picking between where's that burden gonna fall on adults or on kids, I think all of us are gonna say it falls on the adults to step up and do everything that we can to make it happen. And that's why I truly believe our teachers will and can. Thank you. Again, being respectful of my other colleagues, I just have one more comment I want to make, and it goes back to, I think, Ms. Robinson, you may have brought up about facilities, and, or, or Ms. Oliver Davila. Um, we've all, and, and it was interesting, Ms. Poos, you said 30 of our buildings effectively have air filtration systems and 60 or more don't. And many of us have been in those buildings that you can't even see out windows, let alone open them. And so, I respect the fact that you say, you know, staff is walking now and figuring out how to make that happen. But I'm also thinking about the weather in, in Boston. And so in September, it's probably gonna to be too hot to open the windows. And there may be a couple of weeks in October that it would be nice to have the windows open, but come November, it's gonna to be too cold to have the windows open. And, you know, how do we balance the realities of our facilities with, um, you know, the, the health implications and the health uh, recommendations. I think that's a great point too and and I don't dispute I haven't been in all the buildings I haven't been here long enough to be in all the buildings but I accept that to be true I hear it a lot. It, it, it is. So I will say I will say the the Senate is now looking at a infrastructure bill that includes schools. That would be lovely. House, the House of Representatives has passed one and this would be a huge boost for districts to be able to focus on, on things like air filtration, et cetera. I know we've been doing a lot the past few years through the Mass School Building Authority okay. to do windows replacements for a number of our buildings, but it's still a challenge when, Superintendent, what's the latest count of how many buildings we have? Because you've walked them all, 100? I think it's 135. 135 buildings, because I know you've walked them all. And <laughs> um, many of us have been in, in most, if not all of them as well. And so, um, we know there are inequities in our facilities and this is going to bring it to the forefront even more. So it really again, we're gonna have to accelerate all of our, a lot of our facilities work and getting federal support for that is going to be critical. Yep, and I, I, we welcome any of your support in doing that. And the only other thing I would say in response when that issue comes up is what is the alternative? We simply can't I mean, the fact is the 135 buildings are what they are. We can fix them as fast as we can, but we simply can't say there won't be a school year this year because the buildings, the windows don't open because there was a school year last year when the windows didn't open. Now it's true. Maybe we didn't need as much air filtration last year or the year before. But I think what's happening is that COVID is pointing out for us a lot of the inequities that, that we've all been working for and now we're gonna have to work harder, faster. and but we can't make the decision that then nobody gets their second grade year or their third grade year, unless these are barriers that we simply cannot get through. And that's why we're gonna work hard to get through them. Uh, my last question is I, I do know your presentation where we have surveyed parents and we have surveyed um, staff and you noted uh, the parental responses, you know, which were varied across four groups. Um, I do note in some surveys that I've seen in other cities that 
do tend to be big uh, discrepancies, particularly when you look at it by um, communities that folks were a part of, and particularly communities, I think Ms. Davila, as you said, Oliver Davila, that you would say communities that have been disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID and have seen it upfront and, and personal are, are quite frankly more nervous about their children going back into schools. Have we, have we seen that data as well in Boston? We have seen that and we can, I didn't put it on the slide, but we can break that, um, that data down by race and by neighborhood and um, a couple other criteria. And you do see some differences, but it's also interesting when you look at the other questions about what are the things you rate highest in terms of your need? Is it to get back to work? Is it safety? Is it the safety of your household? Is it whatever else? You see the opposite. I'm sorry, I have a dog. <laughs> um, you see the same breakdowns kind of on the opposite issue um, of the question. Like, yes, I need to get back to work more. Yes, I'm more worried about being in person. And so again, like you said, it's a it's a very complex balancing act. And I think we also need to say out loud to each other in grace, there is no right answer. There's simply right. the best we can do. You know, it's interesting. I wanted, to, I wanted to finish with that. And thank you for saying that. I, I um, ask my fellow members and all those focused on public, Boston Public Schools to realize how hard the superintendent and her team in conjunction with Chief Martinez and others are working on this. And uh, we need to, as, as much as this impacts all of us, um, we need to understand the complexities involved and try to give space to the superintendent and her team, knowing that she has the best interests of our students at heart and is uh, the most equity grounded person I've probably met in my life, um, knowing how important it is to her that um, she's trying to do the right thing. And, you know, we need as a city as much as we're anxious to have answers and uh, we need as a city to um, be constructive partners in helping make this happen for our students and for our um, teaching and professional and all overall uh, school staff to be held through this healthy through this issue. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. And um, I appreciate you ending on uh, that note. Um, you know, certainly I know the, uh, the superintendent's singular focus um, Tammy, how many days is it until September 10th? I know you have the count. 50, 50. Oh. 50 days till September 10th. I know your uh, Superintendent Casilius, uh, you and your staff, your singular focus is getting us to that date and getting our schools ready uh, to welcome back our students uh, in whatever mode um, the public health conditions uh, bring us to on that date. Uh, so that we're is, thankful for this. That'd I'm sorry? Good, that'd be a good one because that's my birthday. All right. Well, you know, we'll, we'll hopeful. We want to be celebrating on that day and um, we'll be looking forward to it. Um, but nevertheless, um, we, uh, as you can see, um, we're very uh, thankful uh, for the work uh, that um, Superintendent, you and your team, and especially Ms. Proust have been doing uh, over the months. Um, and we also have, um, you know, the pulse on the, uh, the concerns of our community. Um, uh, particularly with respect to uh, all these unanswered questions uh, that we want to get uh, clarity on as we get closer to the start of school. So we know you're working on it and to the members of the public, uh, we will be um, continuing uh, to receive regular updates here from uh, the superintendent. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset of the broadcast, I know some people have joined us since that time. Uh, we've scheduled two additional meetings in, in uh, August uh, so that you know we can address a number of issues, but certainly this issue um, the, uh, the issue of reopening is going to be a constant um, uh, matter at the forefront for us. And so we certainly want to be able to uh, continue to keep folks updated. You can also be updated with the mayor's uh, frequent press conferences. I, I believe they're still every day. If not every day, they're several times a week. And um, we're getting our public health in input from there, from Chief Martinez. And uh, the superintendent's been able to uh, participate quite a bit. And I know, Superintendent, you want to uh, note something. I also want to make sure that we remind folks again that we do have an opportunity for feedback here, not only the survey, um, but the town halls uh, that you're hosting on uh, return. And I believe there's uh, the first one coming up this Saturday. So I, I want to make sure that you uh, take a moment just to remind folks of, of uh, that it, those details uh, as we move on. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that um, 
you know, we are, we met with our unions for the first time um, yesterday and we are continuing to do that throughout um, the next couple of weeks and we will have uh, hopefully some final drafts later, but these are preliminary uh, I, ideas right now and our, our, our more preferred methods and what we've been able to uh, learn and gain from the data, from the science. And I want to thank Tammy <clears throat> and her team for her, their incredible work. I want to thank Chief Martinez and Mayor Walsh for the entire cabinet for all of their incredible work um, in, in helping us get this to the place that it is. Of course, there's still more vetting and more uh, negotiating to do to get to a final place for parents. So I'm asking for parents to just be patient with us, but attend our community forums. We have a number of them over the next several weeks. And so we will be getting information out that way. We'll also have a website launched so that parents can go there and get information and we'll be following up with robocalls and texts uh, and getting more information out that way so that we can meet all of our multilingual uh, parents and make sure that they have adequate uh, opportunity to provide input as well as to know exactly what's going on for their options this fall. So again, uh, many thanks to everybody, especially Maggie Riddell, Dana Engel, Tess Atkinson, who are project managers directly in our office with Ms. Poost, um, who work tirelessly all around the clock to be able to direct some of this work with, in collaboration with Ms. Poost's leadership. So many, many thanks. Thank you uh, for calling up uh, your team, uh, Superintendent. Thank you once again to Chief Martinez. I know your time is precious um, and uh, many people are calling for, uh, especially uh, right now. So um, thank you for spending a few minutes with us and um, we uh, wanna support you in your work. Um, Superintendent, um, I wanna make sure uh, we, we started your report a while ago. Um, you might have a few other items that you wanna uh, note for us. And so I wanna take time to loop back and um, see if there are any other items you wanted to update on us before, update us on, excuse me, uh, before. I know you want me to shorten it. <laughs> What's that, I'm sorry? You want me to shorten it. <laughs> so I'm gonna, We're I'm gonna have a long meeting either way. You tell us what we need to hear. <laughs> well, I got a special guest I wanna introduce first and Excellent. then um, that's part of my report too. And then I will try to be brief. I did take a couple things out that I think have also been publicly posted. So I don't think that uh, they're necessary to repeat here because I think the school committee is aware of them uh, and the public is aware of those uh, few things around COVID testing and a few other things. So I'm just gonna take those out to shorten our time. Um, but first I wanna welcome Chief Coakley, Chief Coakley Grice. Um, we have um, brought her here tonight to introduce, as she turned her video on so you can see her now? I did, is it enough light? I'm sorry. My, that's okay, it's all good, it's all good. Um, last night, last month, uh, as you know, Chief Weston retired after many years of service uh, to our Boston children, and we were going to recognize him at the last meeting, but he wasn't able to attend, so we'll make sure that we definitely do that in the future, but we are so happy to welcome uh, the newest member of our BPS family, our new Chief of Safety Services, Neva Coakley-Grice. She comes to us from 27 years with the Boston Police Department. She's a self-professed hometown girl from Roxbury, my, my hometown, uh, who has spent her entire career working in Boston. Um, she started out as a police officer in South Boston and cherished her time spent working with students at the Tynan and former Gavin Middle School. Uh, she, Chief Coakley has really hit the ground running since taking on this incredible, important position. I think she's trying to uh, challenge me and what I did this fall and getting into all the schools and communities. She's been working to cultivate trust within the community, build relationships with students and families. She's uh, already introduced herself to BSAC and really trying to build some of the bridges and connections to the broader city and community given the current context uh, that we have around police reforms that are necessary uh, and urgent. Uh, so this transformative role, this transformative role, I'm sorry, is um, during a time of real change locally and across the country. And I'm just really happy to have Neva on the team. Um, and I'd like to just invite you, Neva, if you wanna say a few words. Just a few words. Uh, superintendent, thank you so much. I would like to thank the mayor and the superintendent, uh, Casilius, for allowing me this opportunity as equal. I thank you, the school committee in advance for your support and acceptance for my appointment. Um, I'm a hometown girl, as the superintendent said, who has grown up in Boston communities and attended Boston public schools. 
my brothers as well. I heard two brothers. Um, so it's an exceptional honor to be in this position and have the blessings to continue to serve my community as I had for 27 years with the Boston Police Department as a Boston police officer and subsequently a detective. I'm a leader amongst leaders with my new school police officers and we commit to, to ensure that respectful and positive engagement for the safety and security of our students and staff of BPS are ensured. I'm looking forward to a healthy start and thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm telling you, she's full of so much joy. She just exudes the juice. <laughs> she's, she is, uh, you, you see her and she is just so happy and um, just leans into the work. And I know students yeah, are going good. to really uh, enjoy her spirit and uh, her passion for children. Yes. Welcome once again, Chief Kofi Grace. Thank you. So I'll just update you on a couple more things. Um, you know, we started, we're in about our third week of virtual summer learning and programming. I, I spoke to that earlier. The majority of our programs are run from approximately July 6th to August 7th with a few programs that might extend just a bit longer uh, based on the needs of our students and the offerings that the pro, uh, partners are able to do. Across all BPS summer programming, including our programs run by our Boston After School and Beyond partners, we have about 13,671 students enrolled actively. Um, we did have more students uh, who registered and a few students um, did not show up, but uh, we are really happy with that number. It's about double what we would normally have. Uh, and so over the last week, we've worked to provide students enrolled in summer learning programs with summer care packages, including notebooks and writing utensils and art supplies. This initiative uh, included help from staff and volunteers who assembled the summer learning kits at Up Academy Dorchester last week. The kits were then delivered to students in a variety of methods, which was courier service, socially distanced pickup operations in our school parking lots. I wanna thank the Boston Cares for coordinating the volunteer efforts and thank you to the Boston Red Sox for donating reusable bags. It's so nice to be able to surprise our students and families with these learning materials. Um, additional summer information like the summer reading list and community programs is also available on our website, bostonpublicschools.org forward slash summer. I want to just uh, give you a brief uh, update on some COVID testing that's happening uh, in response to um, more opportunities within our neighborhoods. Uh, the City of Boston Office of Health and Human Services and the East Boston Neighborhood Community Health Center. It has some open up, uh, excuse me, open walk-up testing uh, at Jackson Man Building. Testing began yesterday and the site will be open through August 1st. Hours of operation will be Tuesday through Friday, 2 to 7 p.m. and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. There's no testing on Sundays and Mondays. I appreciate everyone's cooperation and understanding of the critical role that our schools play um, to help with the coordinated response from the city in this unprecedented public health emergency. Again, we our family hotline is available to all BPS parents at 617-635-8873 to, to ensure that our families are regularly able to contact, uh, contact us and uh, ask us for help. So uh, staff is supporting this hotline in many, many different languages. And uh, if you want to call, please call between Monday and Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Again, that's 617-635-8873. Uh, I, I also updated all of you in May uh, that I had entered into the 60-day negotiation on the DESI MOU with the uh, commissioner, and I want to provide you with an update on that uh, on that agreement and amendment. So BPS acknowledges the district's current focus on uh, safely reopening school, and um, so did Desi. And so we are going to be working on our priority initiatives going forward this year to to the extent that we are feasible within our responsibilities. These prior priorities uh, include specific improvements in our transfer in our 33 transformation schools, the adoption of the mass core, and we had one presentation. We will be bringing that back around to you after school start, and reducing chronic absenteeism, improving outcomes for students with disabilities, and improving transportation. Those were key areas that we had within our plan, uh, and we will be continuing to do that throughout the year this year. The second amendment delays the implementation of 
uh, the measures of success for BPS priority initiatives under school year 21-22. And the amendment also delays the beginning of the planning work for DESE and BPS to determine specific annual targets and other matters until March uh, 15th of 2021. It also delays the implementation of the Kaleidoscope Network project uh, in the 15 East Boston schools until uh, March, um, around March uh, timeframe when we began the negotiation again. I wanna update the student privacy um, uh, working group that we have. I want to thank Vice Chair Oliver Davila for joining me on this working group. Since the beginning of the school year, I have asked for a deep dive into our policies, practices, and procedures as it pertains to the sharing of student information. It is our mission to provide safe and welcoming schools for all BPS students, particularly our immigrant students, to better inform and build upon the district's work this year and strengthening our policies in these areas. We have convened a school safety working group. The working group has met to sympathize, synthesize additional research and best practices, as well as solicit feedback from stakeholders throughout the year and experts to make recommendations about the district's school safety operations, their practices, including the uh, proposed privacy of student information policy. The group held its sixth meeting yesterday, July 21st. BPS presented a draft policy to the group and received some initial feedback. The group will meet again to, uh, one more time to discuss the draft policy. BPS anticipates bringing forward this policy to the school committee given we can have um, some uh, solid agreement at the beginning of August. School leader and community feedback. I'd just like to take a moment to, uh, to address some of the recent stories you may have read about this past week. We've discussed here many times before that transformative work we need to do together will require an all hands on deck approach. That's more true now as we work to confront the new challenges and heightened inequities that the global pandemic has thrust upon us. Constantly evaluate ourselves and our work is part of the continuous improvement practice I've worked to cultivate my entire career. And that means paying attention when there's a need to course correct. I've always welcomed and been incredibly grateful for feedback from my colleagues, even when that feedback is difficult. And I'm equally grateful that my conversations with school leaders continue because I have no doubt that their commitment to children is equal to my own and equal to that of the incredible, incredible central office team that is working to support them. I also recognize that change is hard and leading with empathy especially in times of uncertainty and crisis, is so important to making people feel heard and valued. In our rush to close schools, feed children, and deliver Chromebooks for remote learning, I think we all had to work hard to reach every student and sustain momentum and relationships. I didn't come to Boston because I thought it would be easy. I don't shy away from tough conversations because I believe in the work and I believe in, the health, in, an, and I believe in healthy conflict. That's what makes us stronger and makes us more determined to reach our shared goals together. I have no doubt that the talented leaders in this district will continue to challenge me and that I'll challenge them too, that we'll continue to grow and learn from each other as we aspire to be our best for the students we serve and the kids, we, and the kids deserve no less from all of us. I've spent the past week reflecting on this, on this first year. It's been a year like no other. There have been times I have been so proud of this district, the whole community and this entire city. So many remarkable accomplishments to speak to and so many adversities we overcame. It hasn't been easy on any of us and the rapid shift we needed to make due to COVID made it even more challenging and difficult. We went from visiting all of our schools and 101, 102 community meetings and town halls to more centralized directives because time was of the essence to execute closing schools, feeding Boston's children, and delivering 32,000 Chromebooks for remote learning. But it's the core value of mine to listen to the community, to get their feedback, their recommendations, even if we don't always agree. I respect and value all of our BPS staff, leaders, and their community voice. As your superintendent, I have to make hard decisions. Sometimes people will agree 
and we'll have broad consensus. And on others, we may have to work harder at that consensus. Healthy conflict is good for all of us, and it's, it, it's, it's good for the, for the hard and difficult work to occur. You have to face the brutal facts in order to move forward. I often call this leaning in. I'm willing and eager to listen, to learn, and to grow, as I know all of you are too. And I recommit to working to improve internal and external communications and collaboration. As some of you know, I've made it a priority to cultivate trust and to promote authentic collaboration to build a healthy organizational culture and strong relationships with our broader community. Trust is earned though, and it takes time. And I'm committed to this worthy work. Both are exemplified by our motto of JUICE and captured with our five-year strategic plan. This past winter, we started the training and hard work to improve workplace culture. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic and closure, we had to pause that work, but it's time to get back to this work this fall and in the spirit of Congressman Lewis to come together to build a beloved community within BPS. I hope all of you received your hard copy of the five-year strategic plan. It's a reminder of how proud we should all be of what we've accomplished this past year and the opportunity that we have right before us and over the next five years with the mayor's $100 million three-year commitment to improve outcomes for children and their families so that they thrive. Because we don't have to settle for just mitigating learning loss. We have an opportunity to create more opportunity and access. And like our new strategic mission directs to ensure every child gets what they need. And that's my superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you very much, Superintendent. I want to open it up once again to uh, my fellow members for uh, questions or comments before we move on to public comment. Are there any further comments? Dr. Coleman, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Mr. O'Neill. Working on all the technology. Well, thank you. The, uh, great, the breadth of issues you just covered represents how incredibly difficult job you've taken on and have. And I, and I want to state publicly and clearly my absolute support for the effort you're putting in and the work you're doing and your work at building this, as, as we would say, blessed community. And I want to thank you for that. Um, and as you, as you pointed out, the, we won't agree on everything. And some of the issues that face the city, there can be some sharp disagreements. And so the efforts to find ways to talk and find, uh, uh, Ms. Poos used the word, you know, find grace in the moment of, of conflict, I think is a great struggle. And the, our children, I think, will benefit greatly the more we can do that, have these strong disagreements and find ways to uh, uh, find a graceful consensus. And so there are issues with which we will disagree, but let's, moving forward for kids, I think, is something you've modeled and uh, great faith that you will continue to uh, support all of our efforts to do that. So, because it's a long time, I decided I have one idea I want to put on the table and looking forward to the ongoing conversation about it. And as part of the response to the um, um, headmaster's uh, uh, report and that I would like to encourage us and, I, and, I, and, I, and one of the things I want to be, I think is very important is to understand that part of this conversation is among the committee members as well as with you. So I know the way we structure it, it looks like we're just talking to you, but this is actually for all of us. And I would, I, I would like to encourage all of us to consider ways in which we can take on these issues, but the high school redesign and maybe um, we know this important and urgent and vital work but to do it well, I want to put on the table the idea that we extend some of our timelines. So one of the things that in the report that reflects my concerns is that we, the, the uh, Parthenon report about eighth grader, eighth grade re repeaters and kids not ready to go, to me is the big red flag and the big problem in our district. And I'm not sure some of the conversations I've stated before coming out of the uh, high school resign Get, get at that as critically as I think is important. So if we think about the next three years of really looking at high school redesign, taking on a really planful way, followed by another year design and a third year implementation. I wanna put that idea on the table. I know we don't have to agree on that now, but I would love to take more time on that. So when we get the 
final, when we get something really going, we have to really respond to our data. We have a broad consensus about what we're working on and how that I don't think we can get quickly. So but again, I wanna thank you for the work you do and the, the, the care you bring to the job and how well you represent us as a city and hold our hope in your heart. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chia. Superintendent, I just, uh, to, to uh, Dean Coleman's or Dr. Coleman's comments, I wanna say yes and, um, because I echo all that he said. And Superintendent, I wanna thank you for your deeply reflective comments at the end um, about the feedback you received this week from what is effectively the front lines of your management team, right? From heads of EECs to the elementary schools to the high schools to even our alternative ed heads of schools. Um, that is how um, your ideas come to life. And I know um, you have come here with uh, a goal of really transforming Boston Public Schools to provide educational opportunities for all of our students. And I know how that burns inside of you. Um, you're also learning that uh, we work best when we work together. And um, the collaboration and the buy-in takes time but if it ultimately pushes the district forward, um, that's a win for all of us. And I really heard the reflective nature of your comments. It could be very hard. Look, I'm Irish. I could get, I could get pretty angry when I get that feedback that um, may not be, or I'm Irish heritage, I should say. And I could get pretty angry when I get feedback that um, is pretty tough to hear. And I know how you have been reflecting on this. And I appreciate the heads of school sent out a, um, clarification comment to say the spirit of what they were trying to do. And I appreciate your reflective nature as well. I think when we're all working together in the same direction through collaboration and buy-in and not just listening, but truly hearing so that we get there together, that's how we improve things for our youth. And so thank you for your comments. Uh, they meant a lot to me and I'm sure uh, the school leaders out there um, and others who are watching it uh, will really have listened closely to your comments tonight. So thank you for them. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. We'll go to the vice chair now. Uh, thank you, chair. Um, I just wanted to, <clears throat> to uh, I'm probably gonna repeat some things, but I think it's important as a school committee, as a body to take some responsibility for this in terms of what we asked the superintendent to come and do in Boston. And one of the things that we put front and center was around community engagement and rebuilding trust with parents, with caretakers. And she has done a really great job with that. Um, I think that's a huge strength of hers. And I wanna thank her for that and recognize um, that. At the same time, you know, we also had a DESE review and we had a pandemic. So I think um, you know the uh, the next phase of the work really is around working directly with school leaders and working with central office. Um, and I know you know many things got in the way that are beyond any of our control, um, but I do encourage um, you know that that there be more collaboration and more teamwork going into year two. And um, I do, I do appreciate, um, you know, feedback. No, I don't necessarily want to see it in the globe. I don't think that's productive uh, at all. Um, but I do uh, look forward to us working together. We're, we're all in this together. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants our, our uh, children to do well in school and we want to have high performing schools. So I appreciate uh, the reflection and I just encourage that there be more dialogue, more conversation, but again, Time has not been on our side, so I look forward to the superintendent's second year to really go much deeper, again, with central office and with school leaders. Um, and I, again, do appreciate feedback from school leaders, but again, not, not in the globe, uh, but, but we do need to listen to them. They, they are the front line uh, and they, they know what's happening in schools. Um, so again, thank you, superintendent, for all the other pieces of work that we've asked you to do um, uh, on our behalf. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Before uh, we close out comments, I just want to make sure that we haven't missed any uh, members who uh, may have wanted to speak. Up. Ms. Robinson. Yeah, um, I just want to second with um, what Ms. Oliver Davila has said. Um, this has been an incredible year um, and can't thank you more for all that you've done. 
And even with what has just happened with the school leaders, I think one thing, it's been a wake up call to, uh, to everyone. I think the energy that the pandemic has brought and everybody has had to come to the table in more ways than one, even though things have been difficult, everybody's ready to work now. It is clear what we have to do, each and every one. Nobody is unclear about that work. How we move forward with better communication, with a better timeline of, you know, of giving us all some time. I mean, there's, there needs to be an, a moment to say, can we just take time out and get school open? All of these other issues will be here and are coming. And once we can get school open, then we can have work groups and others that can begin to get into the nitty gritty of all of these issues, all of which we all know. Um, this district has been in a lot of trouble for a long time. We're not gonna fix it in a year, but we've raised the awareness in a year and, and that's remarkable in itself. So, so thank you again for the incredible work you've done, um, for the wonderful reflection and the strength and the resolve to continue to lead us forward. We need it, thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Robinson, and um, thank you for your um, closing comments, uh, Superintendent. Um, I can't really say much more than uh, what my fellow members have said, but you know, we've, who would have thought we would have been here after a year with um, a uh, state review, um, a pandemic, and all the other uh, challenges that have uh, been laid at your feet. Um, and we brought you in, as, as you heard from uh, a number of us, um, with an ambitious in agenda. Um, there was a low point of trust in this district and you've uh, slowly begun to rebuild that um, with our, uh, our community uh, all across Boston. And um, we, uh, we've had a remarkable first year and we've got work to do. And um, I think we all know that. And, um, you know, this is, um, we're not in the um, performance review um, portion of um, our, uh, our meetings here yet, that's coming up. Um, but a, m a number of us have been engaging with you in those discussions. And so I think, you know, a lot of the feedback that we've heard from um, the school leaders, um, there's a, um, there are some common themes that we've heard. And I think it's um, important for us to take a step back um, as leaders of this district. And I take account for this just as much as uh, anyone else um, for, to take stock of the communications that we have both internally and externally. Um, so I, I'm glad that we're having this discussion. Um, as you said, change isn't easy. It's never easy. Um, and particularly in a crucible like we have right now. Um, and so we wanna have these conversations uh, continue. We wanna learn and grow from what our experiences are. And um, I certainly hear that in, in uh, your reflection over uh, the last week. Um, so I thank you for you know, taking the time to lift those comments up. Uh, to share with us what your thinking has been and, and what um, uh, what you've been hearing from uh, our our, our uh, colleagues uh, all across the district, and uh, we look forward to working uh, together uh, to to move this district forward and to serve our children. And I think I heard that in um, the follow up that um, our uh, our school leaders have shared with us uh, since um, since last Friday. Uh, I think these folks um, have all the same intentions in, in mind as you do and as we do as members uh, and as all of us do as, as community members uh, to support our students and, and to move forward. And so the key is for us to be able to continue to partner in that work. And, um, and uh, I know you're, um, you're going to take that, um, that job and that, and that task uh, very seriously as we move forward. And we can start after September 10th, right? <laughs> but there's plenty of work to do between now and then. So if there's nothing further, um, Superintendent, I, I don't know if you have any uh, closing comments, but if not, I'd like to ask uh, for a motion to receive your report. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again, Superintendent. Um, members, if you'll unmute, I'll ask for a motion to receive uh, the Superintendent's report as, as presented. So moved. So moved. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, sounds like a second from uh, Dr. Coleman. Ms. Uh, Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? 
Yes. Mr. Lacanto. Yes. The superintendent's report is approved unanimously. Well, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And before we move on to public comment, I just want to uh, make a quick note. Um, we didn't get to touch upon it in the uh, superintendent's report, but we will be touching upon it later on the um, uh, meeting this evening. Um, I understand a number of the uh, individuals that are signed up for public comment this evening uh, wish to speak about uh, the status of the exam schools uh, admissions process and uh, the item that we have on the agenda for uh, considering the new um, exam school um, test contract. Uh, so I just do want to note and I want to direct folks to uh, the materials that are on the website uh, that when we get to that uh, report, we will be talking about um, the plans for how to consider the admissions process uh, in school year 2021 for the exam school, um, for exam school admissions specifically. And um, the superintendent is going to talk a little bit about what the approach will be, but we want to acknowledge, of course, and we know the community has certainly raised this up over the last several weeks, uh, the effects that COVID and, um, and remote learning specifically has had on our um, students and uh, the admissions criteria that we normally take into account uh, for the exam school admission process. So I want to note that. I, I know that uh, a number of people want to speak about that tonight, but I want folks to understand that we have certainly heard that um, feedback and we uh, intend to talk about it when we get to the report somewhere around 1 a.m. this morning. All right, we'll move on now, uh, Ms. Sullivan, uh, to uh, public comment. Thank you, Mr. Lacanto. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to a later, excuse me, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subjects of later discussion by the committee. We have 31 speakers this evening, so in accordance with school committee policy, time will be reduced to two minutes per person. And I remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom, and please make sure that you are signed into Zoom with the same name you use to sign up for public comments. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Our first speaker this evening is Counselor Anissa Asabi George. Welcome, Counselor. Welcome, Counselor. I think I'm unmuted now. Welcome. Thank you. I've submitted a longer testimony for the record. Here are my most pressing concerns. BPS needs to create a connector system to bring our universal pre-K or UPK students into BPS. It is deeply concerning that this system has been delayed. I recognize and applaud the tremendous effort taken to prepare for next year. The BPS community is still frustrated about the lack of communication, transparency, and opportunities for real input into our reopening plan. Today's presentation is a good step forward, though concerns remain. I am pleased that families will be able to opt in to all virtual learning and opt out of bus transportation. I'd like to know how and when families will be able to make these decisions and if they'll be able to change their decision later in the school year. We need a system that nimbly keeps track of where families, which families and staff are in our school buildings and which ones are remote. Please immediately activate and better engage the school site councils. Add our school nurses and school-based mental health providers to those conversations. These councils and conversations can determine the school's reopening needs, create school-specific mitigation and response plans, and ensure that our COVID policies are actually implement, implementable in the classroom. We need to ensure this school year is as engaging as possible. Please also don't forget athletics and our other programs kids love. Hearing tonight about the split classrooms, I want to make sure that our teachers have more support. 
Simultaneous teaching in person and virtually seems like a really big ask, particularly because virtual learning was a mixed bag this spring for everyone involved. involved. I strongly urge you to work with the Boston Teachers Union to make sure this is even feasible. We have to be realistic about our teachers' capacity and not burn them out. Provide transportation support to families should they need to pick up a sick child and do not have a car. Otherwise, we risk further community spread via public transportation. Schools, schools without classroom walls, doors, ventilation systems, or windows that actually open should not physically reopen until measures are taken to improve the facilities. Please provide an early retirement package for our teachers and staff. Please continue and strengthen in the do no harm attendance and academic policy. This pandemic will continue to take a toll on our students, whether they are physically in our classrooms or not. We need to provide them with more opportunities for exploration, movement, play, self-expression, and social emotional learning at every age level. In closing, some of these problems would be minimized if we had high quality schools and facilities, but all of these problems could be addressed by more thoroughly if we had all hands on deck, as I know the superintendent wants, as well as a transparent school-based process to figure out how to ensure our students do not lose another school year. Thank you, um, Mrs. Superintendent and Mr. Chair. Thank you, Counselor. Um, our next speaker is Edith Bazile. And she'll be followed by a group of parents that include Audrey Martinez Gudapakum, Amanda Lukens, Arusha Hollister, Elsa Weehy, and Jackie DeLisi. Ms. Bazile. I appreciate the strong efforts that are made to close the opportunity gap, but let's be clear. BPS's opportunity gap is district inflicted. In reality, it's an education debt owed to black and brown students who for decades have been denied high quality education. If the mayor is serious about his statement that systemic racism is a health crisis, it is time to pay the education debt. We cannot be silent because our children pay the price. They pay the ultimate price when we are silent because silence is compliance. Nothing is above critique. Change must happen and we must tell the truth. The pandemic heightens the urgency for solid science and evidence-based strategies. Instead, BPS dismissed highly qualified academic directors and made several questionable appointments without search committees. Despite a unanimous OAG vote for a moratorium, a new entrance exam is proposed because BPS equates excellence with whiteness and perpetuates the myth that equity and excellence cannot coexist. The appointed school committee will not confront the exam school issue because the mayor won't let you. That should change in 2021. BPS has an outrageously expensive transportation system, but remains highly segregated with two academic tracks, one for white students, one for black and brown. Many of the lowest performing schools have the hardest working staff, but they are underfunded, under-resourced, understaffed, and often disrespected. Please be transparent, support teachers, 30 seconds. support school leaders, Give them the tools and resources to do the job. Stop shuffling them, firing them, making their jobs harder by gutting the academic department instead of creating better structures for these hardworking professionals. Lastly, please put health and safety first. Pull down the curtain of politics. Why not activate the Zoom chat box and allow input from participants in this meeting? It's time to have real representation and authentic engagement to address the crisis of systemic racism in BPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bazile. Um, our next speaker is Audrey Martinez Gudapakum. She'll be followed by Amanda Lukens. If you can virtually raise your hands, please. Thank you. Thank you. On June 19th, myself and five other BPS parents who are active in efforts to improve learning in several content areas sent the superintendent a strongly worded letter protesting the decision to eliminate central office content specialist positions in science, mathematics, history, and English language arts. Until now, we have not received an answer from the district. One of us is a social studies teacher, educator, and researcher, while the remainder of us work professionally as STEM educators and researchers. Some of us have worked for over a decade with schools, school districts around the US either developing or evaluating STEM education programs. Although we are not officially representing the opinion of any specific district committee, 
we are actively involved in supporting Boston Public Schools as members of the District English Learner Advisory Committee, the English Language Learner Task Force, and the Citywide Parent Council. Dear Dr. Casilius, as BPS parents who are educators and researchers in a wide variety of subjects, we are concerned about the recent science, math, history, and English language arts department leadership staff layoffs, which were announced in the Boston Globe on May 29th. We are concerned about the issue for the following reasons. Number one, the timing. The district cut these positions at a time when it should be focused on ensuring student safety and academic support during the COVID-19 pandemic. In a period when school leaders are challenged with supporting their teaching staff's ability to teach all children in an online learning environment, the cut to leadership who were key professional development resources is occurring at a very inopportune moment. This shifts the professional development burden onto already challenged school staff who will need time to be adequately prepared. I am now uh, allowing Amanda Lukens, a fellow parent, to continue reading this letter that we wrote. Thank you. We'll go on to Ms. Lukens. Thank you. Continuing the discussion from Audrey, our second point is that the lack of transparency and resultant loss of trust. What is the plan moving forward to ensure that despite decentralization of academic guidance and professional learning, every teacher will have equitable access to high quality support in these key disciplinary areas? Some sort of guidance is needed as administrators and teachers who lack efficacy in content areas are less likely to provide rigorous and consistent learning experiences for our students. BPS has not explained this decision in any recent newsletter or notification and needs to provide clarification so we can trust in the plan going forward. The third area we are concerned about is the implications of these cuts for equity. Budget cuts in recent years have led to reduction in support staff who provide critical teacher training and coaching and these cuts have been especially present in under-resourced schools. Compelling evidence demonstrates that ongoing academic professional development supports our teachers to implement effective pedagogical content knowledge and practices which engage all learners, especially those who have been historically excluded or who face barriers because of learning and communication differences. In order for teachers to implement cutting edge curricula, we must unlearn outdated methods of teaching that exclude students of color. The loss of the leadership in the social studies department is particularly concerning in this regard. STEM, history, and ELA knowledge and skills taught with an equity lens will be essential to ensure our children's future opportunities and success. And with that, I pass to Arusha Hollister for concluding remarks on this topic. Arusha Hollister. Yes. Um, these issues directly contradict the district's strategic plan commi commitments to one, amplifying voices by engaging parent voices in district level decision making, since there was no communication and involvement of parents in this decision. Two, accelerate learning by ensuring rigorous and consistent learning experiences. There is no clear structure on how each school will have the support and oversight needed to ensure rigorous and consistent instruction in the content areas. Three, cultivate trust. It is difficult for parents to trust the district when there is a lack of communication about these decisions and the plan moving forward that will ensure equitable, rigorous, and consistent learning. In conclusion, we ask that you, one, communicate immediately and directly with families about the elimination of these positions and the motivations behind this move. Two, ensure that the mechanisms are in place for creating equitable instruction across the district with a specific emphasis on clarifying professional development plans in the context of COVID-19. Three, strengthen mechanisms for involving parents and the community prior to making decisions that have such widespread implications for supporting teachers and STEM instruction across the district. Sincerely, Audrey Martinez Gudapakam, Winship Elementary School parent, Arusha Hollister, Curley Elementary School and Boston Latin Academy parent, 
Amanda Lukens, Charles Sumner Elementary School parent, Jackie Delisi, Boston Latin School and Boston Latin Academy parent, Roseanne Tung, parent of 2019 Fenway High School graduate, Elsa Weha, Dante Alighieri, Montessori School parent. And that concludes our letter. Thank you very much. Um, our next speakers will be Michael Heishman, followed by Robert Jenkins and Roseanne Lobato. You could please virtually raise your hands. Mr. Heishman? Hello. Hello. Uh, Mike Heishman, Dorchester, member of Boston Education Justice Alliance. Uh, thank you so much for that report about the reopening of schools. I'll say something about that very soon, but a couple quick things. Uh, I've been testifying for months now about the MOU with Desi. I want to thank you for the decision today. This is excellent news. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Two, we need safe schools. All police should be removed from all Boston schools. Reopening of schools. I endorse the proposal sent by the teachers union to Desi on July 13th and ask you to work closely with the union and other stakeholders. Schools should be open in different stages. All of our children and families have experienced serious challenges. Many of them have suffered trauma. The usual curriculum, test prep, and standardized tests should be shelved. Our planet has been traumatized. Our country has experienced high level of race and class oppression and also militant resistance, unprecedented in the lives of most residents in our city. We must take advantage of these teachable moments and transform our curriculum. School buildings should not be open until we have sufficient funds. Exam schools. Questions for the school committee and superintendents. Are you committed to creating the equitable school system? Do you seek minor improvements or transformative changes? Is your goal that there will be a small increase in the number of our African-American and Latinx children who will be admitted to our elite school? Our Boston Latin School represents our commitment to elitism and Eurocentric education. This is what we want our best and brightest children to do, to study Latin in a dead language for five or more years. I also think there's a relationship between our focus on our exam schools and so many underperforming and under-resourced schools. Mr. I urge you to abolish the exam schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. And if you could please email me a written copy of your remarks, I'll share those with the committee. Will do, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, our next speaker is Robert Jenkins. He'll be followed by Roseanne Lobato and Sharon Hinton. Mr. Jenkins? Yes, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's been a long year, Dr. Caselius. As you know, I was on one of the hiring teams and you did everything that you said you were gonna do. And then the pandemic hit. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're doing a great job, you and your team, all the way across the board. I'll be very brief. I am a SEAC member, Community Engagement Advisory Council. So I'm one of those that have access and listening and making help steer, you know, uh, I'm not going to say help steer the district, but listen to what the district wants to do. This has been the first time in a long time. Like, I want to concur with what everybody has said. The system has been, the BPS system needs work. It's not going to happen by, you know, uh, you know by, ma by a magic wand. We all have to work together. Uh, I like the progress, as you know, with uh, I'm on the transition team for the, looking for a Madison Park new headmaster. I've, I've looked at the plans. I'm, I'm very happy. But mo one mo most important thing, as you reopen these schools, safety is a key. You need to have some type of Boston police protection in the school, as recent with the recent violence that's been going on with teenagers have been killed. I've known two of the teenagers that have gotten killed in the past few weeks. So that safety plan, I know you hired a new safety chief. She's beautiful. She's a family friend. I know her personally. She's going to come in. Great choice. Some choices you have to make, you have to make the hard choices. You've made them. But we all have to work together. You know, that, that's, that's just the basic point right now. Uh, we need to get kids back into the school, but they have to be safe. 
I do have some concerns, basically, like everybody else. A lot of parents I talk to, but they have options. So that's a good thing. So they definitely have options. So again, I, I look forward to continue working with you, the district and the school committee, but it has to be everybody. The village has to raise a village and that's how it has to be. Again, how decisions have, have to be made, but it's how we work with them. So you all have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Our next speaker is Roseanne Lobato. Ms. Thank you, Bobby. Is Ms. Lobato with us? Okay. Uh, is Sharon Hinton with us? And she'll be followed by Andrew Dorsonville Jones and Benjamin Rockoff. Ms. Hinton? Yes. Good evening. I'm Sharon Hinton, president of Black Teachers Matter Incorporated an educator and a parent. The statement I'm reading is from the Boston Coalition for Education Equity, which is in opposition to any admissions process to Boston Selective High Schools for the entering class of 2021 that involves an exam or test. The following organizations have all signed on in solidarity with this statement. The NAACP Boston Branch, Lawyers for Civil Rights, Black Teachers Matter Incorporated, Boston Education Justice Alliance, Beja, Boston Network for Black Student Achievement, Citizens for Public Schools, Downtown Progressives, Healthy Food for Boston Schools Action Network, JP Progressives, Mi Gente, Progressive West Roxbury, Rosendale, Quest, and Showing Up for Racial Justice. The Boston Coalition for Education Equity calls on Mayor Walsh and the Boston School Committee to honor the unanimous recommendation of the School Committee's Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force and demands that the school committee vote to suspend the admissions policy and remove the testing requirement for the Boston Latin Academy, Boston Latin School, and the John D. O'Brien High School of Math and Science for the upcoming admissions cycle. The current admissions process for these three schools historically and consistently produces racially unjust outcomes. This is not a new conversation given the reports and recommendations from Lawyers for Civil Rights, the NAAC Boston branch, and other educational experts. The unprecedented action of the School Committee OAG Task Force calling for suspension of the test as part of the next admissions process and the subsequent outcry from thousands of residents and supporters demand that the School Committee take immediate action to revise the admissions policy and remove the testing requirement for this year, especially during COVID-19 crisis. We are still in a pandemic that disproportionately impacts Black, Latinx, and economically disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities. This crisis makes it even more imperative to suspend admissions testing this year, given the barriers many low-income students face in obtaining the academic support they need to fully access a high-quality public education. This exam has, not been, has been identified as structurally supporting racism and fails to meet the cause of a current anti-racist movement. We should absolutely eliminate the utilization of this academic admissions process, and by eliminating the test, the school committee will demonstrate to Boston parents, students, and educators that they will be intentional about providing equal access to a quality education for all and not just the elite. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hinton. Our next speaker is Andrew Dorsonville Jones. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones, are you with us? Okay, yes. Did welcome. you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello? Yes. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I heard with uh, detail uh, the BPS reopening plan for the next school year. And uh, for me, I think it has been, uh, uh, you guys have been doing a very good job in trying to work on such plan in such difficult time with the pandemic. So the, uh, the only thing I can say, we as a parent, as parents and teachers, we will have to work together for everything to be successful because uh, it will be a big, big, very big challenge for us. So uh, the question I have for you uh, regarding uh, student with disability they have uh, asthma issue autism etc etc et i would like to know what what are your plan 
for the student who cannot have the mask. If they can't wear the mask at all the time. So I don't know if you guys have a plan to figure out exactly which strategy to use. Because some of them they can they could want they could uh, they could not tolerate uh, the mask at a certain time because of health issue. So did you have anything in place in case or something like that, or work with the nurses to figure out exactly what to do? Thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. I'm sure the superintendent and Ms. Poost will uh, follow up on that question. Can I just say one thing about that without getting in because we can't answer all the questions or we might be here all night, but I do want to uh, encourage you to come to a community forum. So if people do have questions about the reopening plan that they can come to the community forum where we do answer those questions as best we can. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I understand that Roseanne Lobato is with us now, Ms. Lobato. Yes, hi, I'm here. I was here. You couldn't hear me. Welcome. Okay. So good evening now. I am Rosanna Lobato, the mother. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm the mother to Robert Spera Jr. My son attended the ABA program at the Brook High School. It's about the ABA program. Like our superintendent, Dr. Casillas, I believe in transparency. When BPS was closed the West Rectory Complex, we parents got a firm promise from the act superintendent regarding keeping our program intact alone, we should keep the same teachers on with the program. When our program moved to the Burke High School, Dr. McIntyre confirmed the promise made to us. Now, the promise seems to have turned in another direction. Dr. McIntyre Monica Roberts and Mr. Silva, the headmaster of the Burke High School, informed the parents that the teacher had been signed to one-year contract at the Burke High School. The one-year contract was not at all transparent to the parents. Also, it was not stated on the teacher's contract. We have been told that Mrs. Richmond and Mrs. Dykens have been accessed from our program which contradicted the school committee's promise. In a recent meeting, we requested the name of the people appointed to be part of the school hiring process. The Brook High School has de denied us that information. We parents do not have the right to know the name of people who were part of the school committee hiring process. Not having transparency in the school hiring process, make it clear that parents are dealing with lies. We have a big question. Does Mr. Silva indeed have more power in hiring decisions than the school committee does? If so, it should break the promise that was made to us parents by the school committee to keep the teachers in the ABA program as we requested. Why were you promise, made promise that the school committee never intend to keep it? We are imploring the school committee to honor its promise made to us. Please keep Mrs. Richmond and Mrs. Dyke in the ABA program at the Burke High School. We want our children to stay with the teachers that they have come to know very well and depend on. Our program relies on consistency from the bottom of your heart Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lobato. Our next speaker is uh, Benjamin Rockoff. He'll be followed by Laura Carroll and Lisa Green. Mr. Rockoff. Chairman Lacanto, School Committee and Superintendent Caselius. My name is Benjamin Rockoff. I'm the principal at the Ellison Park School, and I want to read a statement on behalf of school leaders in the K-8 Association. We, the K-8 Association, want to start by sharing some paraphrased words from Dr. Caselius. Doing the tough work requires disagreement and it will inevitably be uncomfortable. As school leaders, we are committed to doing this crucial and necessary work together with Dr. Caselius and the central office team. We are disheartened knowing that our well-intended efforts were manipulated for other purposes. We choose collaboration, trust, and camaraderie. It was certainly not the intent of our organization to, to share feedback publicly. We stand behind our individual statements and understand that there is much work to do in creating an anti-racist school district where all students receive a high quality education. 
We also acknowledge that the superintendent has inherited many of the systemic inequities that plague BPS and disproportionately impact our Black and Latinx students and families. Dr. Caselius has an incredibly arduous job, especially given the global pandemic and historic racism that per persists in our country and in BPS, as well as the biases that live within each of us. Our communication was in response to Dr. Caselius's invitation for feedback from school leaders. We fundamentally believe that feedback and productive disagreement pushes individuals, organizations, and the work forward. We, school leaders and superintendents, may not always get it right, but we should always be willing to listen, learn, make adjustments, and work together. That is what we are all trying to do here. As we move forward, all of us will continue to give our best, and we look forward to collaborating to plan through a lens of equity as we reopen. As school leaders, we are bonded in our efforts to navigate our context. We will not allow this moment to impair our collaborative plan to address, to, at, to address our challenges and reopen schools. Our hope is to listen, learn, and extend grace and compassion towards one another while acknowledging the messiness of the work. Dr. Caselius cares about all students and families. She leads the work that is deeply important to all of us. Are there challenges? Yes. Do we think we can and need to do better? Yes. As a collective, we are, we are committed to working together to address our areas of growth and expand and leverage our areas of success. Change will come through collaborative efforts with Dr. Caselius and her team. We are Team BPS. The superintendent has already courageously joined us in dialogue and shared her desire to continue to partner in the work with school leaders and co-construct solutions. As school leaders, we are committed to engaging in this work with Dr. Caselius to continue to focus on our students and better serve our BPS families and community. Sincerely, K-8 Association. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rockoff. Next, we'll hear from Laura Carroll. She'll be followed by Lisa Green and Nancy Lesson. If you could please raise your hands virtually. Ms. Carroll. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm speaking again on behalf of the Harbor Point Community Task Force. I've appeared before the committee before. Um, I'm giving these comments somewhat out of order because I understand, I've seen just recently the slides that were posted tonight and I understand the McCormick field called the Columbia Point parcel is later on the agenda. Um, I sent over a letter uh, earlier today on behalf of Harbor Point, which I understand has been distributed um, by Ms. Sullivan, so I won't uh, repeat those points here given the shortness of time. I will say though, uh, looking at the slides of the later presentation, I really feel that this is being handled out of order. If you look at the slides, they're talking about um, uh, decisions that were made back when the McCormick School was a middle school. There's a lot of talk about all the community meetings. That's when the McCormick School was still going to be a middle school. There's talk about supporting the Boys and Girls Club building this facility that the Dever and McCormick will use, assuming those are all little kids. We now know, and it was announced uh, by the superintendent, that the McCormick is being converted to a grade 7 to 12 school. Uh, the local community, Harbor Point, is thrilled with that. Um, you've hired a great headmaster, Will Smith, who I know from Charlestown to where I live, uh, to oversee that, and he's a wonderful choice. But to say we're going to give away land belonging to BPS to build something for young kids at the same time you're talking about tripling the size of the student body and bringing in teenagers makes no sense. And I really urge you to put a halt on that till the plans for the new McCormick 7 to 12 school are established. You know what footprint it wants. You know what it needs for athletic facilities before you do this giveaway to the Boys and Girls Club. I recognize there's, it's a very political hot potato and I appreciate that but I really urge you to hold on this until the McCormick plans are complete. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Green. Ms. Green with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, my name is Lisa Green. I'm a parent with two kids in BPS and a member of the Boston Coalition for Education Equity. 
I'm here to read the remainder of the BCE statement um, that Sharon Hinton started in opposition to any process for admissions to Boston Selective High Schools for 2021 that involves a test. Full text of our statement is available on our website at bossedequity.org. Years of research has demonstrated that the current admissions process for BLA, BLS, and the O'Brien schools already produces racially unjust outcomes. We are now in a pandemic that disproportionately impacts Black and Latinx students. Mayor Walsh has declared racism a public health crisis in the city of Boston. This crisis makes it imperative that the school committee vote to suspend admissions testing this year, given the barriers that many low-income students face to obtaining the academic support they need to fully access a high-quality public education during the pandemic. Racial equity should be the top priority in deciding any interim process during this crisis. Even our nation's most elite colleges and universities have suspended the use of tests for admissions for the upcoming year. Moving forward with an admissions policy that includes a test now will only perpetuate structural racism. This moment of widespread and deepening inequity demands the school committee disrupt the status quo and act to implement an explicitly anti-racist admissions process, one that does not include a test. You can visit our website at bossedequity.org to read our full statement and find links to the NAACP's petition and other information about this critical issue. I also want to note that in the information that you shared tonight, you referenced some old materials from Lawyers for Civil Rights and the NAACP. Uh, it was in the equity impact statement that you shared and it was dated today. As someone who attended the community meetings and read those recommendations, cherry picking the sentence out of context that seems to support simply swapping in another test when it was basically a footnote in a set of recommendations that prioritize significant overhaul to the system feels a bit misleading. It also feels a bit misleading to reference outdated recommendations from these orgs instead of their current ones. I can tweet you links after to their latest statements that explicitly call for there to be no test offered this year. I'll also make sure we upload that information to our website. Thank you. Ms. Green. Uh, our next speakers are Nancy Lesson, followed by uh, Jessica Taharaj and Eden Davies. Could you please virtually raise your hand? Ms. Lesson. My name is Nancy Lesson. I'm a retired occupational health specialist. I formerly worked at the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health, Massachusetts AFL-CIO, and the United Steelworkers. My daughter is a BPS high school teacher, and I have four grandchildren who are BPS elementary school students. There are many issues to consider regarding opening schools. This is one of them, airborne aerosol transmission of coronavirus, which has been getting some well-deserved recent attention. Microparticles of virus are released in the air when an infected person sneezes, coughs, sings, talks, and breathes. They escape cloth face coverings, can stay suspended in the air for long periods, and float for long distances. This even happens before an infected person shows symptoms, also if they never have symptoms, which may be 40% or more of infected people. Young children can get very sick with this virus and children 10 and older can transmit the virus at least as well as adults. One way to protect students, teachers, and staff from airborne transmission is to have them all wear N95 respirators. That's not gonna happen. There's another way, have well-functioning ventilation systems in all schools, bringing in fresh air, having the proper number of air exchanges, having filtering systems appropriate for this virus called MERV 13 or higher, and possibly room air cleaners. In 2017, a survey of the BPS built environment found poor or deficient ventilation in 69% of elementary schools, 61% of K through eight, 71% of middle schools, and 44% of high schools. My question is when, how, and with what funding will the ventilation systems in BPS be upgraded so that schools won't be death traps for those occupying the buildings? And I wanna note that the CDC guidelines for schools when written did not focus on protecting school occupants from airborne or aerosol transmission. You need to do better, follow the most recent science. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lesson. Our next speaker is Jessica Daharaj, followed by Eden Davies and Matthew Ruggiero. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Tahara, and I have two students at Joyce Kilmer, 
in West, West Roxbury. Um, and I, my, I also have, um, my son is on an IEP. Um, he has autism and my daughter's on a 504. Um, so my, my biggest concerns, and I'm in the healthcare field, so I, I understand the risks and outweigh the positive. I do believe that a lot of these school kids need to go back to school. But also, I want to recognize this, the dispar disparities in the classroom, in all the classrooms, because I have seen a lot of the schools. There are no air conditionings. And to wear a mask, and I'm a healthcare worker, I have to go in houses that have no air conditioning and no ventilation systems. And to be a child with a disability, to have to wear a mask when the classroom can get up to 90 to 100 degrees when it's hot. And in the winter, there's the, the heating systems have no therm working thermostats. And also the heating systems make the classrooms vote 90 to 100 degrees as well. How, and there's no ventilate, good ventilation system. How, 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 how haven't you addressed this when all our schools been closed, um, these disparities? And why are you guys waiting now to address this when there was really not enough time to fix these systems. I know that when Brenda Castillos went and visited all the class, all the classrooms, I know one on one of her major things on her agenda was fixing our cooling and heating systems in these schools that are over 100 years old. Um, I mean, I guess that's my biggest concern is that our kids are comfortable in the classroom, even though you guys are gonna have them socially, socially distanced but wearing a mask in a 90 to 100 degree classroom is just not realistic. And, and like I said, I am 100% for the kids to go back to school because I think that they need this for themselves. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eden Davies, followed by Matthew Ribeiro and Ruby Reyes. Davies? Hi, good evening. My name is Dr. Eden Davies, and I have degrees in school psychology and child psychology. And tonight I'm speaking to advocate for educational reform to improve access for the children in Charlestown. So I was asked to share our daughter's K-1 lottery assignments for the elementary schools in Charlestown. And she placed 59th at Warren Prescott, 37th at Harvard Kent, and 100th at the Elliott School. And now, unfortunately, our daughter did not place anywhere near the top of the wait list and was placed across town in the South End. And even before COVID, you know, I could not imagine putting my four-year-old on a bus all the way while my husband and I, you know, try to be active participants in her school. So I, I understand the intention for the lottery system and for educationally enriching all of the Boston communities. However, when kids cannot attend any of their local schools, you know, aside from the commuting and safety issues, you know, it really decreases parental involvement and support and it weakens local social networks, you know, if a child's friends are not nearby. And unfortunately, a lack of access to quality local education is a contributing factor that has forced our family to relocate after six years of calling Charlestown our home. So had our, had our child placed in a Charlestown school, you know, there's no question we would have stayed. So I hope you consider the larger effect that this has on our great city if it can't provide quality public education for all students. And I hope that this petition serves to correct the system for future Charlestown families. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Davies. Our next speaker is Matthew Ruggiero. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Um, hi, my name is Matthew Ruggiero. I'm a teacher at Charlestown High School in our SEI unit. Um, I work in a classroom that doesn't have a window, which is, uh, I think, fairly common within our building. Um, I had some prepared remarks, which I'm going to try to get to, but I'm honestly a little in shock with kind of a lot of the information that I've heard tonight. And I'm deeply concerned that we are at the point of a working draft that we're working from that feels really removed from the experiences of um, people who are who work in and experience school buildings. Um, so I hope that that's something that uh, we can learn from and go forward in a better way. Um, but I wanted to speak, uh, I'm a teacher at Charleston High School. Um, I was previously a teacher at the Dearborn. I'm a graduate of ACC and the Mission Hill School. Um, when I was an AmeriCorps member, I worked at the Joseph Lee and I did my student teaching at the McCormick Middle School. 
Um, every one of those schools is an open enrollment school and all but one of them has been designated this year as a transformation or turnaround school. Uh, in fact, every one of the 33 schools that the district identified as in need in, of transformation based on test scores and the state accountability system has a non-selective admissions policy. And I want to say that fact actually tells us very little about the strengths of the students in the, each of these schools and the work that goes on inside them. Um, but it does say a lot about how our school system values and supports those students and the debt that's owed to them. Um, Boston has maintained a system that encourages the clustering of the best test taking and highest academically performing students into a small selection of schools. Um, these schools are designed to be highly enrolled, better funded relative to their student needs to be able to offer more opportunities to students and then higher ranked by the same test taking policy or by the same test taking performance system. Um, by the same policy, the, same, the remaining schools, the majority of schools in Boston are more likely to be under enrolled, to be underfunded, and then related as, and then rated as underperforming by the state system. This is a natural consequence of the system that Boston has constructed, not any characteristics of the schools themselves. Um, it's another consequence of the system and the policies that we then disinvest in, disempower and close schools that predominantly serve black and brown communities and have programs dedicated to students with disabilities, slight students and students learning English. There are really, really, really real ways that all of our schools need to improve and there are ways that our system must be transformed. We have to ensure that every student has access to culturally responsive pedagogy and curriculum. We have to make sure that every school is well-funded to be able to provide art and music and electives and inclusion. And we must ensure that every school community, community is empowered to use the shared decision-making governing model guaranteed by state and city law. In a moment when there is so much uncertainty about what schools will look like in the fall, I ask that you heed the call from the NAACP and the Opportunity Gaps Task Force um, to pause the exam school policy, but I also ask the school committee to direct the superintendent and the school department to examine the systemic ways that as much transform its policies, not just for access to some schools, but equity for students at all schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reguero. Uh, our next speaker is Ruby Reyes. She'll be followed by um, Jake, Resiteritz and Ayeli Shakur. If you could virtually raise your hands, please. Ms. Reyes? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. My name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the director of the Boston Education Alliance. Thank you for the updates and sharing the process. By now an analysis exists as to how many students each school could accommodate at six feet of social distancing. By now you've assessed how many students in each school are coming from special populations outlined in the draft including students with disabilities, students from zip codes with high COVID numbers, broken down by race and ethnicity. You know what facility upgrades will happen in each building and which ones will not. Now, share this specific information with parents, students, and educators broken down by school. The guardrails that are being shared with principals need to be shared with school communities. Families need to weigh in on the reality of their school's needs and take part in the decision-making around those guardrails. By now, establish and support a school-based stakeholder team that can hold decision-making power at the school level. School communities can give input on these decisions rather than giving general input on information they don't have. What's more is online learning and in-person learning are two very different things. It's unrealistic to ask educators to teach online and in-person at the same time. It's unfair to expect students to learn in this way as well. Professional development is greatly needed for distance learning before an expectation can be had to provide both in-person and online. Beja also asks that you develop a budget that shows what it would take so that each student has access to a quality education, which includes these additional expenses. What will it realistically take, both financially and facilities-wise, to reopen? Even with the mayor's investment, this year, this will not be enough resources to cover the immense undertaking of reopening schools from COVID. Funds and time should be focused on reopening, not on proposals like the McCormick School, which needs to be put on hold till there is a community process that includes the McCormick BCLA planning team, or at the very least until a feasibility study is done for all of the land. This should not even be on the school committee agenda right now with respect to the pandemic and what families are dealing with. Beja also supports the recommendations by the OAG task force to suspend exam school testing for a year. We also support the suspension of MCAS testing permanently. The failures of testing and how they hurt low income people of color are more evident now than ever. If we don't need it for a year, we don't need it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. 
Our next speaker is Jake Resiteritz, followed by Ayeli Shakur and Shanae Franklin. It, did Hello. that work? Hey, great. Sorry. Um, good evening, Superintendent Caselius and members of the school committee. My name is Jake Resiteritz, and I work at Educators for Excellence Boston, where we work to elevate educators' voices and empower them to lead on issues that impact their classroom and their students. Over the past few weeks, we've been engaging educators on their perspectives about the format that learning will take this fall. Instead, I wanted to share some of what we've heard. Uh, first and foremost, educators are adamant that safety needs need to be guaranteed long before in-person education is ever discussed. Educators shared that, here, I'm gonna read a few quotes. Um, there has to be a way to make sure that students and staff can get tested semi-regularly before being on a school bus and or in a school building. Uh, another quote, we don't have enough money or for adequate PPP. Um, we are not prepared for reopening and that can go so wrong. I am immunocompromised and feel like a guinea pig. Uh, we need more time and we are not yet prepared. Um, maybe we will be in January for in-person learning. Um, the district's proposed hybrid model announced tonight, the hopscotch model can only be successfully implemented uh, if it's clear that it can be done safe, uh, safely so that you know, we, people feel uh, reassured. Um, they prefer to start the year with fully remote learning followed by an evidence uh, based slow build to hybrid. Um, they agree with you and not fully supporting an in-person model. Um, I, this is very long and I will send the rest to you because I don't want to go over my time, um, but just as you continue to weigh the factors in making this decision, uh, our educators stand ready to discuss and work with you to provide that perspective. Uh, I applaud your effort to, coll to collect family and staff responses from surveys uh, and I urge you to continue speaking with as many educators and community members as you can before coming to a final decision. Uh, thank you for everything you do and for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ayeli Shakur, followed by Shanae Franklin and Stephanie Rodriguez Ruiz. Ms. Shakur. Ms. Shakur. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Okay, all right, excellent, thank you. Um, good evening, I'm reading an excerpt from a longer statement written by me and school committee member, Dr. Hardin Coleman, who serves with me on the Opportunity and Achievement Gaps Task Force, where I am co-chair along with school committee member, Jerry Robinson. But first, I wanna start by recognizing that in addition to Congressman John Lewis, we also recently lost one of our local civil rights heroes, George Cox, who passed away last month. George was steadfast in his commitment to our students and was also instrumental in advocating for the creation of the Opportunity and Achievement Gaps Policy Plan and Task Force. So George would have been as concerned as I am at the issue of exam schools admissions when we just spent the first 90 minutes of today's meeting discussing how nothing would be normal this school year during COVID. On June 30th, the task force, which is a subcommittee of the Boston School Committee, took a unanimous vote on the following resolution. Quote, with respect to exam school admissions, the Opportunity and Achievement Gaps Task Force recommends that the district suspends the adoption of a new testing agency and the administration of a new test for the coming year due to COVID and urges the district to move forward with haste with creating more equitable admission standards, end quote. For decades, we have seen the data and read reports that access to the exam schools in this city is inequitable by race and by class, as evidenced in a 2018 Harvard Kennedy School report. Given the disruption in learning and lifestyle as a result of COVID, any test will further discriminate against our most vulnerable students. As Lawyers for Civil Rights stated, it is unfair to subject students with vastly unequal access to the internet and devices while struggling with food and housing insecurity to an entrance exam that will determine their educational future. Boston NAACP called the admissions process the definition of racial injustice and issued a petition with over 2,000 signers. For years, we have had a number of recommendations aligned with state and federal law that would yield a high-performing student body reflective of the district's diverse student population. The convergence of a pandemic coupled with a heightened awareness of racial injustice makes this an unprecedented time to do the right thing. 
This issue is now in the hands of the Boston School Committee. Racism is ugly and change is never easy. It's time to make the tough decisions that bring about the change our city needs and our young people deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shakur. Our next speaker is Shanae Franklin, followed by Stephanie Rodriguez Ruiz and Jose Lopez. Ms. Franklin? Ms. Franklin with us? Okay, is Ms. Rodriguez Ruiz with us? Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Stephanie Rodriguez Ruiz, and I represent the Charter School Subcommittee of the Education Law Task Force, a statewide coalition of attorneys, advocates, and educators. Tonight, we update our biggest concerns involving Up Academy Boston's disciplinary policies and punitive cultural management system. We request that BPS certify UAB's charter renewal application only if UAB commits to changing its harmful practices. Even if UAB does commit to making these changes, we ask the district to recommend that DESE renew UAB's charter only with conditions. In our July 9th letter to this committee, we highlighted our concerns regarding UAB's disciplinary policies, leading to higher than average suspension rates, attrition rates, and disproportionately impacting students with disabilities and black students. One of our gravest concerns involved their compliance-based management system, which does not align with the school's commitment to provide a safe, supportive, culturally responsive, and welcoming school climate for its students. We maintain that frequent demerits, referrals to the DOSO, repeated detentions, and suspensions promote a system focused on penalizing purported negative behavior, as opposed to fostering and rewarding positive behavior, all of which mirror our criminal justice system. In our letter, we recommended that BPS require UAB align its handbook with the BPS Code of Conduct, commit to changing their cultural management system, and commit to creating systems by which staff are appropriately trained and supported. UAB's changes to its handbook for the upcoming school year are appreciated, but still fall short from aligning with the BPS Code of Conduct and contain policies that are inconsistent with state law. The new handbook does not reflect a commitment to changing the cultural management systems and makes only a slight reference to staff training. We emphasize our continued objection to UAB's harmful disciplinary practices and cultural management system and maintain our request that BPS certify UAB's renewal for certification only if they commit to making the necessary changes outlined in both our July 9th letter to this committee and the, committee, and the letter sent to the committee today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next Ms. Rodriguez uh, uh, Ruiz, uh, excuse me, Ms. Sullivan, I just did want to take a moment to thank uh, you and your colleagues for um, providing the feedback on uh, Up Academy's uh, application. And when we move to that point of the uh, meeting, I do want to ask um, our uh, legal counsel to uh, just give us a brief update on um, some of the items that you've highlighted for us. So thank you. Thank you. That's appreciated. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Lopez. He'll be followed by Roxy Harvey, Amanda Nealon, and Linda Freeman. If you could please raise your hands virtually. Mr. Lopez. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Great, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. My name is Jose Lopez, and I'm the Chair of the Education Committee of the Historic Boston Branch of the NAACP. As we prepare to enter into this district's 373rd year of teaching Boston's children, you are faced with determining how the district will admit students to its most coveted schools during a continuing pandemic. We ask that you consider that a test is not necessary to achieve your goals and address our shared concerns. After years of research and dialogue with communities across the city, we've published alternative admission processes that should be considered because they rely on proven factors that are fair and equitable, maintain high academic achievement, and critically important today in the ongoing wake of COVID-19 are safe. The use of a test in admissions is a very recent trend in Boston. For example, 327 of its 385 years of existence, the Boston Latin School did not use a test to award admission. For 85% of its admission cycles, the Boston Latin School relied on an alternative admission process, grades and recommendations. 
If you wonder whether a test free admissions process could still ensure high academic achievement, consider the record. Without a test, BLS awarded admission to statesmen like Samuel Adams, John Bates, inventors like Benjamin Franklin, artists like Vivian Rich, Civil War heroes like Charles Francis Adams Jr. and James Barnes, the architect of this nation's Capitol building, Charles Bullfinch, Ralph Waldo Emerson, astronomer Benjamin Gold, the nation's first black judge on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and black solicitor General Wade McCree Jr., the first African-American university president, and chairman of a Fortune 100 corporation, Clifton Reginald Wharton Jr., and countless others who have contributed in remarkable and undeniable ways to this city and nation. All of these individuals were reviewed, considered, and ultimately admitted to Boston Latin School without a test. These students were admitted based on a review of their academic record and recommendations from their educators who were trusted to select students who could perform at the highest levels and endure extreme academic rigor. Use of a test in the admissions process in Boston has proven to have a negative disparate impact on high achieving Black and Latinx applicants as identified in the Rappaport study. There are many alternative admissions processes that are proven effective and do not have a disparate impact on Black and Latinx students. Each alternative presents a fair, equitable, and most important now, safe admissions process. In conclusion, in the interest of justice and in consideration of the list of achievements of Boston alumni whose admission required no test, the disparate impact on high achieving Black and Latinx students, the Boston branch of the NAACP requests that the school committee honor the courageous recommendation of the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force and accept and review the alternative admissions processes provided in our report, A Broken Mirror, as well as a petition signed by over 3,000 individuals calling for the suspension of a test. These two documents I ask would be entered into the record and if accepted, I could send to uh, Madam Secretary. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Um, our next speaker is Roxy Harvey, followed by Amanda Nealon and Linda Freeman. Ms. Harvey? Thank you. My name is Roxy Harvey and I'm the chair of Special Education Parent Advisory Council. I'm here today to highlight the needs of some special education students that require in-person extended school year services due to their significant disabilities as outlined in the individual education programs and highlight the need for genuine two-way open communication during these listening sessions. We have students in our district that have not been able to access learning opportunities since the March 18th school closure. SpendPAC is receiving emails and calls from families who talk about how their families are suffering and how they're unable to get their child to sit in front of a screen for even 30 minutes, never mind pay attention to what is actually occurring on the screen. We ask that BPS follow DESI's guidelines to make every effort to maintain in-person instruction for students with disabilities. As such, it is disheartening to know that we are in week three of remote ESY and BPS is now trying to get a three question survey to all ESY families to find out if they would be willing to send their child with a disability to in-person ESY, which could even occur outside. It is not surprising that over 200 families said yes, but what is disappointing is that not all ESY families have received this survey as of today. We are as BPS to make a good faith effort to provide in-person ESY services for our most vulnerable students that we have advised to prepare for for months. There just is no excuse to deny these children the support they need. We value the family choice and know that some students with disability are able to access remote learning. But we ask that, especially as we're moving into this fall planning, that we do not forget those students who learn using hand over hand modalities and need in person learning while you plan for fall reopening. Our families should have a choice about what is best for their children. We want to be part of the reopening planning. However, the community meetings that don't share the options for fall until the day of the meeting are difficult to contribute to. Our families would be based, able to give their input and share what they really feel if we could also get this information in advance and be able to view it to give feedback that can be shared and valuable to everyone. And we just want to thank Dr. Caselius for her recommitment to our children and families and BPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Our next speaker is Amanda Nealon. Ms. Nealon. Ms. Nealon, are you with us? We'll move on to Linda Freeman. Ms. Freeman? 
Good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to um, address certain issues. I'm a Boston uh, SPEDPAC parent and also a member at large. Um, the issues here are I would like to see um, all our students uh, open, go back to school open for September 10th, mainly because some of our students who need the M7 card, the S card, and the Chromebooks to students who do not have access to digital device that are coming into BPS. The other thing is I realize that this opening is also contingent on a 0%, less than 10% positive new cases and new deaths. And as um, Ms. Roxy Harvey indicated, our students with disabilities and ELL students do need in-person. Not everything can be done virtually. Um, this is also a heavy weight on parents who need to work and we don't need any more additional homeless families. Please take these all into consideration. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Um, our final speakers are Peter Sullivan and Shakita Barty. Mr. Sullivan? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Sullivan and I am a longtime and current teacher at Boston Latin School a former Boston Latin School student and a Jamaica Plain High School graduate. Recent events have highlighted again that structural racism and its related injustices cannot stand. And this applies to our own city, our own schools, and particularly to the exam school admissions. For too long, BPS has rationalized or ignored an admission process that perpetuates a two-tiered education system in Boston and systematically keeps qualified students of color out of Boston Latin and other exam schools. Given the renewed interest in finally listening to the better angels of our nature, the time is now for a brave confrontation with Boston schools, racist past and complicit present. If the Boston School Committee feels it must go against the recommendation of its task force and use a new admissions exam as a short term solution, I ask that going forward, you commit to a serious reconsideration and overhaul of an admissions process that has knowingly and unfairly left behind many children of color in our city. Even if the new test is putatively fair, any admissions policy that does not confront the advantages of private test prep and the chicanery of inflated grades will only perpetuate the status quo. If the school committee truly wants Boston to come to terms with its racist history and begin to finally heal, they must make it so the best and the brightest young people of all races can come together in the intellectual forge of the exam schools and help create a city we can all be proud of. Whatever your decision this year, I implore the school committee to honestly and rigorously search out an admissions process that makes the class entering in the fall of 2021 more accurately reflect the rich diversity and talent in every Boston neighborhood and school. The hour is late, and at some point, complacency becomes complicity. As the Romans put it, fiat justitia ruat caelum. Let there be justice or may the heavens fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker is Shakita Barty. Ms. Barty? Hi. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I'm Shakita Barty, a parent, teacher, and graduate of BPS. Today, I'm here most importantly as a parent and an advocate for my black and brown children and students. We have heard a lot today about reopening and equity work. And while COVID has amplified the um, inequity we see in BPS, this is an issue that far predates COVID especially for students of color. I'm here to say that as a community, we need mandatory anti-racist professional development for staff um, that does not fall on like teachers to facilitate. We can't talk about making things equitable if we can't commit to being truly anti-racist. This work should not at all be optional. 
That's all. Thank you for those comments. Ms. Sullivan, do we have any further uh, speakers for this evening? No, that concludes our speakers for public comment. Very good. Uh, thank you once again, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you to everyone who joined us for public comment tonight. Uh, we appreciate you giving voice to uh, the numerous issues that are confronting our district right now. And um, we look forward to um, continuing uh, these conversations. We're gonna move on now to our uh, action items. Our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $436,029. I'll open it up now to questions and comments from the committee. Yeah. Well, looking around, it doesn't look like there are any uh, questions or comments from the committee. I will note uh, just a brief, um, a, a brief note of thanks uh, specifically to um, the uh, Boston Athletic Association for their uh, large donation of uh, athletic equipment uh, for the uh, sports programs all across our district. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And um, particularly in this year, uh, we, might not, we might be delayed a bit in using them ourselves, but uh, particularly in this year, where uh, we can enjoy the, uh, the marathon in Boston. Uh, we uh, appreciate uh, the BAA um, using uh, their funds to support our, uh, our school children all across the city. So if there's no further questions, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the grants as uh, presented. So moved. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. Sounds like a second from Ms. Robinson. Uh, any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. Our next action items are a series of votes that include a charter renewal application for up Academy Boston and a series of related charter amendments for both Up Academy Boston and Up Academy Dorchester. You will recall that at our last meeting, the Up Education Network CEO, Ms. Veronica Conforme, who is joining us this evening, uh, as well as Up Academy Boston Principal Rashida Lawson, presented, I believe Ms. Lawson's also here, um, presented their charter uh, renewal and charter amendment request to the committee. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to any final questions or comments from the committee. And any members that would like to uh, speak, um, please um, raise your hands and I'll uh, recognize. Looks like we'll start with Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I think you uh, made a reference to this earlier, but um, an issue we discussed last time, and thank you to uh, Ms. Conforte, uh, Conforme, excuse me, the CEO and uh, Headmaster Loss, or Head of School Loss, and for uh, joining us. Um, I think we had a pretty robust discussion last time I was intrigued by the superintendent's uh, memo to us that she is recommending approval, but plan to ask um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to have conditions to the approval. And so where does that stand? Um, are we allowed to recommend that under the DESE rules? Are we allowed to recommend that condition as well? I think you mentioned having our legal counsel do it or failing that, can we certainly, I assume superintendent, you'd give us assurances that in forwarding it, you would be asking for those conditions as well. All right, well, Ms. Ms. Lizette, Ms. Lizette can speak to the particulars of it, but my understanding is that you get to do an up or down vote, but then you can make recommendations, which may be a separate vote. Uh, Kathy, can you speak to that exactly for the procedural way to do that? Sure, thank you very much. Um, we've been in contact with DESI and their preference is to have the committee um, vote either to approve or not approve, and then to separately submit a memorandum or a letter setting forth um, the district's recommendations in terms of conditions. Okay. So that would so be Mr. the Mr. O'Neill, uh, and thank you, Ms. Lazad, and thank you, Superintendent. Mr. O'Neill, to answer your question, I, I, what we've scheduled tonight is a vote on uh, the charter and the related amendments. Um, and if those, uh, if we vote in favor of what the recommendation is from the superintendent, the superintendent will forward along her memorandum that she's provided to the committee um, summarizing her recommendation, which includes the recommendation on those conditions to uh, the Board of Elementary and Second Secondary Education for review. Thank you. I, I do know 
I do note the fairly new leadership um, at Up Academy, and they have been long-term partners. They have worked with us with some of the issues that we've traditionally raised, and I do see tremendous forward progress in the low suspension rate, um, the uh, close to adherence to the code of conduct. But as we have said with all of our other partners who are running schools, our pilot schools, our renovation schools, we're trying to get all to conform to our code of conduct um, 100%. So it's consistent for all of our students across the board and expectations are clear. And so um, I, I do support the renewal of the charter, but very much with the conditions attached. If the best way to do it is with the superintendent is following the superintendent's recommendations, then I'm fine with that. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill. Um, on that note as well, I want to thank um, specifically uh, the, uh, the leadership at UP Academy. Uh, for working with uh, both the district as well as some of the um, feedback that they received from the community um, directly and through the, uh, the district. And I, I cite uh, one of the uh, public commenters a little bit earlier who is a representative of the Education Law Task Force who has uh, provided a wealth of feedback on um, the UP Academy's uh, charter um, amendment and renewal documents uh, for our review. And uh, that group, of course, is placing uh, primacy on um, the adoption of a code of conduct uh, at the UP Academy schools uh, that, is a, uh, that replicates uh, the um, progressive code of conduct that we have in the Boston Public Schools. And um, my understanding is from uh, the review that our legal counsel has done, and Ms. Lazad, I'll ask you to join us once again for just a moment. <clears throat> you, can, um, you can remind us that um, the review that the district has undertaken of the proposed code of conduct uh, for the UP Academy schools is cons substantially consistent with the uh, Boston Public Schools code of conduct. Um, so I wanna hand it over to Ms. Lazat uh, if she's with us, um, just to walk us through a little bit of that feedback that we received earlier today um, and hopefully address some of these outstanding questions. And <clears throat> pardon me for losing my voice. Sure, um, that's correct. So um, our goal with uh, our work with UP over the past few months has been to achieve substantial alignment with our code, um, particularly in the areas of exclusions uh, in the younger grades and due process protections for suspensions. Um, and we've achieved that. UP has substantially revised their, co their code to um, align with the district in those areas. We've, um, we actually met today um, with UP to go over the specific points in the um, one of the letters that UP received today from the community and um, UP agrees that there are certain changes that need to be made to align with uh, state law and they're willing to do that and um, we've committed to meeting with them to um, make those changes before the beginning of the next school year. So we're going to continue the work with them um, to do that. Um, uh, um, however, uh, even with those changes, um, we feel comfortable saying that we are in substantial alignment. Thank you, Ms. Lazad, and thank you for that additional uh, context. Um, I want to uh, move back to the, uh, the committee to see if there are further questions or comments before we move into the votes. Okay, uh, hearing none, um, we, uh, as I mentioned, I, I I might have counted wrong. We either have eight or nine votes to get through. So I'll ask for a little bit of patience from uh, our um, members of the public that are watching. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll ask our members to all unmute themselves uh, and we will go through our, our votes very quickly. Uh, if there's nothing, uh, so I'll entertain first a motion to approve the Horace Mann Charter School Renewal application for UP Academy Boston for the periods 2021 through 2026 as presented. So moved. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Oliver Davila. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Uh, Ms. Uh, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Excuse me. Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 
Very good. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. I'll now entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Boston Public Schools and Up Academy Boston covering the period from July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021 as presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Oliver Davila. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? <coughs> Mr. Tran? Uh, yes. Thank you. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Now moving on to our third motion, I'll entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding. Be I'm sorry, I just, did I just do this one? Yes. <laughs> no, I didn't. The memorandum of understanding. There's an, there, oh, there's another one. <laughs> uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Boston Public Schools and Up Academy Dorchester covering the period from July 1, 2020 through June 20th, excuse me, June 30th, 2023 as presented. So moved. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Alvin Davila. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Now uh, we're going to entertain uh, separately two motions to approve the enrollment policies for Up Academy Boston and Up Academy Dorchester. I'll first entertain a motion to approve the enrollment policy for Up Academy Boston as presented. So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Any discussion or objection? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now entertain a motion to approve the enrollment policy for Up Academy Dorchester as presented. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Is there any discussion or objection? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, I think we only have three to go. We'll now entertain a motion to approve the management contract between the Board of Trustees of the Up Academy Charter School of Dorchester and the Up Academy Charter School of Boston and Up Academy, excuse me, Up Education Network Incorporated as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Any discussion or objection to that motion? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Uh, our final two votes are on expulsion policies, uh, respectively, for uh, once again Up Academy Boston and Up Academy Dorchester. We will first entertain a motion to approve the expulsion uh, policy for Up Academy Boston as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Any discussion or objection to that motion? Hearing none, please call the roll, Ms. Sullivan. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. 
Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Wakanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And our final motion up for approval this evening is the expulsion policy for Up Academy Dorchester. I'll entertain a motion to approve that policy as presented. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any discussion or objection? And finally, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Ms. Lepanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan, and thank you, uh, fellow members, for bearing with the Votorama. Uh, we got through it, uh, nine votes tonight. Um, I want to take a moment to uh, once again thank uh, the representatives of the UP Education Network here this evening, uh, CEO, uh, Ms. Veronica Conforme, the COO, Mr. Mike Bauer, and uh, the principal of uh, UP Academy Boston, Ms. Rashida Lawson. We thank you once again specifically for uh, working with uh, the district to align your code of conduct with us specifically, um, and more generally just working with us uh, as a um, participating member uh, participating um, uh, schools within our district uh, and keeping uh, keeping your spirit of uh, innovation in line with uh, the work that we do all across the district. So we look forward to continuing this partnership. Thank you, Mr. Lohanto. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the committee members. Have a good night. Uh, we'll move on now to our first report this evening, which is an update on the Columbia Point parcel request for proposals. So at this time, I'd like to invite our BPS senior advisor, Mr. Rob Consalvo, to please present this update. And I'll give a brief um, introduction to uh, those that will be joining him this evening. We have a number of individuals uh, that will be speaking about uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, these include Mr. Bill Richard, who is the co-founder of the Martin Richard Foundation, Mr. Bob Scannell, who's the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, Queenie Santos, the director of the Walter Denny Youth Center, Kevin Diebler, a principal with RODE Architects, uh, Fatimata Balde, a youth member of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and also a Dever School student, and Barbara Boldly, who's a parent of a club member and a resident of the Harbor Point community. Mr. Gonsalvo, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good evening, school committee members. Uh, I'm honored to be here tonight to present this update uh, on the Columbia Point parcel uh, and the McCormick School of <coughs> Revitalization in RFP. Um, our intention tonight is to just walk you through um, the process of where we've been so far to talk to you about our recommendation, uh, of what our plan is to move forward, and then co-presenting, as you just articulated, Mr. Chairman, our folks from the Boys and Girls Club and the Martin Richard Foundation to talk about their project and their vision. Um, our intention is to make the recommendation that we move forward with a lease to the sole applicant who uh, responded to the RFP that we put out. Um, I wanna also just reiterate that um, when we did put out the RFP, we did receive only one response. Um, and the response uh, that we received was from the Boys and Girls Club in conjunction and partnership with the Martin J. Richard Foundation. Um, I'm gonna share right now with you uh, the deck that I've prepared. And I'll just walk you, uh, the, you and the members through it. Okay, so uh, first slide, uh, which is slide two, uh, is important to remind the school committee um, exactly what was previously approved and then where we've come based on feedback we heard from the school committee. The original resolution talked about uh, partnering with the Department of Neighbor Development to issue a request for a proposal for the redevelopment of a portion of land to benefit students at the Denver McCormick schools and other nearby BPS schools, as well as residents in the surrounding community. BPS and DND will actually see student school and community input and involvement and in, to inform the draft of the RFP. Uh, if no advantageous proposal received, the land will remain in the care, custody, control, and management of BPS. If the advantage, advantage, advantageous proposal is received, redevelopment of the land will be contingent upon a future vote of school committee and authorizing a surplus of the portion of the land to DND. Um, really important that we point out that that um, based on the feedback we got from the, all, you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the school committee, um, that the Boston Public Schools decided not to um, enter into a partnership with D&D &D that would result in the 
uh, surplusing of the portion of the land to DND. Um, that's a critical uh, point that we want to make sure folks are aware. By moving forward with the issuing of this lease with the respondent, um, be it we decided, again, based on the feedback we heard from Mr. Chairman Yu and the members of this committee, as well as many people uh, in the surrounding community, that we would run the RFP process, process ourselves and that we would keep the land as a permanent property of the Boston Public Schools moving forward and enter into a lease agreement which allowed the Boston Public Schools to continue to own the land and lease it to the respondent um, should they get the, should we award the lease to them. So important point of clarity uh, because because there was some discussion and some misconception out there that we were giving away land or that the land was going to be turned over to DND. And while that was a discussion previously, that no longer is in the plans. We will talk a little later on about how we'll plan to subdivide the lot and create a separate Boston Public Schools lot that will permanently remain in our custody moving forward. Our slide three is the rationale for the project. And this is what we came to you back uh, before. Um, and it looks like we're having some technical difficulties on the screen, but um, basically the same rationale exists. It's to invest and upgrade in the physical infrastructure of the site to offer a year-round indoor use for athletics, recreation, community, and educational space for both BPS students as well as for the Harbor Point community, the neighborhoods of Dorchester, South Boston, as well as other neighborhoods of Boston. To maximize the use of an asset to investigate potential opportunities for public-private partnerships designed to improve overall student and community experience and to preserve options for potential BPS projects at the Deborah and McCormick in the future. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you can see some of the technical difficulties we're having on the screen. Do um, I'm going to stop it and then reshare it? Okay. Of course. And do you have any? Uh, are there others that might be able to share it? I I can try to share it from my computer if needs if needed. Sure. Let me give it another shot, and then if okay. not, um, we'll go from there. Okay. So that was the rationale for the project. Um, we wanted to point that out again. Um, based on why we decided to move forward with this idea and what uh, the school committee approved us to authorize us to begin to look at moving forward. Um, slide four is a visual of the site. Um, so we wanted to remind members of how the site looks uh, right now. Um, to the left, the parcel with the baseball field, the asphalt concrete, and the asphalt concrete painted basketball courts. Um, as you see um, on the left-hand side will be the portion of the land that um, if the project moves forward would be the proposed facility and open space. Um, to the right is 315 Mount Vernon Street. That's a separate city of Boston parcel owned by the Boston Public Schools, which is the McCormick School. And to the right, which is the Dever, is actually a separate parcel, uh, a separate parcel ID number according to assessing, that's, um, which is known as 325 Mount Vernon Street. So there are currently two parcels there. We would create a third parcel as, as illustrated on the left, which would get a new, a new ID number and a new address and will remain, again, I wanna be crystal clear, permanent custody and control and property of the Boston Public Schools. Um, one of the things we talked about when we first, when we presented, actually we're gonna see in a minute, one of the three times the school committee and uh, something that came up in previous uh, conversations was what would be sort of the city community-wide benefit just beyond the McCormick and the Dever. And we're gonna try to stop and share one more time and then come right back to it. Um, and we were asked about sort of a radius around the school, how many students, uh, not only just the McCormick and the Dever students, but how many students could be impacted? How many um, young adults could be impacted? How many families could be impacted by utilizing this sort of state-of-the-art athletic, educational, and community space? And you'll see that the radius of three miles around the facility goes pretty far, all the way to the north at Logan Airport, to the west at Franklin Park, down to, all the way down to Dorchester, and accompanying a huge geography, which you'll hear later from the Boys and Girls Club about how many students would fall into this geography. So um, as asked, there is an enormous community-wide benefit beyond just the Deborah McCormick campus, beyond the Harbor Point campus, although we've been clear that the benefit must first be for Boston Public School students and McCormick Dever students and staff, the Harbor Point community and the surrounding communities of South Boston and Dorchester, but then also what is the bigger community-wide benefit uh, that was asked by this body? And this is a th shows you the three mile radius around the proposed facility uh, and really the, how many students 
would benefit and how many families and how many children and how many neighbors and how many people from the community could benefit from such a um, state-of-the-art facility put on this site. Um, the community review process, there have been 10 total public discussions. Um, as you can see here, the, uh, were, there were three uh, school committee meetings where this topic was discussed. Um, prior to the issuance of the RFP, we went out to the Harbor Point Task Force, the Columbia Seven Hill Association, the Deborah Parents Council. Um, the RFP was issued in June of 2019 and responded to at the appropriate time frame uh, under law uh, for when RFPs have to be issued and advertised. And what we committed to um, uh, was that we would go back out to the communities after we received the RFP to continue the public discussion, to continue the public discussion about who responded. We could have got zero responses. We could have got 50 responses. We received one response, but the commitment we made beforehand was we would go back out to all the communities um, um, and have a conversation about the RFP we received, the, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, proposal we received, the RFP we put out, uh, more feedback about and, and provide information about, which you'll hear in a little bit, about what processes would look like going forward. Uh, and so then we attended um, more community meetings uh, at the Harbor Point Community Task Force, the Columbia Seven Hill Civic Association, um, the McCormick Dever BCLA communities. And why that's important is that um, after, while we were going through the um, um, process, um, this, the school committee and the superintendent at the time uh, agreed upon um, a compromise and a, a merger of the McCormick and the BCLA into a new seven to 12 school. Um, and so we agreed to come back out and share the RFP and share the um, findings and share uh, and have a conversation about that. That happened on November 4th. And then Corcoran Jenison, which oversees Harbor Point, um, had their own community-wide annual meeting. They do it every year, it's their annual meeting. to talk about a wide variety of issues that impact Harbor Point, and that was on January 21st, 2020 of this year before COVID hit. So you can see 10 total public discussions, three before school committee, seven before the public. Um, and I just wanna again reiterate that we, um, as required, went out before the uh, RFP was issued um, to talk to the community about it, but we also agreed to come out after the fact to further continue that public conversation, to further educate the community on our next steps and on what the processes are around a development of this size, which we'll get into in a second. Um, very excited tonight. One of the things that we heard loud and clear um, as part of the public process was um, how important open space is and how important, um, as we, we heard from many people uh, that a year round use was something that is needed uh, on this site and in this community because an outdoor site can only be used certain parts of the year, particularly in spring and summer, um, and certainly not in the winter. Um, but we did hear loud and clear the importance of open space and that anything we did here, if we issued a lease that created a, uh, an indoor facility for year round use, should have an open space component. And we heard it both not only in the site where the actual project is going to happen and you'll hear from the respondents about their plan to increase open space as part of the project. But we heard that the entire parcel should uh, have a review of open space and how important open space was at the McCormick, um, in the spaces between the buildings, around the Dever. Uh, it has a schoolyard and it has uh, some passive play areas. It has asphalt play areas. It has passive play areas in the front. Um, we know that there's an issue at the Dever with flooding due to an issue with drainage between the property and a Boston water and sewer connection out on the street. That's something that is well known, that everyone knows that that's an issue that it needs to be addressed. So we, we heard loud and clear that any thoughtful plan for this particular property, all the parcels, the new parcel for the field house, the existing McCormick parcel, the existing Dever parcel, the issue with the flooding, we heard loud and clear that should all be taken into account if we're gonna make this kind of investment. Uh, in this property. And I'm really excited to announce that uh, Mayor Walsh has committed as part of this project moving forward, a $200,000 allocation from the city's capital budget to begin a public process to study future design improvements to the remaining open space of the Columbia Point parcel. This process will include students, teachers, community members, school committee, and other external stakeholders. And after this very public process with all of our stakeholders, funding will be allocated as part of the capital budget to begin the renovations. And we're really excited about that because I think it brings um, 
sort of a thoughtful side-by-side -side planning of this entire parcel. Um, this will be a public process. It will involve students and teachers from the McCormick Endeavor. It will involve community stakeholders. I think if anyone's aware of how this works, and as a former city council, we worked on many studies to improve parks and playgrounds around my district. These, these studies are a thoughtful public process to engage stakeholders and community of what the future of Oldman Space can look like at this parcel. So it really aligns with um, the, the respondents and the proposal we received from the RFP to uh, invest on a, a part of our parcel, a public-private partnership. And at the same time, the city is committing a major investment, both in a study to simultaneously to do, to do future open space designs on this property, and then funding it through the capital budget to actually do the renovation. So really excited. We thank Mayor Walsh and his team and the budget office for committing to this really important piece uh, in terms of investing in open space. Before I turn it over and um, talk about next steps, I do just want to quickly walk the members through um, sort of what we call an evaluation of comparative criteria. When any RFP in the city uh, is put out and a, uh, no matter how many respondents come forward, there's an evaluation an evaluation of comparative criteria. In this case, we had one respondent, as we talked about, and there are six key areas that we looked at. One is the development plan, and the development plan speaks to the project guidelines and the objectives of set out the RFP. Uh, and in this case, the objective set out the RFP were to revitalize existing space adjacent to the McCormick Endeavor in Dorchester to uh, end use that can be developed and man managed and maintained under a lease with the city, uh, a land use that will benefit the students of the city of Boston, the Boston Public Schools and the surrounding community, and um, a use that further that furthers the goals of the 2007 executive order relative to climate action in Boston and Green Bay Boston's action climate plan. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we reviewed it and found that this proposal was highly advan advantageous uh, in the development plan because it offers a year-round use for athletics, recreation, community, and educational space for BPS students, as well as the Harbor Point community, the neighborhoods of Dorchester, the neighborhoods of South Boston, and other surrounding neighborhoods of Boston. And we found it highly adv advantageous because it will serve young adults and students and members of the community of all ages. Um, there, there is no limit to, uh, according to this proposal, ages of who this field house will serve, or this proposal will serve, and you'll hear from um, the respondents about how, what the age groups are of the students they serve. Um, it, is a, a, it will be an opportunity to service students of all ages. Community benefits, and those can be community benefits as highlighted in section three of the RFP, and they are include but not limited to um, the generation of evening and weekend and social and educational recreation activities that have a positive impact on the neighborhood, uh, community activities improvements, creative use of open space on or near the site, and then landscape improvements around as well. Um, we reviewed that as advantageous because in addition to important recreational and educational programming for Boston Public Schools, the facility will allow low cost access to youth from the surrounding community and provide opportunities for children with disabilities and at risk youth with disabilities as well as time, in time and out of time school programming for youth. The proposed construction will also improve the public realm with uh, updated sidewalks, lighting and landscaping and other amenities that will be required as part of the city's public process. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, design concept, we rated highly advantageous because according to section four of the RFP and the respondents, um, they've shown compatible uses as a recreational facility as shown in their drawings and renderings, but it's also the, the proposal calls for the building to be built through smart design and construction, and they've committed to creating an environmentally fr a friendly and sustainable project. And the proposed design will aim to achieve US GDC LEED gold rating. So we rated that as highly advantageous. Uh, developer experience and capacity, we rated as highly advantageous. The Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester is a very experienced local nonprofit who has worked with youth in our city for 45 years. They serve over 4,000 children annually. The organization has experience in the local community as they operate the Walter Denny Youth Center in the Harbor Point community and have been working directly with youth of this neighborhood for many years. In addition, they are partnering with the Martin, James, the Martin Richard Foundation, a renowned local philanthropic organization that has already proven its commitment to the city of Boston through initiatives such as Martin's Park and Fort Point and many other charitable endeavors. The pros is financial capacity. This um, is a standard that just makes sure that the uh, it evaluates the financial strength of the proposer and its ability to actually finance the project and operate at least to the satisfaction of the city. It did require an audited financial statement for the past three years, uh, and that was provided by the applicant. 
um, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester provided audit and financial statements for 2016, 17, and 18. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester are a financially stable organization and has demonstrated an ability to fund the proposed project. The Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester has a healthy endowment and operating reserves with three committees that oversee financial matters, audit, finance, and endowment. And also the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester also maintains and owns several other properties. So we rated that as advantageous. Um, diversity and inclusion, the final recommendation rel evaluates the relative strength of the proposal for achieving diversity and inclusion as part of the proposed project. Uh, after our review, we found that the membership of the BGCD's board of directors, board of advisors, senior leadership team, staff, and volunteers exemplifies its longstanding commitment to diversity and inclusion. They reflect the ethnicities, languages, and age groups, abilities, and gender statuses of the communities they serve. Through culturally competent programming, multilingual staff, prioritizing the participation of Dorchester residents and parents, and creating welcoming facilities, BGCD continues to forge deep connections in the Dorchester community and the city of Boston. An example of this is their ongoing creation of what's called Project Bind, Boston Inclusion Network for Disabilities, a program launched by the BGCD to ensure that youth of all abilities have equal access to out-of-school time programmings. Also, the company that they propose to use, the Kennedy Company, has a strong track record of supporting affirmative action initiatives. They regularly meet or exceed the MBE, WBE compliance on their projects and actively seek and encourage minority and women-owned subcontractors and residents for their pre-construction period. So we, we, uh, we rated that as advantageous. And in the financial proposal, um, we know that the Boys and Girls Club has uh, agreed to incur the cost of the proposed project and provided um, the ability to run the facility as well. So there's no cost to the city of Boston in this public-private partnership. So our conclusion was based on the foregoing. We recommend the selection of the proposal submitted by the Boys and Girls Club as a highly advantageous proposal submitted by a responsive and responsible proposer. And so that was our recommendation. So what does that mean for next steps? Um, we see four next steps. Um, continued student, school, and stakeholder engagement. We heard loud and clear that we need to continue to work with the students and staff and um, members of the McCormick and Deborah communities, the BCLA community. We heard loud and clear about working with the Harbor Point community and the residents of the surrounding communities. Um, this is very early in this process. I, I always say that uh, us moving forward with um, offering a lease agreement, should you approve it, is really the bottom of the first in a nine inning game. Um, there is still a huge lengthy process that will go forward uh, in order for this project to move forward. Um, this project will be subject to the Boston Planning and Development Agency, the Boston Planning and Development Agency's Lodge Project Review, which will actually trigger additional community input. And so folks who may not know what that is, is the city of Boston has Lodge Project Review and Small Project Review. Lodge Project Review is, uh, goes um, on any project that exceeds 50,000 gross square feet. This project has, uh, has 75,000, we'll add 75,000 gross square feet. Um, so it will trigger the BPDA's Lodge Project Review. And as part of Lodge Project Review, um, there is an entirely different public process that the city will run, including the formation of what's called an impact advisory group, otherwise known as an IAG. That IAG is made up of approximately 15 members from the community, picked by the community, uh, picked by the BPDA, and picked by the Boston Public Schools, um, who actually, as an impact advisory group, work with the BPDA and the respondent to figure out how the project will actually look when it comes to completion. And it works side by side with the city and the respondent in addressing any issues and concerns and making sure that the project has the support of the community. So we would look forward to that impact advisory group, including members of the McCormick, Dever, and BCLA community, as well as the surrounding Harbor Point community, as well as uh, Boston Public School community, as well as uh, the surrounding neighborhoods of Dorchester and South Boston. And again, I've been involved in many development projects in my time in the city, and IAGs play an invaluable role in leading projects to their final um, um, completion and, that, and, and making sure that the issues and the views and the will of the community is all thoughtfully incorporated into a plan. I can't speak highly enough of IAGs. I've sat on them. Um, they really are sort of the trigger that helps the community uh, make sure that these projects work within the context of the community. So that will happen here uh, to, to make sure there's a continued community process. 
And you'll hear more from the respondents about their plans on making sure they work with the community uh, moving forward should the school committee approve this. And then just quickly work to subdivide the property, sign in a new parcel ID, the property remains ownership of BPS. I wanna be clear, that's just an administrative issue that you file with inspectional services. We wanna create a separate parcel on the BPS property so that this building has its own parcel. Um, it will remain Boston Public School property forever. And instead of two addresses on that parcel, like we talked about earlier, 315 Mount Vernon Street and 325 Mount Vernon Street, it would get its own BPS parcel ID and its own BPS address. Again, being perfectly clear that it always remains Boston Public School property. And then finalize the lease with the selected partner and understanding that the lease will lease work will not begin until all applicable permits and approvals have been obtained, i.e. zoning relief, the large project review process driven by the community, securing the necessary building permits, and then and only then BPS will provide written notice for the project to proceed when we feel comfortable that all of the public process has taken its course in the appropriate manner. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna at this time turn it over to the sole respondent, um, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and the uh, Martin Richard Foundation to talk to the school committee and the public about their proposal uh, what their vision is and why they applied and responded to the RFP. Uh, hello, this is Bob Scano. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm uh, uh, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Consalvo, thank you for your, uh, your involvement in the process. Really appreciate it. Uh, you did hit on a lot of the points that we wanted to cover in our presentation, so that might uh, abbreviate our, uh, our presentation just a little bit here. But, uh, you know, I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Lacanto, committee members, and Dr. Casalius for including us uh, on your busy agenda tonight. We, we truly appreciate the opportunity uh, to share a brief overview of how we envision activating the parcel on Mount Vernon Street, adjacent to the McCormick Endeavor Schools. Uh, and knowing that you have a full agenda tonight, we'll be as efficient as we can with our presentation out of respect to all parties. And we do have some slides that, uh, that we're gonna wanna share. Uh, a 30 second snapshot of our organization. Uh, again, I'm Bob Scannell, the president and CEO. Uh, I've been here for 33 years as CEO, and uh, you know, right now we have uh, three clubhouses in Dorchester, as mentioned previously, two in the Columbia Savin Hill area, one at Harbor Point, which is the Walter Denny Center across from uh, uh, the McCormick and Endeavor Schools. And uh, we've had uh, steady growth uh, over the years. We opened in 1974, uh, the Mar Boys and Girls Club. Uh, then in 2000, we were able to build the four-story Paul McLaughlin Center uh, on Dorchester Ave, and, uh, and it was 2003, uh, we were asked uh, by the Harbor Point community to take over the Walter Denny Center. Uh, so we've been over there for a while now, and it's, uh, it's, it's been a great expansion and growth. And the reason we, we continue to expand is because the need continues to grow. So we're, we're very much aware of that, uh, keenly aware of the need for better and, uh, and more facilities in the city of Boston. So we view this as an amazing opportunity to engage and serve the youth of Boston and in particular, the students and faculty at the adjacent McCormick Endeavor schools. Uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, there it is, that we go to slide one. Um, so as you can see in front of you, create a, a, a new type of year round space to share with uh, BPS students, youth and family. And uh, you know, we, we've, we've done research and uh, we've learned uh, anecdotally over the years that there, there is no facility like this in the city of Boston. Um, the suburbs uh, have plenty of these facilities so they can provide programs and services to children uh, indoors, uh, but we don't have that in Boston. We don't certainly don't have it in Dorchester. You know, the universities may have them, but you know, this would be a facility dedicated to, to the students of the schools and, and the youth of the community. And it would be for children of all ages. And I think that's important to understand. Uh, you know, it would basically follow the model that we have in place at, at, our, at our other uh, Boys and Girls Club sites. So all ages will be served. Uh, essentially from five, five years old up to uh, adult. Uh, and the specialized indoor athletic and recreational resources for uh, uh, special education students is, um, you know, here at our club, we serve a very significant population of children who have emotional and or physical challenges. So we view this as an important 
part of uh, any facility. And the third point uh, is very important, foster, foster deeper partnerships with the McCormick Deborah staff and students, area youth, education, healthcare organizations. And, and the way we view that is, you know, our model is to create wraparound services for the children and families. We believe that'll best assist uh, with the development of the child and, and support systems for the family. So um, we have a very good uh, track record of working with other organizations to partner on, you know, a wide range of services to serve, serve the family as a whole. Um, so it's not just about uh, creating athletic programs for the children. You know, this facility, of course, will have um, uh, all kinds of amenities that uh, will be determined, uh, as Mr. Consalvo mentioned, through the, the process of going out to the community and listening to the students and faculty and, and, and other leaders in the community. Um, so, so that's going to be very important, uh, a part of it, but the wraparound services are really important because we, we don't propose to just, to just build a building. We, we want to, you know, build community as well. So, uh, that's a very important point and, uh, it create pathways for advancing youth passion for personal and community change. So, you know, th this is core to our mission. You know, we believe in, in, in getting children involved at the youngest stage possible and, and keeping them engaged and uh, guiding them uh, in, into adulthood. So, you know, that would be the mission here uh, as well, of course. Um, so, um, as uh, Mr. Gonsalvo mentioned, you know, I have a few members of my team here, four actually, and um, uh, so I want to introduce them as we move along and I'll do that. Right now, I'd like to uh, introduce Bill Richard, who's a co-founder of the Martin uh, Richard Foundation, who is, uh, as mentioned, uh, partnering with us in this endeavor. Bill? Thanks, Bob. Uh, as noted here on the slide, um, well, first off, I too want to thank um, the uh, committee chair, Mike Laconto and Superintendent Casilius for having us tonight. Uh, it was worth the wait, so thank you. Uh, as noted here on the slide, our, our values align and our program missions overlap. Uh, we have a strong working relationship that goes back many years. Um, we at the foundation are, couldn't be more excited to partner with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester for what really is uh, a historic opportunity for Boston. Um, and I don't think that's really uh, overstating it. This is an opportunity to challenge ourselves to think bigger about traditional programming to include more partners in the community through spaces that are connected, not just in physical proximity, but in shared values. Um, alluding to what Bob just said. It's an opportunity to bring people and institutions together around these shared values. Supporting young people isn't anything new, but being intentional about what placemaking for young people looks like and feels like, we will create interconnected spaces right here in Dorchester that we can hopefully be a model for for other cities um, and beyond. I'd add that. Um, it, please tell me. Well, Shut everything up. Sorry, I'd add that while we uh, have some concepts here that uh, certainly met the requirements in the RFP, there is much more that can be realized in this opportunity and we will look forward to continuing that dialogue with our partners, uh, NBPS, McCormick and the Dever and others to create a seamless network of caring places and people who support our children and young adults. Uh, next slide, Brenner, thank you. Uh, I can jump in here, uh, Bill, and, and you can join in as well if you like, but, you know, we're very, very proud of our, our partnership, uh, long existing partnership with uh, BPS, you know, uh, you know, our members, first of all, go to uh, over 110 Boston public schools, uh, so that's a real presence, but, you know, some of the unique programs that we're involved with with BPS that we've partnered with, with them on are, uh, as you can see on the screen, the, uh, the, the UPK classrooms, you know, we, we have at two of our sites, we have those classrooms. It was first piloted here in 2006 and has been a, a real enormous success. So, you know, I really think that BPS and the Boys and Girls Club should be proud of that success. Those programs have become uh, nationally known models and in fact, internationally. So uh, that, that's been a fantastic program that we've worked with uh, BPS on. And we, in fact, will open a third uh, UPK classroom over at the Walter Denny Center at Harbor Point this coming fall. So, you know, we're very, very excited about that. Um, <clears throat> and at the Deva School, uh, of course, right across the street from our center, um, you know, the children are able to come there every day right after school. I believe there's 75 children who, who come over, walk over, and, and participate in the programs. 
And, uh, and that, that's been really great. We've done that for a number of years. And uh, on Wednesdays, we're able to open up early, 12 o'clock, uh, so the teachers can take advantage of professional development opportunities. And, uh, and that, I think that's been a, a big plus for, for everyone. And a uh, little outside of, of this circle, the, the Russell School has been an amazing partner. Um, we do our social emotional learning with the children. Uh, 400 children participate. They come here two days a week. And, and I can tell you, um, first of all, the leadership at that school is amazing. Uh, and the teachers are, are really, really special. And they work m with my staff here at the Boys and Girls Club uh, to provide these fantastic opportunities to the kids two days a week, uh, every week uh, during the school year. And the results have just been off the charts amazing. Uh, you know, great for the kids, good for the school, and, and good for BPS for uh, supporting that type of partnership. Um, so, um, and Bill, I didn't know if you wanted to, to comment on, on, on partnerships at all. Um, but uh, yeah, we certainly value, value our partners and uh, particularly BPS. All right, so um, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Quinette Santos, uh, you know, better known as Queenie Santos, who's the director of uh, the, the Harbor Point facility I mentioned, the Walter Denny Youth Center, and she's been a 25 year employee here at Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. So Queenie, if, if you'd like to say a few words. Yes, can I Everybody hear me because my camera is not working. It's saying that the host has me um, locked out. It says that on mine too, Queenie, but we can hear you. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me tonight. I was, you know, it's an honor to be here tonight um, to hear um, all of the big things that's going on with the school and all of that, so I thank you. And I just want to start by saying that I've been a part of this community for over 40 years. Um, and not much has changed for the young people, but now is the time. I'm sorry, did we lose uh, Queenie? It, it does seem that way. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I suppose we could yeah, I, go back to her if that's okay. Uh, sure. And um, you know what, let me, uh, if you want to forge ahead, um, Bob, and, and thank you for joining us um, on the screen. I'm going to see if I might be able to regain her. She might be in the uh, uh, participants room here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we are. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know what you heard, but I just want to say that, um, you know, every day when I walk into the club, I look across the street at the McCormick School, which is a school that I attended many, many years ago. Um, so I know that there's opportunity here. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to know that there's a collaboration with stakeholders in this area to really make this the best community for our young people. And they deserve it more so now than ever. You know, our space at the Walter Denny, it's not big space, but it's love space. Um, it's an oasis for the kids, their families that rely on us each and every day um, for after school support and also um, for the children and young adults. Um, there's many more that would like to be a part of this community. We can do more for more people when we have room to grow. And that's one of the things things that we're so excited about. Um, we have such a beautiful neighborhood that's sometimes disconnected, um, but thoughtfully bringing people together can drive this change that allows this space to be an anchor for all of our young people in Dorchester. Um, bringing more partners to the table and providing a state-of-the-art facility for our children it's powerful and priceless. I just want to say thank you again and it's time and I couldn't be more proud to see it happening in my neighborhood. Great, uh, thanks, thanks, Queenie. We we appreciate your your comments. And uh, so we're going to move on to the next slide now uh, that that Bill and I will both comment on. So we are Dorchester now is the time. That that's actually a slogan uh, we've adopted here at our Boys and Girls Club over the past few years. And um, you know, even though our reach is beyond Dorchester. Uh, that's where, where our facilities are, are, are based. Uh, we have children from every neighborhood in the city who come to our clubs, and we're really, really proud of, about that. But what we've said is, um, in, in our board, 
but you know, the board of Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and, and the board of the Martin Richard Foundation are 1,000% uh, uh, in on uh, the next 50 years. We're, we're coming up on 50 years that we've been in the community. And um, <clears throat> we made a real decision to say, and we said, we're not responsible if, if we don't start looking for the next 50 years. This is the right time. And so we continue to want to build facilities because the demand uh, continues to be great. And, you know, let, let's face it, particularly, you know, in these times, children need places to go, I think, more than ever before. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, a little known fact is that our zip code 02125 is the most diverse zip code in the country. And, you know, our diversity is, is, is our biggest asset here. And we're able to bring children together and families, of course, uh, from all different backgrounds. So we're very proud of that. And we, we want to gear up for the next 50 years. And we've got plans to do that. Um, you can see by um, the chart that, you know, within three miles of us, 50,000 50, young people. And that's a big number. Now, we're serving a lot of children now, 4,000. That's a big number. But we know we got to do more. And so, um, you know, part of what we could do here is, is to serve a significant amount of children, you know, beginning with uh, the students at, at the McCormick Endeavor schools. Uh, we had a chance to uh, meet with them on two occasions and, uh, and it was just wonderful. I mean, that's where you got to start a process, uh, listening to the youth and we understand that. And they were, uh, they were uh, as always, they were brilliant, smart, creative, gave us some ideas. We've already made, made adjustments to the way we're thinking and we look forward to meeting with them more. But it really is, it's a significant investment for the next 50 years. So we're taking it very seriously. and. Um, and Bill, you might want to add to that. Yeah, just to add on to what Bob was saying, I mean, we as a family, we as a foundation, I think we as a collaborative group, we always talk about um, doing better, always talk about um, doing more. As much as the, as the club, as we feel as though we're doing maybe on a daily and a weekly basis, I think all of us, you folks on the committee, everyone listening, we always want to do more. Um, and that's good. So, I mean, to be stewards of our next generation, we have to do more to preserve the racial, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity, specifically of our community here in Dorchester and in Boston. We can do more to provide intentional spaces for students, young adults, and families. Um, and really, I, I don't think we could be any more ready to take on this challenge, so. Um, one other side note as we um, go forward, you may see like a visual emphasis on um, athletics. Um, our, our intention is to offer arts, music, other essential family services to students and surrounding communities. So while you may see a visual emphasis on athletics, we, um, you know, we really look forward to, to talking with folks to, to seeing what, um, what else we can do. Next slide, Brenna. The, um, well, we at the Martin Richard Foundation, um, we're hyper-focused on providing young people opportunities to engage in positive civil action. Um, to go back to what the superintendent said at five o'clock, four hours ago, um, and as a nod to Congressman Lewis, making good trouble. We talk about it all the time, and uh, we've always loved that line, and it just means so much more to us right now, and um, uh, so we're all gonna to continue to make good trouble together. We're committed, to com uh, we're committed to cultivating a next generation of thinkers and upstanders. That's what we focus on as a foundation and as a collaborative effort with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and yes, we are living through historic times um, as we've listened through um, the presentations tonight. We know that change must be fundamental we all have a role, our institutions, our partners in government, our schools. You know, we will listen, we will learn, we will adapt. We don't have all the answers, um, but we're looking forward to continuing the process to get to the second inning. Bob? Okay, um, uh, great, thanks, Bill. And uh, so we thought it would be a great idea to, uh, you know, ha have our architects here to uh, kind of show you know, in concept form, what's possible. Um, we, we know we're gonna get significant input um, to, the, to the process and, and what type of facility we should build. So, um, but, but, you know, uh, Kevin Diebler, who's with Rody Architects, uh, a very uh, respected local firm and regional firm, uh, has put a ton of work into this and, 
and, and, and used community input and, 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 and Kevin is, uh, and his team have reviewed the master plan over at Harbor Point and put an awful lot of work in this to come up with something to say, hey, you know, this is, this is what this could look like. You know, let's go in front of the community and, and see what they think and, and see what changes might be in order. So, you know, with that said, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to, uh, to Kevin. Great. Uh, thank you, Bob. And you can hear me fine at this point? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Caselius, uh, uh, Mr. Lacanto, and members of the school committee for your, your time this evening. It, it's really an honor to, to be here. Again, I'm Kevin Diebler, uh, principal and, uh, of Rody Architects. Uh, and I will uh, soon share some images of our proposal, but uh, before that begins, I think it might be good to highlight a few of the written guidelines provided in the RFP that influenced our planning and design decisions. Um, and they're up here and you can see them. They are uh, to revitalize open space, to include community spaces suitable for year round use, to benefit the surrounding community. Um, all of these things sort of wrapped into our approach um, and they, they will carry us into the next phase of seeing this uh, exciting proposal realized. Uh, so as we begin to look at Columbia Point, we can see that the peninsula is defined by its access to the waterfront with large open spaces that already are an outlet and resource for many <clears throat> surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the next slide is uh, the entire peninsula right now, Columbia Point, uh, Morrissey Boulevard and Moakley Park are also defined now by large parcels of land being actively uh, planned and uh, by private development, the state and other large institutions. Uh, years ago, a master plan was developed uh, with community input, and it has informed a large part of our approach uh, to this network of existing fabric. Uh, our focus remains on fulfilling the goals of the RFP, and, but now we're acutely aware of our time and how a planning process must be sensitive to the needs of a changing community. Uh, BPS, as you can see in this slide, occupies a very central uh, location within this, this uh, rapidly developing uh, peninsula. Um, next slide. Um, so this view focuses in now on the BPS property. From left to right, you can see the Dever, the McCormick, and our proposed field house uh, facility. Uh, our field house proposal creates a campus while strengthening its physical ties to the neighborhood and taking advantage of the moment to bring BPS into this exciting moment, taking shape on the peninsula. Uh, this view also describes the literal connection we're making to the existing parts of the neighborhood with an active open space that aligns itself right on Mount Vernon Street, adjacent to the uh, Harbor Point Development's uh, green open space. Uh, this is very much an element that's tied into the master plan uh, creating new connections through the peninsula. And again, BPS is right at the sort of crux of all of this. Um, so this is a center and a node of community activity. It's gonna be accessible, open and welcome to all. Um, the next slide, please. Looking deeper inside, uh, we can now sort of give you a, a sense of the parts and pieces of this proposal. Um, the, the large spaces are dedicated to uh, team team sports, training, and fitness. Um, you'll have a, a hard set of hard courts on the uh, ground level, a track on the second floor, and uh, above that, a turf field facility. Uh, so this really sort of extends the amount of space that can be used for play and activity um, and goes vertical with that. Um, the business, um, or, excuse me, then uh, next to that, uh, or areas dedicated to wraparound services, uh, smaller fitness studios, offices, and classrooms. Um, the business model for the facility outlined in the RFP calls for a sharing of space for revenue generating league sports. The gym and field then are like the engine sort of generating demand and driving public use. We can harness this demand in order to create other programming for our BPS club members and the community at large. Our team continues to de uh, define the meaning of this program while it's a challenging time to think of our physical infrastructure. Our whole team is excited to lead a process that will be inclusive and adaptive to this new time. Um, into the next one, please. Um, 
Since our model is dependent on understanding the market for the facility use, we've teamed up with an indoor sports facility consultant to achieve success. These images are the types of spaces and functions we expect to create. They're designed to be flexible and accommodate multiple sports and activities such as you know, soccer, baseball, softball, football. I'm not gonna list all of sports, but uh, the idea is that these are flexible spaces and can uh, accommodate um, many different uses. Uh, I should also say that adaptive sports and fitness will be a strong focus uh, in our programming. Um, the next slide. Live games will be played here as well, um, at drawing parents and families into the facility. And since I've lived in this community for, for over 20 years, having raised an active fourth and seventh grader, um, I'll add that this is in some ways a grassroots movement, a desire by many parents in our community to bring our kids the facilities and resources available to so many others around Massachusetts. Um, we know that sports and acti these activities bring communities together. Um, and then the next one, we give you an updated image of, of where we are in our design process with these renderings. Um, this is really how you're going to experience the building and surrounding site uh, from Mount Vernon Street in this view. We see the opportunity for a, a world-class facility here. Uh, and then with that, it needs to be a safe and secure place for kids to grow, learn, and be themselves. The Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester is a known and trusted entity that can do this. As architects, we'll work to make the design promote the excitement and opportunity of the moment. In the last image, I really want to start to talk, um, next slide, is about um, the work we have to do to, to finish the work and the wraparound services that will complement this facility model. As we face a new uh, reality, we're embracing this challenge and we'll open our process to the community as it unfolds. We're also glad that Martin, Martin Richard Foundation can help us focus on the values of inclusion, kindness, justice, and peace. And uh, again, I thank you as a father, architect, and member of this community. It's an honor to work on this project and we uh, look forward to a great collaboration with BPS and the community going forward. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, we just got a couple of quick things and, and uh, really positive. Uh, one of the members wanted to speak uh, on the Zoom meeting as did uh, one of the parents. So uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Fatumada, who is uh, a member of the Boys and Girls Club uh, and uh, a very active member at the club and uh, also a student at the Devo, Devo School. So Fatu, I hope we're not way past your bedtime. I know it's getting late. <laughs> But, no, not yet. Oh, well, you, you go right ahead. It's all yours, okay? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hello all. My name is Fatu Matabalde, and I'm a member of the Walter Denny Youth Center, and that's a unit of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester. I think that the club has definitely introduced me to other people from other schools because we are able to meet people from the Condon or the homes or schools all over Boston and become great friends. My best friend was from another school and thanks to the club, that's how I met her. The time that I spend at the club is definitely like no other. I'm able to travel without my parents or siblings. And trust me, traveling without your three siblings is definitely nice. <laughs> My favorite part of the club was when we were told that school was closing. There was a bunch of selfless people handing out, gap, handing out bags of food to everyone so we wouldn't go hungry. I think that the new facility is a perfect place to find new hobbies, but most importantly, meet new people and make new friends. And if we had, the more, and if we had more space, I know that we can definitely do more. I'm really looking forward to the future. Thank you all. Well, thanks, Fatu. We're, we're lucky to have you as a member, okay? You're a great leader in the community and, uh, and thanks for uh, staying up with us tonight to, to speak to this, this group. Um, and, and finally, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, oh, oh, you're very welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'd like to introduce Barbara now, who's a parent of a Boys and Girls Club member and a resident of the Harbor Point community. Uh, Barbara, are you there?
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Hi, my name is Barbara. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am a long life resident of Harbor Point and I have a 12 year old son named Caden and he is a member of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, which is part of the Walter Denny Youth Center. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester means so much to me and our community. Caden has the support there and encourage, he gets support and encouragement from all the staff in the club and we're excited about the possibility of the new facilities where he can play and run and use some of his energy indoors, even when the weather is like cold and snowing. Um, as a resident of the Harbor Point community, we need more things for our children to do that incorporate both recreation and enrichment programs. And it's time our young people here had a new state of like state of the art facility and significant and the significant investment that the club and Martin Richard Foundation plan for our neighborhood. Our kids deserve it and our whole Dorchester community will benefit from it. The plans the plans the club have for the next 50 years give me hope that my child and the future generations will have the space to grow, learn, and other areas of the community are excuse me, learn as the surrounding areas in the community are changing. With the Boston Public Schools across the street and the club right here, it makes sense to use the space for the benefit of students and young people of our community. This type of proposal can be seen in the suburbs across the state, and we need this type of facility and to have a community place with the amenities closer right here in our own backyard. This is more than just a building. This is a building of opportunities for the children and the families of Harbor Point and all across the city. Thank you. Well, that's great, Barbara. Thank you uh, so much uh, for taking the time to, to share with the, the school committee tonight and all of us. Uh, we appreciate it. We, we appreciate your involvement uh, in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, I just wanted to, you know, I can close it out and, uh, you know, I did, uh, I did happen to obtain uh, last week or so about 67 letters of support from leaders in the community. When I say leaders, uh, community leaders, business leaders, parents, youth, uh, and some of the institutions that are, that are on the Harbor Point Peninsula, such as UMass Boston, Corcoran Jenison Company, uh, BC High, and others. So, so very pleased uh, to see that kind of support. Uh, it, the project, uh, as it stands now, would I think would be well received by so many. Uh, the police commissioner uh, Gross did submit a letter of support, and he said, "Hey, we need more. We need more of this in the city. And he said, we need more of this now." Um, so you know, we, we'd be very excited to partner with BPS on this. Um, <clears throat> you know, we know we got our work cut out. We got to raise a lot of money to build a world class facility, but to be connected to the McCormick and Devil schools and the great students there and the faculty there, I got to tell you it's limitless the opportunities that we can create i mean i envision you know the schools and and us being a real hub in that neighborhood and beyond and and you know i think it's a real good opportunity a great moment in time to to, to seize upon uh doing something great there as queenie mentioned she's been in harbor point for 40 plus years she went to both those schools and uh you know there hasn't been a lot of change over the years um but I think this is an opportunity. Um, and, you know, you can trust us to do a great job. Uh, we can assure you that. So, you know, I'd just like to, to close on that, on that note. And um, so that's the end of the presentation. I don't know if it's my place to say we could take questions, but uh, it's probably for the, the chairman to say. So uh, Chairman Lacanto, I guess I, I'll hand it back to you. And, and I thank all of you for your time tonight. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scannell, and um, thank you for uh, bringing along your colleagues. Uh, just looking across the screen, Mr. Diebler, um, Ms. Uh, Bodley, uh, Ms. Santos, Ms. Baldy. Um, I hope I didn't miss anyone, um, but certainly Mr. Richard, uh, your co-presenter, um, and uh, the co-proponent um, uh, of, um, of this uh, proposal tonight. Um, this is a long time coming. Um, we know uh, you um, folks collectively, the Martin Richard Foundation and Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester um, have been um, hard at work for a number of um, months 
um, since you put in your uh, RFP and certainly uh, I would assume a great deal of time prior to that in um, laying the groundwork for uh, your proposal here. Um, and then, you know, since the time that the proposal has been put out, um, as Mr. Uh, Consalvo mentioned in his um, proposal, you've been pounding the pavement here with uh, the community to um, talk about the benefits of your proposal and, and um, uh, create that support. And I think that's evident in the 67 uh, letters of uh, support that you mentioned, Mr. Scannell. I'd, I'd uh, really appreciate it if you could um, get those scanned and, and sent over to uh, Ms. Sullivan, who can um, share those with the committee. Um, Great. So Great. I do want to have uh, take a pause and, and uh, make sure we uh, save some time here for members' questions and comments. Uh, so I'll look to the members now if you want to raise your hands or otherwise make yourselves known. Uh, we can uh, go around uh, the table and um, uh, address some questions here. So we'll start with uh, Ms. Robinson. Yes, I want to thank you both for the um, presentation. It's very exciting um, to see. I know full well the um, reputation of the Daniel Marr Boys and Girls Club, um, both from the early childhood work that you all have done, but more importantly, been so impressed with the um, youth development and the work that you have done with students from their very youngest days to um, high school and beyond. Um, so know that you all have that full range and the quality work you do. My question really comes back to the questions that um, the school is raising as it transitions from a middle school to a seven to 12. And would like to understand more the balance of um, the indoors, which I think is wonderful, but what about the outdoor space and the need for outdoor activity and how will those two be balanced? I'm, I'm not sure if that's a question for me or for, for the school committee. I'm happy to comment on it. No, I, no I, well, I think you should comment on it because I think that's been the, the, the biggest concern um, is that we, you know, we haven't had the moment of really thinking about moving from a middle school, elementary middle group to now adding a high school on that land in what kind of outdoor, um, you know, facilities that may be needed for, you know, football, et cetera. If we, you know, if we've used up the property without really thinking about how those other things may be, may need to be accommodated as well. Mr. Scannell, before you answer, I think uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Consalvo might want to jump in here because I know okay. that he and his uh, colleagues have been in uh, close contact with um, representatives mm -hmm. of the school community there. Yeah, so um, great question, uh, Member Robinson. I, I would add, mm -hmm. obviously, um, the, the part of the draw for the facility is the year-round use uh, mm -hmm. because that parcel goes uh, dormant for, much, for you know half the year anyway, uh, mm -hmm. given the uh, change in seasons. And so those kind of athletics uses can now be 24-7 uh, all season long. Um, but I think that what's exciting is we heard loud and clear about um, how important open space is. And it's not just the open space around the actual physical building. Um, I think if you see the drawing that the architect um, just drew, it's very different than the first drawing that came in with the RFP, uh, mm -hmm. which had virtually no open space, now has a, a, a large parcel of open space, as I see it on the drawing, to the right of the entrance. And they've reconfigured the entrance uh, and the design of the building, how the building is sitting on the lot to accommodate open space. I think they heard that loud and clear from the feedback. I think the exciting opportunity is that we're actually planning and I think planning is so important uh, on what we need to do in the city, both you know, as we plan individual neighborhoods, as we do a citywide planning, as we plan for public open space, the, the commitment from Mayor Walls to do a $200,000 study, which is a significant investment for a study. And, and, and I would say that someone who's done a lot of these studies, they vary the amount of money that is allocated for a study. This is a rather large amount that shows the seriousness of wanting to conduct a thoughtful process of simultaneously as um, the respondent is actively working with the community about what the community wants to see uh, in this building and around this building and outside this building. The city will simultaneously be having during into a public process that will be driven by the community through this uh, open space study so that we can have really at the end of the day, 
this state of the art campus that will now have a thoughtfully planned open space plan that will be built through the city's capital budget. Plus, if you're if, if you if the school committee approves this, a thoughtfully planned indoor outdoor facility that complements each other. So, I think the fact that um, we heard loud and clear, and the city heard loud and clear, the importance of the open space piece and to commit to a study of that. And I will also say, I know I, I mentioned it in my uh, remarks, and I, I swear I'm trying to be brief. I, I just texted the chair. This is the first time I've ever contributed to a really long presentation and keeping you here all night, so I apologize. Uh, but um, the the fact that the BPDA will engage in a really thorough public process through their large project review, uh, the IAG will play a hugely significant role in driving again, what this building is going to look like, but what the space around the whole parcel is going to look like. And we look forward to be able to make appointments at IAG from the school, from students, from faculty, and from other community leaders, and, and from BPS. So I think it's a total combination of all of the planning um, and the adding of the open space master plan piece is hugely critical to the success of the entire peninsula. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. We'll move on now to Dr. Rivera. So thank you again for, um, for this great presentation because um, it's much more developed and um, haven't had much time to process because I just got the materials yesterday. Um, and I do strongly support the Boys and Girls Club. My son has been in Boys and Girls Club for, since he was in kindergarten. Um, and I really support the mission of, of the Martin uh, Foundation. My main concerns are um, related to what was also presented earlier by the attorney uh, from the Harbor uh, Point uh, Task Force, um, you know, related to concerns about community input, despite the fact that I know you have these letters of um, support, I would love to see them because the perception that I've been getting as a UMass Boston professor that has worked in that community and in, you know, with um, the youth in the area for 20 years, I know that there has been a long history of um, missing voices and participation in, in decision-making around um, what happens on, in, in, in the Columbia Point Peninsula. So my questions are really, one is um, how to address the concerns raised by the, by the attorney uh, and some of the members of the community that are related to doing a sort of a pause and really figuring out first the McCormick School uh, design and construction and that footprint of what might be some needs. And this is going a little bit to what member Robinson brought up around, you know, what, how are we thinking about, really we should be centering as BPS, the McCormick school's needs and, and, and in relation with the Dever and what, you know, what um, construction plans, right? Like have to shift to serve more older students um, than the original planning um, for, for younger youth. Um, and um, question as well about the fact that UMass Boston is developing the Bayside um, uh, you know, property and that there is also a bigger plan for the peninsula beyond these parcels. And what is really going to be the, the environmental impact um, and, um, and just what kind of coordination is, has there been or will there be um, with the plans for the development of the Bayside property? I, it's very critical because this is really, again, a very strong community as Queenie stated and as, as, as some of you that, that live there um, there's, there's a lot of developers, you know, in the mix here and with good intentions, but it seems, again, not clear to me what the actual coordination is around environmental, uh, assessment and impact on the community, the broader community. And, and again, more, more communication and, 
uh, participation from the residents that will be most affected by, um, you know, again, all of this broader development as well and thinking about the space there. Um, so yeah, just, I guess my main, I made, I know I went on a little rant here, but my main question is, how would you respond to some of the issues being brought up by, by some of the, by the attorneys representing Harbor Point? Yes, I'll take a first crack at that and then ask Bob, uh, Bob and Bill to weigh in. I, I think you bring up great points about planning. So thank you for um, bringing those up because they've been sort of the crux of my comments tonight. Um, planning is a hugely important issue uh, in every neighborhood and whether when it comes to development or public open space, having thoughtful planning processes that lead to a blueprint driven by the community for what future development could look like is so critical. So from an intergovernmental perspective, um, the, we've already spoken with the BPDA um, to confirm that it's large project review, to confirm that there would be an impact advisory group. They uh, are overseeing the, the thoughtful planning process as it relates to that entire community. And so any development, especially one of this size, would fit into both sort of the micro planning process, which is the large project review and sort of the macro planning process. And then the BPDA has indicated that. So from an intergovernmental relations perspective, um, the actually a filing of plans under Article 80 before the BPDA would drive everything that you're talking about. There is a check and balance in place by the BPDA under the city's permitting process for the size of a project that do it exactly what you're asking for. Um, and so when I said earlier that this is the bottom of the first and a nine inning game, it literally is almost even between innings. It's between the top of the first and the bottom of the first because of the work that will have to go on uh, with the city in terms of the permitting process with the community in terms of the planning process, with the city as part of the overall footprint of the entire surrounding community. That's why a project of this size triggers Article 80, uh, triggers the large project review, and it's specifically why large project review calls for uh, uh, um, guaranteed community input in an impact advisory group. It's part of the reason why we're so excited about the city joining simultaneously with a thoughtful planning process around all the open space around the building. They'll bring in a, a, an outside entity to come in and run that process with the $200,000. No different than say, if they were going to rebuild Almond Park in Mattapan, which when I was a city councilor, the same thing happened. Uh, this huge park in Mattapan was redeveloped. Uh, a planning study of $200,000 or so was implemented. That planning process took a year with the community through charrettes and community meetings. And the final design was agreed upon and only funded after the community through the public process drove it. So you, you're gonna have two simultaneous planning processes, one driven by the city of Boston's capital budget uh, to plan uh, the future public open space and a second public process driven by the BPDA with large project review, with an impact advisory group that will ensure community voice uh, and then sort of the, the, the bigger thoughtful process, which I'm glad you brought up, is how does this fit in to the greater planning that the BPDA is doing in that entire community? You can be assured it will be a part of it. And I would only close by adding, it's one of the reasons we went back out to the community after we received the RFP. That wasn't required. Um, we were required to go out before and hear feedback about what an RFP could look like. We voluntarily went back out the second time to the series of those community meetings last fall and all the way through January so that we could continue to get feedback, let folks see who the respondents were, solicit their feedback so that as they, if we were to award this RFP and this, award the lease rather, we would be informed even more into that process as they dive into the BPDA's public process. We felt it was very important to go back out voluntarily to continue to have that discussion. So the, the, I can assure you that the public process is gonna be vast as this continues forward. Not, not just because Superintendent Brenda Caselli has said to us, we're gonna make sure that the Boston Public Schools are continuing to drive a public process. And the superintendent has said, we're gonna make sure we continue to talk to our students and school leaders and teachers and, and at the McCormick Endeavor and around the surrounding community, but it's mandated by the city through law and through the BPDA's permitting process that it's gonna happen. So there is a significant check and balance in place for all of that. And again, I add that, the city stepping up on an open space planning process is a perfect complement to the larger planning process the BPDA will do. I guess, Rob, if, if I could add to that, to uh, you know, Dr. Rivera, your questions are the types of questions that should be asked. So, so thank you. Those are very good questions. You know, Mr. Consalvo talked about what is required uh, in terms of the community input and the planning process and all that. And so, you know, that that's that's one tack. That's great. That's 
uh, it's a real check and balance. But, you know, with the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, you know, we, you know, it's a part of our core values. We would not, we would not take steps forward without hearing from the community and meeting with the community uh, and, and being a part of those discussions. Uh, that, that's essential to us, uh, you know, and I can assure you that the community will be heard. I think you're right. That community has not been heard um, as they should be over the years. You know, I've seen it firsthand, to be honest with you. Uh, but, you know, I mean, we can tell you for sure that it, that is our intention. We would absolutely live up to that. And, and it, something else you touched on, all the, like, there's a lot of development going on there at the Bayside, Santana. There's a lot, a lot of moving parts, right? Um, but what I've heard from the community at at least one or two of the meetings was that, gee, enough, enough development here. Boy, there's a lot going on. We've had plenty of development. And they, were, they seemed glad to hear that there's, um, I don't know how to word it exactly. It's like we, would, we could create a beating heart in the middle of all that, which is a community center uh, serving the schools in the community. And, and we've heard that kind of loud and clear. And, and um, you know, it's just not, uh, for example, another high rise going up. Uh, it's really something to serve the, the people in that community, particularly the, the students and the families. So I, I don't know if that helps to answer your question, but you know, certainly here at our Boys and Girls Club, community input is essential. Thank you. Do you have anything further, uh, Dr. Rivera? Um, I'll, I'll write some stuff up. <laughs> thank okay. you. All right, thank you, Dr. Rivera. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scannell, for that additional uh, input. Mr. O'Neill, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chia. So um, I'm not going to go to the areas that my fellow members covered because I did have questions about timing, uh, community input. I do recall that when we discussed this before, uh, the school committee very intentionally put on our approval, one that we did want to see a robust community involvement um, project. And we have called out the district several times on that, that it shouldn't just be perfunctory. It shouldn't just be before the RFP. There were concerns about whether the Harbor Point community was involved in the RFP process to begin with. Um, but we also very intentionally said, we want, um, we want something that is for the benefit, first of all, of the Dever and McCormick communities, students, second of all, for other surrounding schools, and then third for surrounding neighborhood. And so, uh, Mr. Gonsalvo, you kind of made my night tonight. I, I have been out and walked the site. So uh, I think it was last January I was in, or this past January, I was at a meeting at the Dever, walked that outside lot um, with the leadership of that school, heard about the flooding, heard about this, this big open backyard of the Deva that effectively is in use so often because of some problems that had happened out in the street. And we have taken that open space away from our students here. They have no outdoor recess space and, um, and for the neighborhood. And then secondly, so hearing that that is gonna be involved in this process is a huge positive for me because we're talking about a couple of hundred yards down the road from this field to the backside of the Deva open space that I trust would not be just for the Deva, but be, could be for the community as well. And, and Mr. Gonzalo, I look forward to your thoughts on that. And the second piece is seeing that you're building some open space into this plan itself onto this parcel versus one big building that takes up every square inch. You know, when I, when I walked the site um, in January, it was about a, a week or about four or five days after a pretty major snowstorm and school was in session. And I went onto that field and there was one set of footprints on the field. So one person had walked it in approximately the four or five days since the snowstorm. And then I walked down that beautiful green parcel, which was all covered with snow, between the various Harbor Point buildings, uh, past the tennis courts, past, um, towards the park at the end. And, you know, it was a typical Boston winter day, which meant that the wind was whistling off the harbor. And yet that park, that beautiful park down at that end, the snow was all trampled down and many people were walking along the waterfront. Um, and I compared that to this land that I understand the concerns of the neighbors about, we always like to have open space, it's dwindling so fast in the city. But if this is an opportunity for this land to be used around the year, and we can ensure that our students at those two schools and as as the student population changes, so people have raised that the Deva McCormick, which is, which is traditional six through eight, is now going to be high school. I'm interested in hearing from Mr. Scannell 
how we can ensure that high school students will have access to it as that becomes a high school, that it's not just a programs for, for very young children. Um, I'm just interested in making sure how we ensure that the conditions we set originally, which are students from the Dever and the McCormick, other surrounding schools, and then the Harbor Point community are gonna have, in effect, first priority um, at these lands. And I'll, so I'll just that. I'll just quickly, Mr. Chair, thank you for bringing up the point of the open space and the uh, $200,000 study. Part of that will address the flooding at the Dever. There is an issue with our most likely our sewer lateral or the lateral that goes from the sewer in the, in the, on the pavement that connects out to the sewer pipe in the middle of the road. Just like your house, you're responsible for the sewer lateral that leaves your property, goes under the sidewalk, goes under the street and connects to the sewer if that should break. It seems we have an issue there that anytime it rains that, that playground put space floods and you are correct, there's no recess. Um, it, it's been an issue and dispute between the two agencies, water and sewer in the city. We'll look to rectify that as part of this project through the study, uh, through the capital, but the city's capital budget. Um, so that's a, a hugely important piece uh, as well. In relation to, I would only add from a legal perspective, we've already, Kathy Lazard is on the call, she can weigh in, but this will always remain DPS property and we will be entering into a lease agreement. Um, so if there was an issue down the line where we felt um, the best use for Boston Public School kids wasn't happening or the school committee had concerns, we always have the right to address that through the lease and work and sit, the, sit down with the, the respondent to address those issues because they're still our property and it's still a lease with us. So we retain the, the right and control over that um, as, as advised by uh, Council Lazat as well. So, but I'd love to turn over to Bob to talk about um, the work with older, well, older youth. But, but before we do, uh, Councillor, um, we do intend upon in the lease having provisions that first priority is for Devon McCormick students, additional priority is for other Boston Public School students in the area, and then also for the residents in the area. First time I did that tonight. I think the RFP spelled that out. And, um, Michael and I, Mr. Uh, Michael and I can show you and give you that information again. Um, but certainly we can work with Kathy Lazard working. When we sit down and write a lease, we'll be working obviously with the respondent um, to make sure that obviously the best interests of Boston Public School kids are always uh, at heart. And their RFP clearly speaks volumes to that, which is why we awarded it a highly advantageous. Uh, there were many different scenarios within the different areas of criteria that we had to evaluate that completely um, talk about the interest of BPS kids. It's the it's the reason why we as a group who reviewed the RP felt we could give it a highly advantageous rating to move forward with school committee based on the commitment that the RFP makes towards um, the, the youth of the city. Had that RFP, the respondents response not indicated the support of the Boston Public Schools and making sure BPS kids were priority. The, it wasn't just me, there was a group who met who will uh, who reviewed the RFP, we wouldn't have rated it and we wouldn't be bringing it forward to you today. Understood. I just want to make sure those provisions are in there going forward. And Mr. Scannell and Mr. Richard and Ms. Santos and the rest of your team who presented today, um, thank you very much for the work that you're doing on this. Uh, Mr. Scannell, if you could just address the issue of um, high school students, please. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, I, I was surprised that someone brought up earlier that we were only serving younger children because at no stage of, of the planning that we've done at this point has, has that been the circumstance at all. From the very start, this was. Uh, going to be built and designed for all ages, including high school. The facility design itself will accommodate high school uh, sports, high school athletes. Uh, and the other thing is it's, um, and Bill had mentioned this earlier, it's, it's an athletic facility, but it, it's more than that. Um, you know, and again, once we get into the planning process with, with the community and, and with the students and with the faculty, we'll get a sense of what, what's needed. Is it a classroom space? Is it arts? Is it music? Is it, uh, is it uh, you know, uh, meeting rooms for the faculty uh, and so forth and so on? Um, so I think, I think I'm really not sure how the issue of it being a younger group came up because at, at no point in time was that, that ever the circumstance. This will accommodate all ages. And the other benefit too, <clears throat> you know, uh, all the students uh, will have access to all of our facilities in addition to this. So when you become a member of Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester, you can go, of course, to the Walter Denny Center across the street from the schools. Uh, you can come to uh, our MAR facility, which has a, a full-size swimming pool and gym and uh, education centers and so forth. You can come to the Paul McLaughlin Center, <clears throat> the 
only a mile away, by the way, uh, just under a mile away uh, from the schools. Uh, Paul McLaughlin Center and, and join in, you know, music lessons, uh, arts, uh, leadership programs. I mean, the list goes on. Because once you get plugged in to, to uh, really our services, the opportunity is substantial. And, you know, what we do for teens, I mean, right now, even, even with the COVID, we're employing uh, 125 teens uh, from the community uh, at our three different sites. And so, you know, these kids have jobs for the summer. They can come here after their job at night while we're open. We're not open as late as we used to be because we can't use transportation with the restrictions, but uh, we're open till eight o'clock at night in the summer for the kids. They have opportunities uh, when things get, get back to normal uh, to go to camps, to go on trips, to visit colleges. There is a massive network and array of programs and opportunities that we can offer high school age and younger kids. This facility would not have uh, early childhood programs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we have programs at, at two of our sites now for infant, preschool, and toddler. Uh, the Denny Center will open a, uh, a toddler and preschool center this coming fall. And uh, there's no intention to put early ed programs in this facility. It's for school age. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and by the way, our membership fees are $5 a year. You know, we talked about inclusion, and we mean that on a lot of levels. Um, and when we say inclusion, it means a lot of different things, and including the fact that we, we want no family to have to consider, you know, any financial burden to belong to our organization. So I, I just uh, share that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Scano. And uh, that concludes your questions, Mr. O'Neill. Okay, thank you. We'll move on now to uh, uh, Vice Chair Oliver Devil. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think uh, a lot of the things I was going to address have been covered, um, so I don't want to be too repetitious, but um, making sure that we do have a deep community process after this will be really important. Um, and I know we keep talking about priority of Boston public school students, which I agree with, but we also have to prioritize um, the young people who live in Harbor Point um, and making sure that they are included in our priority. Um, I'm glad to hear about the cost because that was one of my questions that that that's great. Um, and I do work personally with a lot of boys and girls clubs so I can attest that there is uh, teen programming. We do a lot of work with uh, the music clubhouses. And um, my only uh, other comment is around um, two comments is is the open space piece that um, the community is concerned with. So I think moving forward to have a conversation around what, what that could look like, what are the possibilities. Um, and then lastly, um, hoping um, that, and I believe you do this anyway, but I just want to put on the table um, that uh, would love to see the jobs at Boys and Girls Club uh, employ people from the direct community there. So thank you again for your time. Thank you, Vice Chair. I would just add to your point about the surrounding community. Um, and as part of the development plan is in the evaluation of the comparative criteria, one of the actual objectives set out in section three calls for an end use that will benefit the students of the Boston Public Schools first, the surrounding community and all the residents of the city of Boston. They have to, they would have had to comply with that in the RFP for us to award that as a highly advantageous uh, award uh, ranking and the, which is what we did as a committee because they are they have that in there if I could comment uh, and you brought up a good point about hiring from the community uh, the vast majority of our employees uh, from the community in fact uh, a great deal of our, our staff our program staff and administrative staff and teachers were, were members of the Boys and Girls Club at one point in time well, right now we have uh, we employ about uh, well, over 125 uh, people at our three sites, uh, well over 80% uh, of those are, are people from the community. That, that's very important to us. And, and why wouldn't we? Who knows the neighborhoods better? Who knows the needs better, um, you know, th than people in the community? So uh, you bring up a good point and would be, would be uh, definitely on board. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that it, uh, Vice Chair? All right, very good. Well, um, I just want to close and say, you know, we're very excited to hear about this uh, presentation. Um, thank you for taking the additional time uh, 
uh, Mr. Consalvo and walking us through a reminder of what the uh, community process has looked over uh, the last year plus since the uh, committee took a vote on this. And uh, thank you uh, in particular once again to our co-presenters, Mr. Scannell and Mr. Richard, uh, for walking us through what it is that, uh, what, what the vision is that the Martin Richard Foundation and the um, Boss, uh, Boys and Girls Club at Dorchester has for this parcel. Um, I, I'm really uh, excited to see these drawings come to life, uh, Mr. Tiebler, um, and have a little bit more of an understanding about what this um, uh, facility will mean. And certainly um, what um, uh, the city and the mayor in particular has been able to come up with um, to uh, compensate and um, and uh, respond to the uh, the calls from the community for the preservation of some green space. And you know, Mr. O'Neill, I think your your comments were really on point and um, really helpful in in you know creating a a mental picture of um, what it would mean to have that additional um, greenway um, to stitch together that neighborhood. And I think that's you know at, at the heart of what this project is. It's it's thinking about I think it was Mr. Uh, Mr. Scannell who used the, um, uh, the analogy, creating a beating heart in the middle of this neighborhood that's, I, you know, I think um, been um, treated, a, a, you know, in a, a bit of a disparate way over the years. Um, not, a lot of, a lot of um, parts that don't necessarily fit together. And I, I think this project really looks like it might be um, the piece that might begin to stitch all of that together once again and, and create a real, um, enduring and thriving community on uh, Harbor Point and Columbia Point. Um, so I want to thank you um, for this presentation uh, and we'll look forward to taking uh, action on this uh, proposal at a future meeting. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we'll, we'll get those letters brought over to you tomorrow. And uh, we appreciate uh, everyone's time very much. So we all thank you. Well, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. And thank you again for holding um, uh, holding on with us, you know, this is uh, five hours into our meeting and uh, this is, I'd like to say this isn't uh, normal uh, business for us, but uh, we've had a lot of uh, weighty issues to deal with lately. So um, we thank you in bearing with us in any case. So we hope you have a good night and we'll catch you soon. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, members. Uh, I, uh, we only have one more report. Um, this evening. It's uh, an update from uh, the district on the exam school admissions test RFP process. And um, as many of you have read uh, in the newspaper, um, the, uh, the district has found a new um, exam school administrator uh, after a year long um, proposal process and the development process that went into that. Uh, so we're going to invite forward at this time, Chief of Advancement, uh, Ms. Monica Roberts, and um, who, I'm sorry, I think I might have the titles uh, wrong. Uh, Monica Roberts, who's our BPS Chief of Student, Family and Community Advancement um, to present this update. And uh, the update will be facilitated by um, the superintendent as well. And uh, I believe uh, Ms. Roberts is being joined this evening by um, a number of members uh, on the uh, superintendent's senior team as well as on her own team. Uh, including Devin McCarley, our Senior Director of VPS Welcome Services, Becky Schuster, our Assistant Superintendent of Equity, and Joanne uh, Attain, our VPS School-Based Testing Project Manager. Uh, so ladies, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, um, Chair and members of the School Committee um, for having us here today. Um, we will I'm glad to present an update on our uh, selections process for exam school test. Um, I um, want to start just by providing a little context in terms of um, where we started with a lot of this. So um, as all of you know, the superintendent embarked upon um, a 100-day uh, tour um, and met, had over 102 community meetings, went to every school. And as part of that process, um, was able to really hear from the community. And some of the um, concerns that came up were really about uh, thinking about rigor um, and quality across the high school landscape in the Boston Public Schools. Um, and so um, that led uh, to the district um, and the school committee adopting as part of the strategic plan this um, thought about really redesigning our high schools and, and making sure there was rigorous coursework. And of course, as we think about rigorous coursework, this includes our exam schools. 
and for the district, um, we are thinking about how do we ensure increased access for um, BPS students, and in particular, our Black and Latinx students. I do um, want to note that um, the the selection of a new test is, was part of ongoing work and really what I would say was part of a three-pronged process or um, of approach of the districts um, that uh, this included work around the exam school initiative where we doubled the number of seats um, from 2014 to 2019 to 800. We added a, an extra month this, this year. We um, started in July with remote learning. And then um, last fall, we started school-based testing, increasing the number of students of our BPS sixth graders testing um, by 800. Um, so we had a little over two, 2,100 students tested up from 1,300 in the prior year. Um, as you all know, the contracts for our prior test and test provider was set to expire this June and has expired. Um, we started um, having those conversations during the 2018-2019 school year. And when Dr. Casellas came on um, this, this school, this past school year, we began to having conversations with her about the RFD process um, and began that work in the fall. Um, a lot of the, the goals that we set out in terms of identifying a new test was based on um, what we heard from the community during the, the superintendent's tour, but also previously, I think some of these things the committee has heard as has my department, in particular, looking at a test that is anti-bias, um, that um, assesses students against what they are learning in our schools and is valid for diverse populations. So I'm gonna walk us a little bit through the timeline um, in terms of um, how things progressed. As I um, have already stated that this work really began in fall in 2019 as we started to pull together and move towards um, developing an RFP. The um, RFP development actually took place in the winter of 2019 and early 2020. We had an internal working group, um, with the inter inter interdepartmental working group um, that was pulled together um, and that developed the RFP. Um, as part of this working group, we'll talk a little bit later, we did have a committee that looked, um, that conducted an equity analysis for the process. Um, the RFP was released um, on February 17th um, with the initial deadline of March 19th. As you all know, uh, Boston Public School buildings closed on March 17th. Um, along with, uh, I think that that was a trend that was happening across our nation. So there were a number of um, businesses, including in the education field that were undergoing the same process. Um, so on March 19th, uh, when the bid closed, we did not receive um, any proposals and therefore moved to reissue the RFP that was done on April 20th with the new deadline of May 15th. On May 15th, we received three proposals um, in response to our bid that went out. On June 19th, the uh, RFP Review Committee um, submitted NWEA's uh, proposal as the recommended proposal to move forward with to award a contract. Um, and on July 2nd, uh, the district uh, made a public announcement of this um, through a press release. Just to talk a little bit about the RFP Review Committee, um, there was representation from a number of departments. In particular, we wanted um, to have departments uh, on the committee who could uh, speak to and look at the alignment um, of, of the proposed test with what students should be learning and should know and be able to do at that grade level. Um, the, the accessibility and validity of the test with our special populations, in particular English learners and students with disabilities, um, as well as uh, folks who can look at the operationalization and implementation of a test. Um, I do want to note that the first time around, the, the um, initial process did include an educator, um, but uh, as we moved, moved to doing this work um, remotely, we were unable to um, have as broad of a committee as we um, had hoped to. Uh, four of the members of that committee um, were also on the uh, working group that developed the RFP and participated in the, um, the equity analysis process. Um, the committee, uh, the working group that developed the RFP did, um, did an, uh, use the BPS racial equity planning tool to really apply a racial equity 
lens to the development of the RFP and to make sure that was built in to the, um, the request for proposal itself. Um, and then the four members of uh, that committee were able to then bring that lens to the table um, as they were considering um, making a recommendation for a proposal to move forward with. Yeah. I just want to um, talk a little bit about um, the proposals um, that we received. We'll, uh, I will go quickly over the ones that were not um, selected and then go into more detail in regards to the one that was selected. Um, I again want to highlight here that uh, the, the committee was looking for a test that um, was aligned to the district and state standards and was testing what students should know and be able to do, that um, it was able to be used, um, it had validation across uh, racial, ethnic, linguistic um, identities as well as students with disabilities and that um, it's still assessed for rigor. Um, the two of the proposals, so as the first step in the process is to um, rate the proposal um, based on does it meet the uh, criteria set out in RFP, that's called the technical review. Um, that piece was conducted, uh, one was deemed not advantageous, um, and then two of those were deemed to be advantageous, uh, one of them being the one that was selected. Um, the one that was not advantageous, again, it's because it did not meet all the criteria set out in the RFP. Um, the two then that were deemed to be advantageous then were reviewed by the, the team um, with the consideration for racial equity and access, as well as um, the strength of their curriculum standards alignment. Uh, the one that was more robust was the one that was selected, that is the NWEA's um, Measures of Academic Progress Growth Assessment, or the MAP test. Um, so that was that had a, a much more robust evidence of um, anti-bias and, and, uh, and standards alignment. The second part of the process is then priced. Um, we do not, the, the, that is done se second, so that it does not impact the assessment um, of, of a proposal in terms of quality. And so those were received secondly. We did identify that the um, application that was already rated not advantageous also significantly exceeded the, the district's testing budget. So now I'm going to move and talk about the test that the uh, committee did recommend, which is the uh, measures of academic progress growth assessment, and I will refer that to as to that as the MAP test. Um, the MAP test is a test that BPS students are um, familiar with. It is currently used in BPS schools as a formative assessment. It is computer-based, so our students take it online on time so that they are able to really um, have the time they need to um, take the test. Um, we, they were able to offer it in all the um, subjects that we need, um, and uh, we'll talk also later that they provide the test in Spanish, and um, obviously uh, what was helpful too the, um, the um, test is within the district's budget in terms of their price proposal. So just moving to um, the various areas that we were looking at in terms of alignment, um, the NWEA is a test that's given um, across many districts and many states. Obviously it's here in Massachusetts because Boston Public, is using, Public Schools is using it as a formative test. They have a very robust what we call item bank or a set of questions, a pool of questions to draw from. Um, and in each of the states in which they operate, they do the work of aligning um, their assessment to state standards. And they also look at district standards in Boston Public Schools. Our curriculum is aligned to state standards. And so um, that, that is kind of intertwined. Um, and they have a process of really going to do an item by item review to ensure that um, that the alignment is there, that it's accurate and valid. Um, they leverage outside expertise to, to um, undergo this process. One of the other reasons um, that we highlighted that the test was selected was that the, um, the NWA um, submitted um, evidence of um, anti-bias. Um, so they submitted their process for bias review, which includes both sensitivity and fairness. Sensitivity in this context is an awareness of the different things that can distract the student during assessment. And fairness um, relates to giving each student equal opportunity to answer the item correctly based solely on their knowledge of the item content. So any sensitivity and fairness issues found in the item based on the process that they submitted are eliminated either in revision or rejection of the item. Um, 
Each item is evaluated to a set of criteria if flagged, um, for example, if it requires prior knowledge other than a skill or concept that should be assessed and should have been learned by the student, um, if it has cultural bias, linguistic bias, socioeconomic bias, um, religious or geographic bias, um, I can continue, um, or uh, stereotypes that could be offensive um, to students or inappropriate or insensitive topics that could distract, upset, or confuse a student, then they are eliminated. They also submitted the, um, the findings from their differential item functioning statistical analysis. Um, which they call DIFF, um, and this is used to assess whether uh, test items are fair to students in different um, subgroups. So this is really looking um, at equity. Um, when students with the same ability from different subgroups of interest have different probabilities of correcting an answer, um, answering an item, then the item is said to exhibit a DIFF. Um, and uh, the, this is a characteristic that indicates that the question or test item might lack fairness. Um, and then those items um, are removed. Based on the study that was shared with us, um, the, uh, MAP, the MAP test um, has very rare, and has had very rare instances of an item um, demonstrating diff as it relates to gender, ethnicity, or race, or, or a language. So lastly, um, the DIF, the uh, MAP test has accommodations that we believe will be um, helpful to our students and particularly our English learners and students with disabilities. We we're very pleased to find that the assessment is available in Spanish. We know that that is the largest um, uh, language population in our district. Um, we also found that they had other tools that were built in um, that we are often providing as a district as um, accommodations such as calculators or um, they're doing text-to-speak where we might have a, someone read to a student um, or line guides to help students stay on track as they're reading. So they had a lot of support for students um, that will um, help them as they're taking the test. Um, again, I, I think it's important to note that the, um, the MAP test, is, we are not taking a test that has not been used for this purpose. Um, the, the MAP test is currently being given by other districts for selective um, enrollment and admissions in other districts. Um, we just named three here. This is not an exhaustive list, but just to note that um, it is, this test is currently being used in that way. Now I just want to just give a, a, glimpse, a glimpse of a couple of test items so that uh, folks have a sense of what it might look like. Um, the, the test company does have a practice test available on their website. It does not have, it's not a full test, um, but it does provide an opportunity for families to really be able to, um, and students to be able to understand um, the test environment and get a sense of the sort of questions that they will have. So here you have a, a sample sixth grade ELA test um, where students will be able to read through a paragraph. Um, they're asked to identify the incorrect pronoun and they'll be able to do a drag and drop. The second one is a sixth grade reading test and we, select six, we selected sixth grade uh, in particular because that's our largest testing group um, where students are asked to read a passage and then to um, make an inference to infer what the meaning of a word might be um, and so this is a mix of a drag in drop in multiple choice and then lastly uh, this is an example of a sixth grade math um, item where students would have to do some computation and, and make a selection in terms of um, what they thought the answer would be um, I do want to note um, that we, we do believe that choosing a test that is aligned to what our students are learning um, ba based on both the district and state curriculum standards um, that is explicitly anti-bias and, explicitly anti -bias and doing, doing so we expect to see increases in the number of Black and Latinx students admitted into our um, exam schools. Um, we were very pleased with the, the growth in terms of test takers, but now we really need to be moving to ensure that students are, um, that we're boosting our admittance rates. Um, so we believe that this is a step that pulls us in that direction. Um, as we're thinking about um, fall test considerations, um, we have gotten feedback from family and community members. You've heard some of that tonight. Um, there are lots of concerns about how families will prepare for the test. Um, I do want to note that one of the 
reason stop me selected a test that was um, standards aligned and is testing what students are learning is so that um, every student has the same opportunity and access um, because they're 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 getting tested on what they learn that said there will be some materials available but um, we were moving away from a test that um, benefits or um, may inequitably benefit folks who have access to test preparation services. Um, families have also expressed concern about how um, COVID may have impacted students this year and what that then means for next year. Um, and as a district, in addition to um, what I've already stated about understanding the value of the test, we have been thinking about um, how we begin to address potential barriers in light of um, public health guidelines if we are if we are to move forward with testing um, and uh, any pivoting that we might need to do um, given that the, the in this current context things are consistently changing. So with that I am going to turn it over to Dr. Castello who's going to talk about um, the next step that she is recommending. Great. Thank you so much, Monica, for the RFP process and for doing um, such a great job and thanks to the team as well. Um, so again, we are going to be um, addressing this by launching a superintendent's working group um, that will make recommendations on exam school admissions for this 2021 school year. Uh, we have uh, know that we are in COVID right now and we know that students uh, have different access to different um, opportunities. And I think that we need to uh, really discuss that as a community. And so I wanted to be able to put together a working group. Membership will be three exam school leaders, and then we will invite community members to that, um, to that group. Um, we will make those, those members public. And the process is going to be, we will uh, provide recommendations uh, that will come to the superintendent in September. This working group will do their work. We'll have it facilitated. Um, then I will make recommendations to the school committee. And then the school, school committee will hear those recommendations and uh, they will then take a vote on the policy. So with that, I would take questions. All right, well, thank you, uh, Monica, for uh, walking us through um, that uh, arduous and, and year-long work that uh, the district has undertaken. And I uh, really want to uh, just stop and, and say thanks to uh, you and your team for working on this. Um, we know uh, a lot of work went into it, a lot of um, years of reports and, and community comment around uh, exam school admissions and, ex and uh, explicitly the test. Um, that uh, went into uh, the considerations about how to go out and find ourselves a new and better test that's attuned to the needs of the district. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that you took the time to walk us through uh, what that process entailed and, and how we got to the outcome uh, where we're at. Uh, thank you as well to the superintendent um, for um, asking a uh, working group, uh, as you've heard from uh, the members here, as well as uh, members of the public, um, we obviously have deep concerns about uh, the effects uh, in this age of COVID and um, specifically uh, the, uh, the remote learning um, environment that we were in in the spring and what effect that has on the traditional criteria that are considered in the exam schools uh, admissions process each year. So we know we need to do exam school admissions different this year because of what's happened in COVID. And so uh, that working group is going to be um, an immense help in um, working through those issues and giving us a studied recommendation on how we can proceed. Uh, we're asking that, uh, as you mentioned, you've uh, extended invites. We're not ready to uh, announce those names just yet until we have those folks confirmed. Um, but we want uh, representative community members uh, to assist us in making this determination. And we certainly want uh, the leaders of uh, the exam schools, those um, uh, leaders that are closest to our students uh, and closest to uh, the schools that um, we're seeking to uh, improve through uh, this process um, to be a part of that process. Um, and we want, and, and this is an ambitious timeline, we're, we're asking this group to work very quickly and come back to us with uh, propo a proposal in September uh, so that we can make it clear to the uh, community uh, what steps we will take for 
the admissions process in this upcoming year. Um, so uh, I don't want to take up all this time. Um, I, I certainly want to come back and add my own thoughts here, but I want to open up the floor now to uh, members for questions and discussion. So if folks could raise their hand, I'd certainly like to entertain um, uh, a wealth of input here from the members. Okay, it looks like uh, a literal raised hand from uh, Dr. Rivera. So we'll start with you. Um, so, so I just had some questions about how, um, what does this mean for the test and the contract with this vendor at this moment? And, you know, does this mean this doesn't go forward with this particular vendor and uh, there's a pause? I'm just not clear what, like, having this working group means in terms of the, um, the actual test. I don't know if my question is clear. Well, maybe I can jump in on that because um, we've been having a lot of discussions about this. And um, it, I, I want to make clear that, you know, we're asking for a process. I understand that there are a lot of charged um, uh, uh, opinions on this uh, issue and specifically the test right now and specifically in this year. And we understand it. I mean, you know, I, I want to say we all taking a step back, all we want is the best outcomes for our students. And we understand that kids are um, facing very big hurdles because of the, uh, the current environment that we're in. And those hurdles existed prior to COVID. You know, let's, let's make no mistake about it. Um, but those hurdles were something that's been addressed for exam school admissions through a number of steps that we've made over the years. The expansion of the exam school initiative, uh, the expansion of in-school testing. Um, all of these efforts are made to um, increase access uh, to the opportunity to participate in exam school education. So where we find ourselves today is we have a new uh, crisis uh, upon us with COVID. We understand that there are uh, folks calling for a suspension of the test, but we're a process-oriented uh, body. We're a policy-making body, and we want to make that decision with the best information available to us. And that's what we're calling on this working group to do. We want this working group to take a look at what the criteria is that we tr uh, traditionally utilize in the decision-making process for admissions to the exam schools. Take a look at what has been affected by COVID. We know specifically that the grades that are traditionally um, uh, considered during the admissions process for uh, rising sixth graders, and that's specifically their fifth grade, second quarter, uh, excuse me, um, second half uh, grades, um, yeah, as part of the um, um, the criteria that's uh, that's that's judged uh, in the admissions process, we know that those aren't uh, what they normally are because we had a pass fail system in in the uh, in the spring, and so we know that we need to make a one year change here to um, to address those uh, those issues, and we know that there are other inequities out there. So, you know, what we're asking this working group to do is take into account all of the issues that have arisen in this age of COVID and come back to us with a recommendation. We don't need to make this decision tonight. We don't need to make this decision at the next meeting. We need to make an informed decision and we've asked the community to give us that input. So does that help uh, give you context about what we're asking this group to do? Um, yes, I, I, that's very helpful and I appreciate that. Um, so, but I'm still wondering then if we're, are we putting a pause or not in the in the development of this test and like spending any fund, you know, continue like I'm just thinking the funding that we may be spending on hiring and creating this test could potentially be used. Those resources could they be redirected at this point? Um, just really you know, wanting to know, um, it's, there's the, what if, you know, if the working group will, would recommend suspending the test, what would that mean? Um, how would that be different from, or again, it, how does also the OAG's recommendations for suspending the test, um, 
how is that factoring into the working group? Are they going to be a part of the work? Are there going to be some members that um, would be in common there? Just trying to understand all the this debate because right. we get a lot of questions about this. So again, the working group we're asking to work on this quickly. We're asking for an answer and a recommendation in September. That'll be here before we know it. We know we heard a little bit earlier this evening that it's 50 days till the start of school and that's September 10th. We're asking this uh, group to work very quickly to give us recommendations. We don't need to make this decision tonight. I would suggest, I would um, ask the superintendent to answer this question and perhaps Monica might have an answer as well on your question uh, surrounding the issue of uh, the expenditure of any funds. I'm not aware of anything other than signing the contract uh, that would be an additional uh, staffing issue or, or cost, but um, perhaps Brenda or Monica, you can. Uh, I can answer that question, please. So um, we do have we do have a contract, and I think if we were we have not um, done a purchase order of sorts yet, so we have not yet made a dollar commitment in that regard. If there were a pause of the test, we would um, and we were not given a test for this year, you would just not give it for this year, and then you'd have two years left in your contract, but your contract would still end um, at the time that, um, that that was set out. So it's still end within three years, even if you didn't start your work in, the, in, your, in this first year. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that timeline and, and at least that information and appreciate there's a working group and we'll have some recommendations by September. I'm, I'm relieved to hear that, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Anything further? Uh, we'll go now to uh, Dr. Coleman. Thank you. I, I want to start by thanking Ms. Roberts and, and the superintendent for following through in a thoughtful, systematic way to uh, complete the charge that they were given, which was we would let it go one exam that we thought was inequitable and uh, inappropriate and wasn't meeting the needs of our students. They were charged to find one that would do a better job fulfilling the policies, our existing policies. And I want to congratulate them on following through on that. And, and the description of, of the um, exam that you found seems reasonable given that the, the charge you, you, that was presented before you. You know, I do then, then the whole issue of in this moment, in this pandemic, how, uh, um, is it is it fair and equitable to give any exams in this time of trauma? And I appreciate that uh, the uh, the creation of a committee who will thoughtfully take this issue on. I, I agree with the chair. You know, the the I I actually am the one who uh, submitted the minute to the uh, opportunity achievement task force, saying this would be a moment. We were talking about this would be a moment to reconsider and I appreciate the fact that that's being taken seriously and moving forward. And so I'm looking forward to the recommendation that the committee would give. I would like to see, you know, written form, the charge that they're given, um, just so I gotta get a, get a stronger sense, you know, when we have a lot of, you know, uh, words about what, what the actual charge that they will be fulfilling. And I hope that uh, is really focused on what is a, what is an, what is a useful way to make an assessment in Boston of a child's preparation to be successful in a academically rigorous context? And how do we do that in a way that's fair for all possible students in, in, our, in our community? So I'm looking forward to that, to that outcome. Um, I totally understand why the exam school uh, heads would be part of such a committee but I would also advocate for the consideration of a non-exam school head who, who is dealing with students who, who's also running a school with a uh, high, high demand, rigorous academic program that is oriented towards a uh, four-year college, producing people for four-year college, who doesn't have the same type of curated population that we provide in our exam school so that they, so they have a different perspective. Um, in that moment, so I would, I would appreciate that and recommend that. And I'd also like to hear not if you have it right now, that's great. But if not, I would like to hear subsequently, what are the characteristics and qualities of the other members of that committee 
that you're searching for. I don't need to know the names. Um, and particularly with, helpful if we think we have people that we may want to recommend to sit on that committee um, 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 because we, we know they've kind of grappled with these issues and thought about them and have some alternative ideas for thinking about how to um, uh, assess students for the exam schools in general and then also in this particular moment. So th th those would be the uh, comments about the committee. I appreciate that doing it. I think it's a reasonable choice. Uh, we, we don't want to do anything quickly and un un unreasonably. Um, I'm not sure if now, you know, I, I think I want to re reiterate what many of you know is that I would pass this moment as we start thinking about the high school redesign process and how our high school should be structured to eliminate achievement opportunity gaps. And I, I would advocate not right now, not this month, but we start thinking seriously about is there some kind of review we can give that's a community that not unlike an external advisory committee, not unlike this special planning committee to really think through how we assign our children to exams to, to secondary schools in Boston. And do we do it in such a way that facilitates the closing of opportunity and achievement gaps across the city? So I'm trying, you know, so I think, you know, I think we've heard commentary early, early from the community who see uh, there, there are some people who hypothesize that the exam schools are best schools, which part of makes us a good district. And this is a wonderful opportunity that we create for people and others who would point to say that it has a toxic impact on our ability to close the achievement gap and provide opportunities for all children. And I, I think we should, I think this is a time in, in our district, in our, in our city, and, in, and frankly, in our society where the, we, could, we could take that question on in a thoughtful, reasonable uh, manner that would allow us to come to a greater community consensus as to the function of these schools in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, Superintendent, um, maybe you can help me um, just uh, refresh my memory. I, uh, uh, Dr. Coleman asked a question about the composition of the group. And um, uh, I, I believe when we discussed this earlier, uh, the idea was uh, certainly the three uh, heads of school from each of the uh, existing exam schools uh, were being invited. And you have invites out to others. If I recall, there's a, a parent uh, and there are a couple of other uh, community group um, representatives that have been active in this process, right? Yeah, there's, I, I don't want to give too much, but there are folks who have been working on this issue who I would be inviting. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for your comments, Dr. Coleman. I'm sorry. And, and, and I still advocate to considering having a, a non-exam school head in that group. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Uh, I believe uh, Ms. Robinson, you had a comment. Yes, um, thank you. Um, as a Latin school graduate back in the day when there was no test, um, I'm not sure, Mr. O'Neill, whether you took a test when you had to enter or not. Um, many people were able to be successful based on the grades that they had had from the fifth and sixth grade. My question is, if we've already used the NWEA test previously with our students, do we not have data that the current, the on the rising sixth graders may have already taken a test of theirs in the fourth or fifth grade? And if so, why would we not use those existing grades, um, scores as part of a plan so that we would not need to have students take another test at this moment in time. Um, you also talked about the fact that we've done other um, means to supposedly increase the number of young people that get invited to the exam schools through um, excellence for all and maybe the in-school testing, but to date we've not seen any results that to see whether either or not either of those efforts have been successful to date. So it feels like we're still having a conversation about processes, but we're not really ever coming back to look at the outcomes of our processes today to see whether any of those things have made a difference. Um, so, you know, if, there, if, if we don't believe the grades that they are receiving 
in their classes and a recommendation from their sixth grade teacher wouldn't be good enough um, today, why not? Um, because I'm still waiting to see some evidence that our efforts to date have really clearly made a difference and we have no, we have no evidence. So it just feels like we're, we're, we're delaying the inevitable again. And yes, in a year when school is fine, if we wanna have this conversation, that makes sense. But the, but the question um, that everybody has been saying, why, why are we belaboring this on the backs of 10, 11, 12 year olds when colleges aren't using tests and other things this year. I, I, I don't get what the issue is about this particular year. Um, yes, I feel like that we do need to have a group take a look at it, but the question is, you know, why, why are people so afraid? What are we afraid of um, that we have to go through all of this? Are we afraid a few black and brown children might take the, way, the, the, the seat of a quotes better deserving white child, what is it? You know, the, we don't have the numbers. I don't, I, I don't really understand what we're going to accomplish by delaying, you know, to, to, to make a statement that says, yes, we will use some other factors for this one year and really take this under advisement to really figure out, do we really wanna have a fair and equitable way? because it hasn't changed in over 50 years. I found some papers that I will send to all of you that talked in 1970 about a black education convention in Boston and gave the, and gave the demographics of the district. You know, there were over 90,000 kids at that time and maybe approximately the same number of black students in the 90,000 district that we have now. And the Latin school, um, percentages were no different when we had 90,000 kids. So, you know, we're not really doing better. And so this to me just feels like yet another smoke and mirrors issue that we will go through an effort. The outcome won't be any different. Ms. Robinson, you know, again, I, I think, um, you know, what I will reiterate is we're asking this working group to work quickly and to evaluate mm -hmm. what are those issues out there right. that we can take into account in the admissions process to change the criteria or to amend the criteria or change the weights of the criteria that we have there right now. And we know that we have other models out there. There are models out there that have passed muster, passed legal muster in other mm -hmm. districts that, in, um, that include different types of measures of uh, students' mm -hmm. um, qualifications for uh, their, uh, the exam mm -hmm. schools and the uh, restricted admission schools in those jurisdictions. And so we want mm -hmm. this group, we've all heard about them, you know, they've been in all of these reports that have criticized uh, the existing exam school uh, admissions process. And so we want to mm -hmm. have those be mm -hmm. part of this discussion. We want people that are involved in Boston and understand uh, what it means uh, to recreate to create the education that we have in these three schools uh, to to weigh in on what they believe is the next best uh, criteria for evaluating what students are going to succeed in these schools if the recommendation comes back from the group that we not use the test in this year will that be able to be an acceptable outcome to this body we will see and and that is uh, you know that is what uh, that's the only thing I'm asking of this committee and of this community is that we enter this with an open mind. You know, I'm, I have, I have been, um, I'll be frank, I've been disappointed that, you know, people have approached this in a very positional way. Um, the idea that we need to ditch the test here this year as part of this admissions process, I think is putting the cart before the horse, quite frankly. You know, we're trying to, engage in a thoughtful conversation and have an informed discussion about what it means to change something that's been in place for decades for the criteria that we use to admit students to these three schools. That's monumental, you know, and that's, we have to get it right. We have to get it right for our kids and we have to get it right for our kids in this moment. And so I don't want to have a knee jerk reaction. I don't want to take action just to make change. 
I want to make enduring change. I want to make change that means something and change that takes into account what, and I'm speaking for myself, of course. I mean, others can, you know, feel free to uh, feel differently, but I, I want to, you know, I want to make clear that the work that we're doing here, we have to get it right. We have to get it right so that we honor the efforts of our, our children. We, we honor the, the attributes of our children, the, uh, the potential of our kids, and make sure that the kids that want to be in these schools and deserve to be in these schools are in these schools. And I think it's time that we made some change. And I want to be informed about that. I want a, a group to focus on this work and give us those recommendations so that we can move forward fully informed in an appropriate manner. Mr. O'Neill, you had uh, uh, your hand up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and what a powerful conversation. Um, Ms. Robinson, to answer your question, uh, yes, I did take a test. And um, I also recognize I was the beneficiary system that was set up for me to succeed in that test. And that's uh, probably an opportunity, even though I was in a Boston public school at the time, that's probably an opportunity that a lot of my peers in other Boston public schools didn't have. And we're in a different time now, I understand that. So uh, this conversation is important and it's powerful and it should be ongoing. Um, I'm thankful to the members of the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force for the recommendations. You know, this is what we have the task forces for, and it's this, it's the ELL, it's inclusion, it's the, the group who worked on school quality, it's the group that worked on assignment plan. You know, we often accept uh, the recommendations, and sometimes we don't, but they are designed to uh, push our thinking and push our conversations. And I think it was a thoughtful question that was raised. I second what Dr. Coleman said, which is that the superintendent and her team did what we asked her to do. So when the superintendent first joined, she looked at the existing process for admissions for our selective admission schools. That at that point is binary. It is a test and it's GPA, both of which we feel um, are failing Boston public school students to give them an equal opportunity as private and parochial school students who we all know are also residents of the city of the Boston and have the right to attend our schools. Um, but we didn't want our students, our students, those who are with us in K through six to not have equal opportunity. And so the superintendent has been looking at how GPA is put together. She also decided to put the test out and find a new test provider, one that was um, a lot more uh, aligned to our curriculum, was anti-bias, et cetera. And as Dr. Coleman said, the superintendent did exactly what we asked her to do. And in a normal environment, I would be applauding the results and thanking her. And I am aware of NWEA and their work in other districts. And as uh, Ms. Roberts, point, Roberts pointed out, um, they are involved in the admissions criteria for selective admission schools in Kansas City and in Chicago and in Nashville uh, using the assessments, the formative assessments like, like our students are already taking. I also uh, believe though that they feel that um, we should not be making a binary choice that, that it's of strictly exam and GPA, but we should at a minimum, minimum triangulate if not have more criteria. And so my answer back to you, Ms. Robinson would be, you know, what's changed and what's different? You know, it, it would be, easy, it would be a tough vote, but it would be easy as well for, for this body to simply say, yeah, we're not gonna have an exam this year. But that doesn't answer the question of, but are we, what are we gonna have? We are still gonna have students applying for all three of our selective admission schools. They still wanna know what the criteria is going to be. And whether we have a test or whether we don't have a test, we still need a, a comprehensive answer to that. And I would, hesitate to see this body trying to hash it out at this table. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm applauding uh, the superintendent's decision to, you know, she's got a lot of it on plate right now, right? 50 days yeah. till school's opening. We're asking her and her team to concentrate 100% on that. So the fact that she's saying, hey, let me put together a working group of, yes, the selective admission school leaders in there, but also other folks that will bring a diverse range of viewpoints in. I'm hoping it's gonna be research-based and academic-based 
and it's going to look at the full range of what should be the emission criteria in the coming year in light of what's going on at COVID, in light of uh, the injustices that you know, uh, continue to be exposed more and more that we are all committed to overcoming. And so I'm okay with, as much as I'm chomping at the bit to get to an answer, I'm okay with pausing, having a group look at this seriously, academically based, research based, and come back to us with some best practices. There are, we're not the only district in the country that is struggling with this for their selective admission school. So Buffalo, Chicago, you know, as we talked about Nashville, Kansas City, New York City, where a test is mandated by the state. Uh, this, is, this is an issue that there is some commonality across the country and we are all struggling with, is there bias in the exams? Do exams really predict future yes. behavior mm -hmm. or are there other ways that um, mm -hmm. we, could, we could do this? So my mind is open to hear the results of this. And, and I personally like the idea better of the superintendent putting together a separate group so she can concentrate on opening schools, come back to her with a recommendation and she comes to us because I also trust that the superintendent really gets the issues that we're struggling with here and um, is not afraid of change. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing as I say that, but I think as we have seen in the superintendent to date, she's not afraid of, of change, particularly if she feels it's in the best interest of our district. So um, I am open to hearing uh, new solutions that would come out of this working group. And I, I think it's a thoughtful way for us to approach this versus trying to just come to a decision right here. And I think it's also a way to acknowledge that we are hearing the voices that have been raised to us from across the city. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I wanna to say to Mr. Lopez, who spoke earlier in the, um, uh, during the Commons period, thank you for reminding us in a city that, that prides itself on our history, thank you for reminding us, Mr. Lopez, that maybe the history on, on exams isn't quite as long and, and uh, schools have been successful in a variety of ways of doing this. So. I actually heard those comments he was making and I might thank him for it, but I think it would be a great idea to have a working group, look at this seriously, make the recommendation to the superintendent and have her come back to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, uh, thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, before we go to the vice chair, I believe um, Dr. Coleman had one uh, brief additional question um, for uh, the superintendent and Ms. Roberts. Yeah, yeah, sorry, um, uh, Ms. Robinson reminded me of my question. So since we do give this exam in our, to our students in, as a form of assessment, have we done the equity of analysis of our own existing data? Mm -hmm. we, we know how our kids performance test and have, I know that it's looked elsewhere, but have we done it and looked at what it looks like in our actual city? It's a question, if you have yeah. it, great. If you yeah. haven't, let you know. Dr. Hardin, when I first came, I had them look at um, NWA, I had them look at the MCAS, um, but I don't know that they've done that analysis uh, most recently with this year's data. Do you know, Monica, if they've looked at it at all? I don't believe so. Um, and I, I do want to flag that the current test is used in the formative, as a formative assessment, and we'd be shifting how we were using the test if we were using it for selective admission. So it would be a slightly um, slight shift in process. Yeah, but so so I'm not making an evaluation. I went. I, we're not making an evaluation for individual kids, so we're not saying it, it, to, to look at the pattern, do, to do a psychometric test to see whether the, whatever way they test for anti bias and whether if they demonstrate that actually um, uh, our kids across the our, our demographic and cultural and linguistic groups. How do they perform as groups, not as individuals on the formative, give us some sense of what it would do when it's used as a, as a um, uh, criterion reference test? Yeah, we do have that. So we do have where they're looking at the uh, bias nature of the test and disaggregate the data and the results of the test. Um, and probably Joanne could probably speak to that better than all of us, right? Or, and, and a quick little report, not now, that, that don't have to bring it right now, but just a, a paragraph, quick memo as to what the results are in the city. It'd be helpful to understand the way this test works with our kids. 
I have a feeling, Dr. Coleman, that there will be a lot of information that will be shared with the working group and that we will have to probably chronicle that information for our record uh, on the testimony and what is um, shared. So I think we're gonna have to have that. So uh, that will be matter of public record, I'm sure after we finish our working product. Thanks. Thank you for that, Dr. Coleman. Uh, we'll go to the vice chair. Thank you, chair. Uh, thank you, Monica, for your uh, report. And uh, I, I just agree with uh, some of the comments before. We did task the superintendent to find us a new test. So I do appreciate, um, you know, the, the thoroughness and looking at it. I would be curious, and you don't have to answer me right now. You can just send me something after. Um, I did you know, look online in terms of reviews of ease of use, using this um, test. And I found some good reviews also in some other settings. I've also heard some not positive reviews. So I'd just be really curious about the reviews of this particular test. Um, and would just wanna also put out for the future, um, you know, if this test doesn't work and we'd have to give it some time, obviously I would just want us to reevaluate um, but um, I did also take the test to Latin and I got in and I only went for one day and I got kicked out, which, which is, is a good thing for Boston Latin that I didn't end up going there. Um, that, that should tell you, don't put a lot of stock uh, in terms of who goes there, right? Just kidding, Michael O'Neill. Um, so I wanted to say uh, that I really um, liked the Spanish, that this is in Spanish. So that was really important um, when I was looking at the deck, I didn't see that. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm going to um, just out myself like as a bad mom right now. And hopefully there's only like a hundred people left watching us, but um, my, you know, my daughter is in fifth grade and she um, had a really rough remote time and ended up owing like 50 assignments, which I checked in with her every day and she would tell me, oh, I turned it in, we're all set. You know, and I, I'm on my computer. I think I can get around, you know, but obviously I, I did not know how to get around Google Classroom. I had no idea, you know, that you could do, look at the to-do list, like what was turned in, I was totally clueless. So um, myself and her teacher, you know, got together and she, showed me after how to like use it. Um, so I was able to like be more on top of that. But when I think of, you know, her, um, you know, as a fifth grader, like thinking about, um, you know, trying to get into an exam school, like I worry, you know, her, her second quarter is, is really, really terrible. And I think other families worry about that as well. So I do really appreciate that there would be committee that would really take a, a hard look at this and come up with some other alternatives um, because if we're saying no test and I'm and I'm not I'm not protest either I'm not anti-test but I do think that um, if we were to say no test I would worry about other families like myself who've had this really terrible year and so they'd be totally knocked out of this um, and then the other thing you know and like in full disclosure She's also part of the exam school initiative. So there's a lot of families. We've all been part of like doing double time. So my daughter's in a summer camp in the morning and then in the afternoon, she's doing the exam school initiative. So she's doing like a lot of work. And so I wanna make sure, you know, whatever decisions are made by that committee. And I, entr I trust that committee because we're gonna be bringing people that know their stuff, who understand the context, who are gonna be looking at the complexities of this, but somehow, um, you know, for those exams, and I know I know it's been but I'm just thinking of other families too, who really like put in that time and those students have put in the work we also like the committee around being a Boston public school student and, uh, you know, taking that into to account. And then I know- Alex, this I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt Vice Chair, but um, I, you were breaking up on my computer uh, for the last like 15 seconds or so. And I, I just want to make sure that we capture everything that you said. So would you mind repeating uh, what you were just saying? Sure. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, um, I think I was saying that, um, 
it's, you know, I trust the committee to do their work um, because I think we're gonna, going to have representation of people that understand the complexities um, and will have information to make, you know, good decisions. And I, I just would hope um, for the future that we could also look at um, having more weights for Boston public school students. Um, and the last thing I'll say, I know it's future, but I'm just gonna say it anyway, is we talk so much about getting into these schools, we don't talk about getting through. And so there's so many students that get in, but they're completely lost. And so I would wanna also just, and I know that's, that's future oriented, but I do wanna say I support having a committee to take a deeper look so that, so that we're doing, uh, like Mr. O'Neill said, I think it has to be thoughtful a thoughtful process with information uh, because I think, you know, what we've seen in the last just, you know, this year is like if we're, once we move too fast, there's a lot of unintended consequences. And I, I don't think we want to, we want to have those. We want to like really have a thoughtful process. So thank you. Thank you once again, Vice Chair, for for your comments here. And um, I didn't know you were kicked out of Latin on your first day. You know, you and uh, you and John King apparently have something in common. I don't think he was kicked out of Latin, but in, I know uh, I listened to his graduation speech on Channel Five uh, last month, and he talked about being uh, kicked out of high school. So um, yeah, it's uh, apparently a mark of uh, future achievement. Um, okay, well, I, I I repeated seventh grade. <laughs> I feel like I'm underachieving now, geez. Um, but um, in any case, I, um, I really wanna thank the, uh, the committee. Um, uh, we've had a lot of one-to-one -one conversations over the last week and um, you know, this is about the, the most engaged um, that all of us have been um, individually in a while on an issue. And um, I, I wanna thank you all for your um, uh, seeing this process through. Um, first and foremost. Um, and I want to thank the, the superintendent for pushing on this issue. You know, again, this is an issue that um, is at the core of the equity work that we hired her to do, uh, that the community selected her to do. Um, it wasn't just us. It wasn't just the mayor. Um, this uh, superintendent was the consensus selection of uh, the community. Um, and, you know, the, the reason we, we made that selection, I believe, was we talked a little bit earlier about building trust, but how do you build trust? You make things accessible. You make things authentic. You, make, uh, you create transparent processes. You communicate. And part and parcel of all of that is doing the work that supports the statements that we make. And we've got that strategic plan out there that talks about breaking down opportunity and achievement gaps. And the work that we're doing here, the work that we're trying to do here is trying to make sure that the gaps that have been created through over the last six months don't further widen and don't further um, put the students that are being affected by those widening gaps at a further disadvantage to their um, better off peers. And so, you know, that work doesn't come easily. And, you know, if there was a, if there was a silver bullet or a magic wand to, to, uh, to remedy those problems, we would have done it by now, um, but there's not. You know, all of these issues are complex. They're interrelated. They require thought and they require consideration. And that's why I'm thankful that the superintendent, um, who, as many of us have noted, has a lot on her plate right now and a singular focus to get those schools open 50 days from now, um, has had the foresight to put together this group and to work on what uh, solutions are out there and give us a recommendation about what we can do um, to fix this issue and make these schools more accessible and more responsive to the students in our, um, in our schools and outside of our schools, the students in our city. Um, so I'm, hope, I'm thankful and I'm hopeful for this working group. Again, it's a, it's a tall order. This is, thir this is somewhere around 60 days that we're asking these folks to come back and, and essentially um, give us a recommendation on changing a, a process that's been in place for decades. Um, but we have the urgency, we have the need, and we have the knowledge base out there. We have experts in this city, 
We have experts in this district. We have people that have talked that have created reams of paper that have talked about this issue. And so we need to harness that and we need to turn that into the um, informed action that we will take in service of our students. And I want to take a step back and just think once more, you know, we, we started this presentation that, you know, in normal times would have been a celebration because we would, this is um, the achievement of a new test here that's responsive on a number of levels to what the community concerns have been about the exam um, should, have, should have been in normal times a, a momentous occasion. We went out and got ourselves a test that was custom made. It was bias tested. It was created to be uh, to meet the Massachusetts curriculum standards. It ensures that it measures growth. It's untimed. It's given online. You know, the, the, we couldn't have ordered up a better test um, to meet the needs of this district. Um, and so I want to thank uh, once again and write, raise up the work of the, the group within the district um, that conducted this RFP. And I want to thank specifically NWEA for stepping forward. I know we had a number of candidates in front of us um, in this process that uh, provided um, tests that had merit as well. But having that NWE product that was so responsive is, is um, you know, very uh, reassuring for us. But nevertheless, we find ourselves in a, in a moment now where um, we question what it is that we need to take into account in the admissions process here. And so we need to take this, uh, this moment in time, these two months, to let this working group do its, its job and come back to us and give us a real and authentic uh, recommendation about how we deal with these issues. And I don't want to presuppose anything. Again, I, I want to go back to where we started this conversation, which is, I want, I, I want folks going into this with an open mind. We can't be positional. We have to be, um, we have to think about what is right for our students and do what's best for our kids. And so I want to thank, uh, close by just thanking once again, uh, my fellow members for uh, pushing on this issue, um, by representing their communities on this issue, by having a thirst for change and ensuring that we're doing the right thing for kids. And I want to thank the superintendent and her staff for doing that as well. So we'll look forward to taking action at some point on this test. Um, I'll bring it back to uh, the presentation where we started. Um, and we'll also take a uh, look at, look forward to uh, hearing more about um, the composition of the working group, getting regular updates from the superintendent on, on the progress of the working group. And we'll look forward to hearing um, the recommendations of this group uh, come September. All right. Well, um, it's been a long night. This is, I think this is a, I think, I think we've created the longest uh, Zoom session on record for us so far uh, at six hours and five minutes. I think we have a few minutes left to go. Um, I'm going to turn to Sullivan for a moment and ask her if we have anyone for public comment on reports. Thank you. We have no one for public comment on reports. Okay, well, very good. Thank you. Uh, is there any new business uh, from the committee? Okay. Well, I created new business by giving us two more meetings in August. So, uh, well, um, I figured everybody else canceled their uh, summer. I certainly did. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to hanging out for two further Wednesdays this year with, with all of you. Um, we'll uh, conclude our business for this evening. Uh, the next school committee meeting, as I mentioned, will take place on Wednesday, August 5th at 5 p.m. here on Zoom. So if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> second. Whoever that was, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill, it sounds like. Uh, I'm sure there's no discussion or objection to that motion. So, uh, Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll and take us out of here. Dr. Coleman? Yes, and have a good evening to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Okay. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Hell yes. <laughs> kind of language that gets you kicked out of Latin. Exactly. Mr. Lepanto. Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. All right. Well, thank you once again, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you uh, to the superintendent and the committee members and everyone that's hung with us, uh, the 81 hearty souls uh, <laughs> this evening. I hope everyone has a good couple of weeks and we'll see you soon. Good night, Stay everybody. Cool, wash your hands. Stay cool, wash your hands. <laughs> Good night.
Good night.